Preface of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Preface the king of france wrote montesquieu in his lettres persanes has no gold mines like his neighbor the king of spain but he has greater riches for he draws his wealth from the vanity of his subjects a more inexhaustible source of supply than any mines he has been known to undertake and sustain great wars with no other funds than those drawn from the sale of titles of honor and yet by a prodigy of human pride his troops were paid his towns fortified and his fleets equipped the journeyman watchmaker of the witty tongue and unbridled pen the secret agent the counsellor of kings the millionaire merchant adventurer whose energy and daring contributed so largely to the success of the colonies in their struggle for independence the author of two of the most sparkling comedies ever written, the gay, open-handed, cool-headed, hot-blooded creature whose amazing career we propose to follow in these pages must be numbered among those whose vanity went to fill the coffers of the state. Of course, Figaro was not his real name, but then neither was Beaumarchais, for in the least unpleasant, as it was the happiest, pleasantry made at his expense we are told that the sieur caron borrowed the name of beaumarchais from one of his wives and lent it to one of his sisters a gibe which doubtless annoyed him considerably for in a sarcasm it is only the truth that stings in view then of the precedent which he himself has set we have no compunction in borrowing the name of Figaro from the most memorable child of his imagination and lending it to this biography of his creator. We shall find, indeed, as we proceed, that our hero's character, his joyous adventures, and the dramatic changes of his fortune are so clearly reflected in those of his ingenious valet that it is by no means easy to define the limits of their respective activities and lastly if caon made the name of beaumarchais famous the latter rendered the name of figaro more famous still beaumarchais was a spellbinder and has succeeded in casting the glamour of his personality over most of his biographers as surely as he did over the majority of his contemporaries an excessive indulgence toward the faults of his hero is indeed the chief blemish of monsieur de lemonis monumental work which must nevertheless always hold high rank among the world's greatest literary biographies in his fascinating histoire de beaumarchais the devoted goudin de la brenellerie like a true boswell sees no faults whatever in his friend and later monsieur lintillac and many others have been ever ready to take up the cudgels on his behalf as a result of the efforts of these brilliant apologists, a legendary figure of Beaumarchais has been built up which is not altogether in accordance with the facts. The perusal of many unpublished manuscripts and several years' study of his career have led us to the conclusion that his character was not perfect and that it is possible to accept his uncorroborated evidence too confidently but in spite of all the reservations we shall find it necessary to make the life of beaumarchais must for long remain one of the most astonishing challenges which history has ever offered to fiction j r august nineteen twenty two end of preface chapter one of figaro the life of beaumarchais this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Pamela Nagami. Figaro. The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 1. 
in which the handsome watchmaker comes to court. The arts and graces of the incomparable Madame de Pompadour had for ten years held almost undisputed sway over the withered heart of her blasé monarch, when in 1755 a pushful young man with passably impudent eyes, ingratiating manners and an imperturbable self-possession, made his first appearance at Versailles. He was there by order of the king, to submit for the royal approval a minute watch, the smallest that had ever been made, a masterpiece of skill and ingenuity in an art which he had already carried to a perfection beyond anything achieved by his contemporaries. Most members of the court circle knew him as Pierre Augustin Caron, son of the royal watchmaker of the Rue Saint Denis, for eighteen months earlier, Le Pote, the doyen of his craft, presuming upon his established reputation, had claimed as his own a new escapement for watches and clocks, which the young man declared he himself had invented, and shown to the older man as a friend of the family. To divulge his secret before his discovery had been officially established was doubtless imprudent, but trust in the probity of others is at least a proof of probity in oneself. Pierre Augustin was not the man to submit tamely to an injustice. He made so much noise and aired his grievance with such a combination of energy, resolution, and shrewdness that he not only won his cause against heavy odds, but proved himself to be a man of affairs of the first order, and what was more, contrived to attract the interest of royalty itself. On his first visit to court, Pierre Augustin, for a brief space, sunned himself in the smiles of august personages and adroitly assured himself of further audiences by arousing the royal curiosity about other examples of his art, and above all, by winning the benevolent interest of Madame the King's daughters and of Madame de Pompadour as well. During the next few months he became quite a familiar figure at Versailles, and was so successful in disposing of his wares to the king, the princesses, the favorite, and her favorites, that he was soon appointed by royal warrant to be one of the court watchmakers, and was able to set up a shop on his own account. The son of a Protestant watch and clockmaker, Pierre Augustin Caron, the future Beaumarchais, was born on the 24th January, 1732, over his father's shop in the Rue Saint-Denis near the Rue des Lombards, and almost under the shadow of the pillars of Les Halles. He was fortunate in his family. His father, André Charles, was a man of many-sided talent, whose Calvinistic austerity was tempered by a fine taste in literature and the arts, a generous seasoning of Gallic salt, and an inexhaustible fund of vitality, that most universally attractive quality to men and women. His only surviving son, Pierre Augustin, was never remarkable for Calvinistic austerity, but all the other most striking traits of his father's character were transmitted to him in an intensified form, combined with others peculiar to himself. André Charles Caron was a native of the former province of Brie, being born at lisy sur ourc near Meaux, on the 26th April, 1698. He, too, was the son of a clockmaker, Daniel Caron, and his wife, Marie Fortin. These grandparents of our man were as poor as a family of fourteen could possibly make them. André Charles was the fourth child. Being members of a religion which had been banned since the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, and all civil rights denied them, including that of legal marriage, they had probably been united furtively by a hedge parson. This was in 1694. One of the sons rose to be a captain of grenadiers and to be decorated with the Croix de Saint-Louis, and a second to be a director of the India Company and a secrétaire du roi. André Charles, as a youth, enlisted in the dragoons of Rochepierre under the name of Caron d'Ailly, and was finally discharged in 1721. In the same year he established himself in Paris to study watch and clock-making. 
A month later he abjured the faith of his fathers and was received into the Catholic Church. When asking to be admitted as a master clockmaker in the following year, he was careful to urge the fact of his recent conversion as a clinching argument in support of his application. After a few years' contact with the world, conscience in some people reflects their interests as faithfully and unconsciously as a mirror. His request being granted, André Charles was married on the 13th July, 1722, to Marie-Louise Pichon. The father of the future Beaumarchais was a person of culture, not only master of the art by which he earned his living, but a man of considerable literary and scientific attainments. Thus, in 1746, when the governor of Madrid was inquiring into the best methods of dredging rivers and ports, it was to the watchmaker of Paris that he applied as a well-known authority on the subject. These were the first relations of the family with Spain, which were to be so fruitfully resumed eighteen years later by his son. Yet, in spite of his many gifts, André Charles never succeeded in making his way, and although at one time or another he made a good deal of money, he was frequently in pecuniary straits, for freedom from such anxieties depends not so much on the amount of one's income as on one's prudence in handling it. André Charles, in his latter years, lived on a pension allowed him by his devoted son. Pierre Augustin had six sisters who, like their brother, were all skilled musicians and could turn a song, words and music, as neatly as another could turn an omelette. And being anything but prudes, their songs are frequently broader than they are long. It was a joyous and hospitable household over the watchmaker's shop in the Rue Saint-Denis, as any that you could find in Paris, and the musical evenings and amateur theatricals regularly held there soon became known to a wide circle of people, and at length came to be spoken of even at court. Young Caron was thirteen when his formal education suffered a permanent interruption by his father taking him from school that he might devote his whole time and energies to learning the art of watchmaking, of which André Charles was extremely proud. But even at that age we are bound to say that the youth gave proof of knowing quite as much as was good for him, if we may judge by the first fruits of his pen, a letter in prose and verse addressed to his sisters Marie-Joseph, who had recently married an architect named Gilbert and gone to live at Madrid, and Marie-Louise, known as Lisette, who had gone with her. Both the prose and verse of this epistle are as astonishing for their effrontery as for their precocity. But they flow from the youth's pen with an ease and felicity which prove that he could not have been such an idler as he would have us think. Commenting on a passage of this letter when an old man Beaumarchais says, I had at this time a madcap girlfriend, who making a laughing stock of my ardent youth had just married. I wanted to kill myself. Here, at any rate, is quite enough evidence to establish the relationship between Comte Almaviva's page in the Barbier de Seville and Le Mariage de Figaro, and the watchmaker's apprentice Pierre Augustin Caron. Truly, the child is father to the man, and in this sense, Chez Rubin is the worthy sire of Figaro. There is no denying the fact that Pierre Augustin was not always a model apprentice. He had a frantic love of music which often led him to neglect his work, combined with an equally undisciplined taste for other and less innocent amusements. At one time his conduct became so bad that his father turned him out of the house and only consented to receive back the prodigal on the intercession of his mother and after the most tearful promises of amendment and a prompt acceptance of a schedule of stern conditions which was to govern his life throughout the term of his apprenticeship. This time his father succeeded in really frightening him, and he set himself wholeheartedly to making his mark in his profession. Through the following years he gave his father no cause of complaint. On the contrary, old Caron became excessively proud of his son. And then came the invention of the famous escapement, and the winning of his first lawsuit, followed by his introduction at court. 
Even from the first, young Caron had most of the qualities that make for success. He had a wonderful talent, says La Harpe, for flattering the great without forfeiting their esteem. In conversing with them, he always contrived to convey the impression of being convinced that it was impossible to hold an opinion contrary to his own without having less intelligence than himself, which, you may be sure, he never for a moment allowed it to be supposed above all with those who had little, and expressing himself with as much confidence as seduction, he made himself at the same time master of their vanity and mediocrity by reassuring the one by the other. Pierre Augustin was determined at all costs to make his way, and neglected no detail that was likely to further his ambition. The influence of clothes, for instance, on success in life was no secret to him, for he early realized that to be well-dressed not only gives one's self-confidence, but inspires confidence in others, and this is a foible in human nature which he astutely turned to account. His tailor was accordingly chosen with great care, and Pierre Augustin was the sort of man who gets well served. Moreover, he was one of those people who bring gaiety and sunshine wherever they go, from his first appearance at Versailles, says Goudin, the women remarked on his tall, well-balanced figure, his healthy looks, his incomparably witty and amusing tongue, his masterful air which seemed to set him above all those around him, his delightfully daring eyes, and that involuntary ardor which flamed in him at the sight of a good-looking woman. Those who like us possess a magnetism which draws us to them, but those who are instinctively attracted to us offer the most intimate, the most alluring, and indeed the supreme flattery of all the ages. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Zonzo. Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter Two: Madame Franquet and the First Marriage of Beaumarchais. A few weeks before Pierre Augustin moved into his new shop, a society woman whose roving eyes had rested upon him with approval at Versailles visited him on the pretext of bringing her watch to be repaired. Her name was Madeleine Catherine Aubertin, and she was the wife of Pierre Augustin Franquet, whose qualifications for his post of clerk controller of the king's household do not appear to have included a very efficient control over his own. Pierre Augustin was pleased and flattered by her visit, nor was he insensible to her charms, for she was in the full bloom of a brilliant autumn, a phase of womanhood peculiarly attractive to most young men of his years. As Madame Franquet reached the counter, she was suddenly overcome by timidity, and while our watchmaker looked at her with open admiration, she told him in a low, agitated voice the reason of her coming to him. Then, taking out her jeweled watch, she passed it to him with lowered eyes. Their hands touched. She blushed and immediately trembled all over. Her emotion caught and thrilled him like some delightful electric current. In undertaking to repair her watch, he did not feel called upon to remedy the obvious disorder in the bosom of its owner. On the contrary, he added fuel to the conflagration. But the man who kindles a flame of this kind may easily find himself condemned to extinguish it. At first, her ardor pleased him. Before long, however, he realized that, in a woman especially, such a temperament is a misfortune. When the watch was mended, he did not wait to be invited to deliver it personally at the Franquet's house in the Rue des Bourdonnais. This gave him an opportunity of being introduced to Monsieur. Soon there was no more constant visitor and intimate friend of the house than Pierre Augustin Caron. 
No trouble was too much for him in the service of his new friends. Indeed, he made himself so useful and obliging that, later, it was unkindly said he had become their lackey, but this was evidently set down in malice. At any rate, he soon gained a complete ascendancy in the household, and Franquet, who at forty-nine was an invalid, was soon persuaded by his wife that he was too old and infirm any longer to carry out his duties with satisfaction, either to the king or himself, and that he could not do better than retire in favor of his dear friend Caron, who, she had no doubt, would be willing to pay him a substantial annuity for his office. Accordingly, on the 5th November, 1755, the transfer was effected and confirmed by royal warrant dated the 9th of the same month. Franquet retired to vers le Cran near Arpajon, where he possessed a little property. He was apparently well pleased with the bargain. So was friend Caron, for in securing a footing at court, he had made the first step in the way of his ambition. His duty consisted in marching with a sword at his side before the king's meat, which he had then to place upon the table. This state of mutual satisfaction, however, did not last long, for Madeleine Catherine, since she had allowed her fancy to wander, had become very discontented with her lot, and we find her admirer now awake to his folly, trying to teach her to be a little more patient. If, he wrote, I listen to the sentiments of compassion with which your sorrows inspire me, I should detest their author. But when I remember that he is your husband, that he belongs to you, I can only mutely sigh and wait patiently till time and the will of God shall put me in a position to give you the happiness for which you appear to be destined. That sounds rather like the sanctimonious pirate, yet it does seem to prove his fundamental innocence. But he had not the same reason that she had to be in a hurry. It was easy for him to talk. He was twenty-three, and she, on her own showing, was thirty-three, and was even then perhaps unduly economical of the truth. However, their troubles were soon over, for on the 3rd January 1756, Franquet died of apoplexy. We can but hope that his timely exit spared him a humiliating misfortune, for Madeleine Catherine daily found it more difficult to moderate her feelings. The way now being clear, her one idea was to make sure of her dear watchmaker with the least possible delay. The customary year's mourning she considered too long, so she curtailed it by two months, and on the 22nd November had the happiness of being led to the altar by her lover at the church of saint nicolas des Camps. The Caron family, who perhaps considered the marriage rather precipitate, were not present at the ceremony and contented themselves with giving their assent in writing. The alliance was still less to the liking of the bride's family, and they also absented themselves. A few weeks after the union, Pierre Augustin first adopted the name of Beaumarchais from a small property belonging to his wife, situated in the former province of Brie, of which, it may be noted in passing, his father was also a native. He was so pleased with the name that he persuaded his favorite sister Julie to adopt it likewise. Beaumarchais was thrice married, and we have the testimony of each of his wives that he was a tender and devoted husband. Possibly they were easily satisfied, for it is clear he never acquired much control over his imagination, never learned to possess all womankind in the arms of one wife. The tranquility of his first matrimonial venture was, at any rate, not unruffled. The outcome of infatuation rather than love, both husband and wife, may have expected too much of their marriage. They had yet to learn that our happiness is never quite so complete as when viewed in anticipation or retrospect. Then there was the usual obtrusive mother-in-law, jealous of her daughter's love and keeping an over-watchful eye on her money. In the marriage contract, Madeleine Catherine had settled her entire fortune on her husband if he survived her, but, chiefly owing to her mother's determined opposition, the document had not been legally registered and was therefore invalid. Beaumarchais did not press the matter, but he may have been secretly hurt by the failure to complete the contract, feeling that the omission showed some lack of confidence in himself. 
To be dependent on his wife's fortune is an invidious position for any man of spirit, and Madeleine sometimes allowed him to feel that she was not unconscious of her power. This led to coolness on his part and reproaches on hers. Ah, my dearest, he wrote, how times have changed. Formerly, everything forbade the love we felt for each other, yet how ardent it then was, and how much preferable to our present state. What you term my coldness is nothing but a timid concealing of my feelings, lest I should give a woman whose love has changed into an imperious domination too much hold over me. My Julie marries me, but she who in that time of rapture and illusion used almost to faint with joy at a tender look is now no more than an ordinary woman who, at the first difficulty, has come to think that she could very well live without the man whom her heart once preferred to all the world. Nor was this disillusionment entirely on his side. Her position as the wife of a man so much run after by women must often have been a trying one. He was still young enough, and knew enough to court ways, to be pleased and flattered by such attentions, and being an expansive person when at home, may have recounted his successes of this kind with more zest than discretion. It is always a hazardous experiment for a man to praise one woman to another, and above all, when that other is his wife. Apart from an occasional breeze, however, there does not appear to have been any very serious unhappiness, and when they got to know each other's peculiarities better, they would probably have settled down together quite comfortably. But fate ruled otherwise. Madeleine was suddenly taken ill and died of typhoid fever on September twenty ninth, 1757, ten months after her marriage. The coincidence of the death of Franquet, an invalid of fifty, so soon followed by that of his widow, just entering on middle age, and recently married to a young man of twenty-five, with whom she was very much in love, at first aroused no comment, especially as the deceased lady was known to have had a weak chest. It was not until later when the extraordinary financial and social success of Beaumarchais had excited widespread envy that abominable rumors began to circulate, accusing him of having poisoned his wife and her first husband. And when he had the misfortune to lose his second wife, in the midst of a bitter struggle for his life against utterly unscrupulous enemies, these calumnies were revived against him with increased virulence. At last he was obliged, as we shall see, to defend himself publicly against the slanders, calling as witnesses the four doctors who attended his first wife, and the five who attended his second wife. Moreover, he was able to establish the fact that, so far from enriching him, the death of each had, for the time being, absolutely ruined him. Through the failure to register my marriage contract, he wrote in his memoir against Guesman, when stung to the quick by these atrocious insinuations, the death of my first wife left me absolutely penniless and overwhelmed with debts, yet I refused to follow up my claims in order to avoid pleading against her relatives, of whom I had hitherto no cause to complain. Other documents quoted by Louis de Lomeny prove the delivery by him of his wife's property, partly to the relatives of her first husband and partly to the members of her own family but unintelligent people always mistake magnanimity for weakness. Sixteen years later, when Beaumarchais seemed to be at the point of succumbing to the most treacherous and unprincipled adversaries that a man ever had, Madeleine's younger sister, with certain other relatives of the dead woman, thought the moment appropriate to bring forward a claim to still further sums of money on account of his late wife's property. After a legal action of several years' duration, judgment was made against them, and Beaumarchais was awarded substantial damages, whereupon, knowing their man, they wrote him supplicating letters, and he, like the easy-going, open-hearted fellow that he was, forgave them and agreed to forget their indebtedness to him. Enough has been said to show that the evidence against Beaumarchais will not stand a moment's serious examination. Yet he suffered under these imputations for years, and we can only marvel how, under such circumstances, he managed to keep his gaiety, his buoyancy of spirits, his brotherliness, 
and his readiness to place his time his talents and his purse at the disposal of all who sought his help there are few who will not agree with voltaire when when the ugly rumours were first mentioned in his company said this beaumarchais is not a poisoner he is too amusing for that End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 3 The Duel. The death of his wife had, as we have seen, thrown Beaumarchais back into the poverty from which his marriage had enabled him to emerge. By that deplorable accident, he lost everything he had gained, except the minor office which gave him a footing at court. A second turn of the wheel was soon to give him an opportunity of more than retrieving his shattered fortune. It will be remembered that he was a fine musician. He was a noted flautist, but what especially charmed everybody who heard him was his beautiful voice and the accomplished art with which he accompanied himself on the harp, an instrument which was then coming into fashion. Just as he had invented an improved mechanism for watches, he now devised and introduced an improved pedal for harps. His reputation as a harpist spread rapidly, and soon got to the ears of the king's daughters, the princesses Adelaide, Victoria, Sophie, and Louise, all industrious, enthusiastic, and uninspired musicians. He was already known to them as the maker of the wonderful little watches and clocks which had been so fashionable since their introduction. They expressed a wish to hear him play. This led to his being invited to give them lessons, and soon we find him composing music for them and organizing charming concerts which were attended by the whole royal family and a strictly limited number of ladies and gentlemen of the court. Modesty was not one of the ex-watchmaker's strong points, and it must have needed all his coolness and savoir-faire to succeed in the brilliant situation he now found himself. Moreover, like Mr. Saltina, he was not quite a gentleman, though you would hardly notice it. His high spirits and the incontinence of his tongue were also likely, sooner or later, to get him into difficulties. Such a man can rarely resist the impulse to raise a laugh, however ill-timed it may be, and he seldom reflects that the world's laughter is always purchased at the price of its secret contempt for the jester. Yet however little respected he may be, the man whose wit arouses mirth is welcomed in society by all except those who fail to see his joke. The sense of humor in royal circles is apt to be of a rudimentary growth, but in spite of all that has been said to the contrary, Pierre Augustine's mistakes of decorum cannot have been of such serious nature as many would have us believe for he was, at any rate, diplomatic enough to talk over the Dauphine, and even won his esteem and confidence. Beaumarchais, he observed on one occasion, is the only man who tells me the truth. Now, as everybody knows, the heir to the throne, though devoid of intelligence, was full of piety and formalism so his evidence in this matter has considerable weight. Many of the courtiers, however, were very much annoyed with the intruder's success, for no man can either deserve or achieve popularity with impunity. 
it was intolerable that a fellow who, a few years ago, had come, hat in hand, to sell them watches, should now sit at his ease and play the wit in the royal presence, whilst they, of the noblest families in the land, should be left to cool their heels outside. Nor was this their only grievance. Some of their womenfolk had the bad taste to allow it to be seen that they were by no means indifferent to the upstart's blandishments. Again, if the great offended him, his lightning retort was so cleverly turned that they could never feel quite sure whether it ought to be considered a compliment or an impertinence. If they tried to put him in his place by disdainful words, the prompt and comic insolence of his reply always made them look ridiculous. Even when they devised a carefully laid trap for him, it was only themselves who invariably fell into it. There was no limit to their fury. One day, in the richest court dress, he left the apartments of the princesses and proceeded with a firm step and dignified bearing through the crowded antechamber when a courtier, hoping to take him by surprise, accosted him and holding out a beautiful watch said in a loud voice sir will you be good enough as an expert to examine my watch it is out of order sir quietly answered beaumarchais i have become very awkward since i ceased to practice the art ah i beg you not to refuse me this favor very well but I really must warn you that I am awkward. Then, taking the watch, he opened it and held it on a level with his eyes, pretending to examine the works, and let it fall to the ground. I warned you, sir, of my extreme awkwardness, and with a low bow he coolly turned on his heel, leaving the discomfited champion of court jealousies to pick up the pieces. On another occasion, his rival spread the news that Beaumarchais was living on the worst possible terms with his father, and caused it to be reported to the princesses, who, believing it to be true, withdrew their favor. Directly Beaumarchais heard of the slander, he set out for Paris, called on his father, and invited him to accompany him to Versailles, in order, as he said, to show him over the palace. Whilst doing so, he took care that mesdames should several times see them together. The same evening he presented himself to the princesses, as usual, leaving his father in the antechamber to await his return. They received him very coldly. Nevertheless, one of them, out of curiosity, asked him with whom they had seen him walking during the day. That was my father, he replied, to the great surprise of the ladies. An explanation followed, and Beaumarchais immediately solicited the honor of presenting his father. Thus, in the most natural way, the old gentleman was called in to rehabilitate his son, a congenial task of which he acquitted himself with great enthusiasm and address. In France, said Voltaire, one must be either an anvil or a hammer. I was born an anvil. The phrase might have been applied at this time as aptly to Beaumarchais. In 1760, however, almost exactly a year after his honorary appointment as musical director and gentleman messenger to the princesses, he had the good fortune to win the gratitude and friendship of Paris Duvernay, the rather shady but influential financier who, twenty years before, had furnished Voltaire with the means of making the happy transition from the anvil to the hammer class of society. This is how it happened. Duvernay, now an old man, and desirous of perpetuating his name, had, nine years before, undertaken, with Madame de Pompadour's approval, 
the foundation of the military college on the Champ de Mars, the forerunner of St. Cyr, for the training of young officers. Unfortunately for him, whilst the building was being erected, the disasters of the Seven Years' War considerably diminished Madame de Pompadour's influence, and worse still, the enthusiasm of the king and his ministers for a project so closely associated with her name likewise suffered a change. They completely ignored the institution, and although the building was almost completed and already housed a few students, it languished and was threatened with ruin by the king's neglect. For years, Paris de Vernet had haunted the court, boring everybody he met with the story of his pet scheme and vainly soliciting the monarch to honor his establishment with a formal visit. At last, in his despair, he decided to speak to Beaumarchais, who he had observed in constant attendance upon madame's. He found the concert director to be a more patient listener than any he had yet encountered at Versailles. Talkative people readily form a high opinion of those who are willing to listen to them, and before the interview was ended, he had the greatest respect for the young man's energy and ability. His hope began to revive, and he congratulated himself upon making so promising an ally. So did Beaumarchais. His one thought was to devise a scheme by which he might be the means of gratifying the old man's ambition. He remembered what had happened to Voltaire. Those people who say they despise money do not know what financial worries are. Beaumarchais was never among them, but as one of the wisest of the ancients said, he that hasteth to get rich shall not be innocent. Without a moment's delay, he set to work. Fortunately, he had consistently declined all monetary reward for his efforts in the service of the princesses, and he thought that if he could now induce them to visit the college, they would be sure to tell the king what they had seen, and curiosity, if no more exalted motive, might lead him to follow their example. Accordingly, when he next saw the princesses, he enthusiastically described the wonders of Duvernay's institution, warmly praised his public spirit, and ended by begging them as the only favor he had ever asked that they would honor and encourage the labors of the founder by themselves coming to see over the establishment. They graciously acceded to the request, and Beaumarchais was invited to accompany them. Duvernay received the royal party with lavish ceremony, and the princesses did not fail to make clear to him the benevolent interest which they took in the affairs of their escort. The maneuver of Beaumarchais was completely successful. A few days later, the king, under his daughter's inspiration, so far threw off his indolence as to visit the college in state. Duvernay's gratitude to Beaumarchais was unbounded. From that moment he set about making his friend's fortune. He began by giving him, at 10% interest, shares in one of his operations, involving a sum of 60,000 livres, and then admitted him as a principal associate in many others. He taught me the business of finance, says Beaumarchais, in which... As all the world knows, he was a consummate master. Under his direction, I built up my fortune. On his advice, I embarked on numerous enterprises. In a few, he supported me with his capital or his credit. In all, with his counsels and experience of the world. Before leaving this subject, we must confess to feeling that Although his connection with the great financier rapidly increased his fortune, it had a detrimental effect on his character and happiness of his life. Whilst it was far from enhancing his reputation either in the eyes of his contemporaries or of posterity, 
In money matters, few people think of questioning the integrity of genial, open-handed men like Beaumarchais. Yet it is persons of his temperament who want the most careful watching, for it is these who most frequently get into financial difficulties and are commonly the least scrupulous as to the means they employ to get out of them. We have seen the fragment of a contemporary and unpublished letter which clearly indicates that this view was firmly held by at least some of his contemporaries. Boom, says the writer, is a man full of wit and talent, but I would trust him neither with my wife nor my daughter or my reputation, and still less with my money. In 1761, Pierre Augustine took it into his head to buy a brevet of nobility. At a cost of 85,000 livres, he purchased the title of Secretaire du Roy, and thus acquired the legal right to bear the name of Beaumarchais. He obtained his brevet on the 9th December, 1761. Not content with this step, he made a determined effort in the following month to buy the lucrative post of Grand Master of Waters and Forests at a cost of 500,000 livres. Duvernay, who was becoming more and more attached to his young friend, lent him the money, and his cause was openly canvassed by madames. When the other Grand Masters heard that they were likely to have the ex-watchmaker as a colleague. They collectively petitioned the Controller General against the election of such an unsuitable candidate, and even threatened to resign in a body if this affront was put upon them. Beaumarchais thereupon set Paris Duvernay, Monsieur Chatignere, the Queen Equerry, and other friends to work with redoubled energy. He himself wrote and circulated an amusing pamphlet in which he passed in review the family history of the men who displayed such hypersensitive gentility, from that of Monsieur de Arbonne, whose real name is Hervé, the wig maker, to that of Monsieur Teles, Grand Master of Chalons, the son of a Jew named Teles de Costa, second hand jeweler who, after being admitted without opposition, was later expelled because, it is said, he found it impossible to resist the temptation of reverting to the calling of his fathers. But it is always unwise to show contempt for others. Even the most amiable people hate those that despise them. We cannot help feeling that this was the great mistake Beaumarchais made throughout his life, and was largely responsible for the bitterness of the hatred so often displayed against him. Sarcastic people seldom reflect on the cruelty of the wounds they so lightly inflict, and are always astonished at the rancorous enmity they arouse in their victims. By acting together, all who had a grievance against Beaumarchais were more than once able to frustrate his most cherished plans. Such was the case now. A few months later, however, he was consoled for his disappointment by being accorded permission to purchase the post of Lieutenant General of the King's Preserves, a less remunerative but much more aristocratic appointment than the one he had failed to obtain. So, once a week, arrayed in a gorgeous robe, the man in the near future was to hold up the magistracy to ridicule and contempt in the person of Brid Oysen, solemnly pronounced judgment, doubtless with his tongue in his cheek, on poachers and such small fry of the environments of Paris. This fresh advancement in fortune and position served but to irritate still more the hostility of his rivals. Their spite culminated in an unpardonable insult offered him at their instigation 
by a young courtier whom Goudin refers to as the Chevalier de C. The provocation, we are told, was so outrageous that notwithstanding the severe laws against dueling, nothing but a resort to arms could wipe out the offense. The antagonists instantly mounted their horses and proceeded to the park at Moudon, where they could fight out their quarrel in solitude. Early in the ensuing combat, Beaumarchais eluded his opponent's guard and drove his rapier up to the hilt through his body. As he withdrew his weapon, he saw his adversary fall in a huddled heap to the ground with blood gushing from his chest. Overcome with pity, he ran to the aid of the stricken man and dressed the wound as well as he could with his handkerchief. Never mind about me, Monsieur de Beaumarchais. Look to your own safety, urged the Chevalier. I must first get you help, he replied, and flinging himself on horseback, he dashed off to Moudon village, sought out a surgeon, and brought him to the wounded man. It was only after he had assured himself that his opponent was in good hands and would receive every possible care and attention that Beaumarchais rode at full gallop back to Paris to think out his best course of action. The Chevalier had no sooner been transferred to his home in the capital than Beaumarchais sent to inquire after him. He learned with grief that his late adversary was in a dying condition, but obstinately refused to give any information as to the encounter. All that he could be induced to say was, I wantonly provoked an upright man, merely to win the applause of people for whom I had no esteem, though he had given me no cause for offense. I have only got what I deserved. Whilst the life of the Chevalier still hung in the balance, Beaumarchais sought the protection of the princesses, to whom he related all the circumstances of the unhappy affair. They immediately spoke to the king on his behalf. Take such steps, my children, said the monarch, that nothing more is said to me on the subject. In effect, he did not want to be bothered. After lingering on for eight days, the chevalier died without giving a hint which would incriminate the man who was responsible for his death. The fortitude and generosity of this unfortunate gentleman made a deep and abiding impression on the mind of Beaumarchais, and to his dying day he spoke with emotion and regret of this painful episode of his youth. End of chapter 3 Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 20th of December, 2021. Chapter 4 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by William Bruce McFadden Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers, Section 4 Chapter 4 Some Early Adventures of Beaumarchais Ten days after this duel, Beaumarchais attended a ball at his friend Lomure's house. He noticed that in one part of the room a game of cards was proceeding. Between the dances he strolled towards the tables and amused himself by watching the game. Now, it is the fate of good-natured people to be sought after and used by everybody, but to be really respected by nobody, and a reputation for this weakness quickly spreads. Beaumarchais had not been at the card table many minutes when one of the players rose and, drawing him aside, asked him for the loan of thirty-five louis. Beaumarchais learned that the stranger was a man of quality named Monsieur Sablier, and without hesitation acceded to his request. When three weeks had passed without a word from the debtor, Beaumarchais wrote to him and received a reply, promising that the money should be returned on the morrow or the day following. 
After another interval of three weeks, Beaumarchais wrote again. His letter was ignored. At last, losing patience, he sent a third letter. Since, sir, you have failed to keep your written word, I can scarcely be surprised that you should dispense with the trouble of replying to my last communication. The one negligence is the natural sequel to the other. This omission on your part, of course, gives me no ground for reproach. You owe me no civility and no consideration, not having the honor of being one of your friends. What right have I to expect either from one who fails in more essential duties? This letter is, therefore, written only to remind you once more of a debt which you contracted at the house of a mutual friend without other security than the debtor's honor and our sense of what was due to the master of the house whose hospitality we enjoyed. Another consideration, not without weight, is that the money you owe me was not won from you on the chance of a card, but I lent it to you out of my pocket and in doing so I may, for all you know, have deprived myself of an advantage I might have hoped for if, instead of wishing to oblige you, I had played myself. Should this letter not be sufficiently fortunate to produce upon you the effect that it would have on me if I were in your place, pray do not take it ill if I propose to submit the matter to a third party who shall judge between us. I will wait until the day after tomorrow for your answer. By the moderation of my conduct, I am happy to think that you will judge of the great respect with which I have the honor of being, sir, etc., de Beaumarchais. Marchés. Disagreeable people are always very sensitive to unpleasantness in others. Moreover, it is annoying to have to borrow money from a man belonging to a class of people whom you have always despised, and worse still when the fellow takes upon himself to give you a lesson in manners whilst reminding you of the debt. The annoyance of Monsieur de Sablier was so great that when he at last deigned to reply, it played havoc with his spelling and grammar. The one thing which clearly emerges from the incoherence of his letter is his excessive displeasure with his correspondent. I care not a snap of the fingers, he concluded his epistle, for the third party with whom you threaten me, and still less for your moderation. You shall have your thirty-five louis, I give you my word for it. I will bring them myself, but I cannot say whether I shall be fortunate enough to answer for my moderation. Under ordinary circumstances, Beaumarchais would have thought very little of such truculence, but, as we have seen, he was particularly anxious at this time to avoid fresh trouble so he deemed it expedient to write to Monsieur de Sablier once more, and after disavowing any intention of wounding the touchy gentleman's susceptibilities, he proceeds. Having now explained my letter, I have the honor to advise you that I shall be at home all Saturday morning to await the fulfillment of your third promise. You say that you do not know whether you will be sufficiently fortunate as to be able to answer for your moderation. If a man may judge by your style, you have none too much control over it in writing. But I can assure you that I shall not aggravate your infirmity by losing my own temper if I can help it. If, after these assurances, you propose in person to pass beyond the limits of an amicable explanation, and to push things to the bitter end, which, however, in spite of your heat, I do not wish to suppose, you will find me, sir, as firm in repelling insult as in guarding against the actions which gave rise to it. P.S. I am keeping a copy of this letter, as also of the first, so that my good intentions may serve to justify me in case of accident. But I hope, notwithstanding, to convince you that so far from searching for trouble, nobody can be possibly more anxious than I am to avoid it. I cannot explain myself more explicitly in writing. 31 March, 1763 Beaumarchais sent this letter by Lomier, who explained to Monsieur de Sablier the precise meaning of the postscript. A word to the wise suffices, and although Monsieur de Sablier shown neither in spelling nor composition, he was not such a fool as you might suppose. He decided not to put his moderation to the test of a personal interview and adopted a less provocative method of discharging his debt. About this time, Monsieur de Mailly, Marquis de Feli, induced Beaumarchais to become his surety for 21,000 francs worth of jewelry which he proposed to purchase from a well-known demi-mondaine. Before the conclusion of the bargain, the impecunious Marquis obtained possession of the jewels and straightway sold them at a serious loss. When Beaumarchais heard that not only had none of the money reached the lady, but that even the promissory note had not been signed, 
he wrote a sharp letter to the Marquis telling him frankly what he thought of his conduct. A few days later, the pair happened to meet in the green room of the Comédie Française and spoke to each other so passionately that Beaumarchais invited the nobleman to finish the dispute outside. The Marquis objected that he carried only a morning sword. Beaumarchais pointed out that he himself was no better armed with his light ornamental weapon and insisted on his accompanying him forthwith to the fountain in the Rue d'Enfer. There he ordered his opponent to put himself on guard, and by the dim light of a street lamp immediately attacked with such impetuosity that after a few thrusts he scratched his adversary's chest with the point of his rapier. The Marquis at once broke off the duel and declared that if only he had had his proper sword, things would have happened very differently. Go and get it, retorted Beaumarchais, and we will meet here again at eleven o'clock. Thereupon he went off to supper with the lady whose diamonds were the cause of all the trouble. At her house he met Monsieur de la Breiche, ambassador's usher, who lent him the more substantial weapon that he wore. Without waiting for the hour agreed upon for the second encounter, he hurried to the house of Monsieur de Mailly. There he wrote in a letter describing the affair, The dear Marquis, wrapped in his blankets, sent me word that he was suffering from colic, but would see me on the morrow. He did come, and at once muttered excuses. I forced him to come and repeat them before our common friend, Prince Belosensky, which he did. Beaumarchais was, at this time, on the best possible terms with several ladies of the class to which the heroine of this episode belonged. His name is frequently mentioned in the indiscreet pages of Monsieur de Sartine's journal, sometimes coupled with that of Mademoiselle La Cour, and more often than that of Mademoiselle La Croix of the opera. To the first lady he often paid light homage in lighter verse. His relations with the second were of a more serious nature. Not being overburdened with scruples in these matters, he had, without compunction, taken her from his friend, Prince Belosensky, leaving the disconsolate Pole to ponder over his simplicity in introducing them to each other. There is no denying the fact that he was a fickle lover, and the women he met at this period were not remarkable for constancy. I divert myself from business, he wrote, with fine literature, fine music, and sometimes with fine women. But if his bearing in some circles was not irreproachable, at home he was at his best. He was the life and soul of the household, a model son, and the most devoted and affectionate of brothers. His sisters idolized him. Never was there a more harmonious family. Between its members there was a constant interchange of little attentions and graceful compliments, and yet they could be perfectly frank with each other without giving offense, for they all realized that to say unpalatable things to one's intimates may, on occasion, be a duty, but must never be taken as a privilege of relationship. On the contrary, the more intimate the connection, the more necessary it is to exercise tact and courtesy. Beaumarchais had recently purchased a fine house, number 26 Rue Condy, and at once took his father, a widower since 1756, and his unmarried sisters to live with him. It was about 1765, the precise date is uncertain, that his relations with the princesses were severed. The cause of the rupture has been explained in at least half a dozen different ways, Beaumarchais himself supplying two versions. The reliability of the witnesses, including himself, is not above suspicion. Nevertheless, we have enough to form a fairly accurate idea of what happened. Everybody agrees that his successes had by this time made rather a coxcomb of him, and it may very well be, as his enemies declared, that he took liberties, or at any rate put himself too much at ease, with the princesses. Again, most of his rivals had come under the lash of his caustic tongue, and with them he was never at any pains to conceal his arrogance. Some imprudence of word or gesture must have given his enemies an opportunity of bringing about his dismissal. He made himself so much at home, says Coley in his journal, in the apartments of Madame de France, Madame Adelaide, that Monsieur de saint Florentin felt obliged to write, ordering him to leave Versailles and not to appear there again. Having afterwards established himself in Paris, it is said that when asked the cause of his retirement, he replied, It was not surprising that, young as I was, with a pretty good figure and well furnished with a number of little talents dear to women, it was not surprising that it should have been feared that all this might turn Madame Adelaide's head. I am assured, continued Coley, that these were his very words. 
the story is not out of character, and is, on the whole, the least improbable account of the episode that has come down to us. Beaumarchais declares that it was not until 1768, a month after his second marriage, that he lost the goodwill of the king, though he admits that court circles were already inclined to look askance at him as a daring thinker whose illuminating criticisms conveyed in a jest were vaguely considered to be subversive of the social order. In effect, much as Mr. Bernard Shaw was regarded by many people twenty years ago. On Good Friday of that year, the old Duc de la Vallée, a favorite of Louis XV, was riding with Beaumarchais to Versailles, when the Duke said, I am to sup tonight in the private apartments with the King, Madame du Barry, and a few of the elect. I wish I could find something to say to enliven the supper. As a rule, they are terribly dull. If the masters are in a serious mood, replied Beaumarchais, smiling, tell them what our Sophie Arnoux said to the Comte de la Reguet the other evening. Dost thou remember, Sophie, said the Comte, the first days of our love when I used to steal each night into thy father's house under all sorts of disguises? Ah, what a good time that was, she cried. How unhappy we were. This delightful mot might lead to others, perhaps not so piquant, but calculated to bring gaiety to the supper. If, on the contrary, he continued, you find them in a merry mood, throw a little moral reflection across the royal gaiety, such as this. Whilst we are laughing here, has it ever occurred to you, sire, that your majesty owes more livres of twenty souls than the number of minutes that have elapsed since the event whose anniversary we keep today? Such a strange assertion will arrest everybody's attention and will probably be denied. Each guest will take a pencil and endeavor to show you your mistake in order to laugh at your expense. Beaumarchais worked out the sum, which came to 929,948,048 minutes. The king, he added, cannot be ignorant of the fact that he owes more than a thousand millions of livres, perhaps two. The old courtier, having verified the calculation and hoping to attract attention, and perhaps even to be admitted into the ministry, broke in upon the gaiety of a particularly boisterous evening with this proposition. The other guests immediately fell upon him in a body. They reproached him with spoiling the royal supper. They at once set about trying to remove the painful impression which the duke's words had created in the king's mind. What you say, muttered Louis, reminds us of the human skeleton, which the ancient Egyptians used to serve among the fruits and flowers of their banquets in order to moderate the noisy exultation of the guests. Was this your own reflection, Duke? Startled by the gloomy effect of his problem, the old courtier hastened to reply, No, sire, it was Beaumarchais who put this foolery into my head. The monarch left the table without speaking. Someone said, This Beaumarchais is a dangerous fellow with his romantic ideas on finance at liberty. Is he not an economist? No, answered the duke. He is the son of a clockmaker. I thought as much on closely comparing the minutes, exclaimed the other. Thereupon, declared Beaumarchais, everybody had his say against me and all believed it their duty to become my enemies. This is the origin of the horrible things that they made me suffer under the Parlement Montpeu, from which my courage alone saved me. Such was my reward for making the king reflect by means of a device which had some success in Paris. At the foot of the manuscript, he adds, it was from the heat of these empoisoned hours that fifteen years later I took the mild revenge of making Figaro describe the functions of a courtier. Accept, take, ask. That is the secret in three words. As you may imagine, my pleasantry was not calculated to restore my credit in the eyes of the late king's courtiers. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Figaro The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Figaro The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. An Adventure in Spain. One morning, in February 1764, a letter shattered like a bomb the tranquillity of the household in the Rue Condé. 
It was addressed to old Caron by his eldest daughter in Madrid, and was conceived in these terms. My sister has just been insulted by a man as influential as he is dangerous. Twice, at the moment of marrying her, he has failed to keep his word, and has abruptly drawn back, without ever deigning to offer any excuse for his conduct. The tender heart of my aggrieved sister has received such a shock, and her nerves are so disordered that we almost fear for her life. For six days she has not uttered a word. The dishonor which this event has cast upon her has plunged us into a profound retirement. I weep night and day in lavishing on the poor girl such consolation as I am not in a state to accept for myself. All Madrid knows that my sister has nothing with which to reproach herself. If my brother had sufficient credit to procure us a recommendation from the court to the French ambassador, his excellency, in favoring us with his protection, would arrest the evil which this perfidious man has done us by his conduct and his threats. Old Caron, in tears, handed the letter to his son. See what you can do for these unhappy girls, he said they are no less your sisters than the others alas exclaimed beaumarchais in his distress when he learned of the grave situation of his sister alas what sort of a recommendation can i obtain for them whom shall i ask for it who knows if they may not be concealing from us something they may have done which has brought this shame upon them Upon these words, his father passed to him several letters addressed by the ambassador and other influential people, expressing the highest esteem for both sisters. To these were added the names and addresses of other persons of standing who had recently returned from Spain, and could testify to their good conduct. Reassured by this independent testimony, Beaumarchais instantly made up his mind. Without a moment's delay, he dashed off to Versailles, and informed the princesses that a painful and urgent business demanded his presence in Madrid, and compelled him to withdraw for a time from their service. Surprised at this abrupt departure, Mesdames asked to know the nature of the misfortune which had befallen him. He showed them his sister's letter. Go, they said with some emotion, but be prudent. What you have decided on does you credit. If you act wisely, you shall not lack protection. Just before he left Paris, his friend Duvernay, seeking a chance of making much money by the provisioning of troops in Spain, by the colonization of the Sierra Morena, and other projects, appointed him his secret agent in these important commercial transactions, and to this end gave him notes of hand to the amount of two hundred thousand francs. All arrangements were now speedily concluded, and Beaumarchais set out post-haste for Madrid. He was accompanied by a French merchant, secretly engaged to safeguard him by his anxious family. Riding night and day, the travellers reached Madrid at eleven o'clock in the morning of May eighteenth, seventeen sixty four. Beaumarchais found his sisters surrounded by their friends. After the first greetings were over, he asked for an exact and detailed account of everything that had happened. The narrative convinced him that his sister was in no way to blame for her misfortune. He rose from his chair, and, taking her in his arms, said, "'Now that I know everything, my child, you can be easy. I am glad to see that you no longer love this man. That makes my way so much the clearer. Tell me where I can find him.' All present advised him to go first to the ambassador at Aranuez, for their enemy had strong protectors. "'Very well, friends. Be good enough to order a travelling carriage for me.' and to-morrow morning i will go to court to pay my respects to the ambassador in the meantime however i must make a few necessary inquiries 
all that you can do to help me is to keep my arrival secret until my return from aranuez thereupon beaumarchais hurriedly changed his clothes and set out for the dwelling of the keeper of the crown archives josef clavijo his sister's unsatisfactory lover he was not at home having just gone to pay a visit to a lady beaumarchais hastened to the address indicated and found him with other guests in the drawing-room without making himself known he drew his man aside and told him he had just arrived from france and was charged with several commissions for him when could he receive him clavijo invited him to take chocolate with him at nine o'clock on the following morning beaumarchais accepted the invitation for himself and the merchant who had accompanied him on the morrow the nineteenth may beaumarchais presented himself at eight thirty it was a splendid house which belonged clavijo informed him to don antonio portugues one of the king's most honored ministers who allowed him to live there during his absence beaumarchais opened the interview by saying that he had been asked by a society of men of letters to establish a literary correspondence with the most eminent savants and literary men of the spanish towns through which he happened to pass during his visit and he felt he could not do better than address himself in the first instance to the brilliant and learned author of the pensador with whom he now had the honor of speaking whilst clavijo beamed and expanded under these compliments beaumarchais watched him narrowly to discover the kind of man with whom he had to deal in replying the spaniard's eyes kindled with pleasure his voice took on quite an affectionate tone and he spoke like an angel of a project so well calculated to flatter his vanity and to further his ambition he was a clever fellow and as determined as beaumarchais himself to make his way in the world not to be outdone in courtesy he concluded his discourse by putting his services at the disposition of his guest in every possible way promptly taking him at his word beaumarchais said he would make no secret of the real object of his visit and as his friend was aware of what he was going to say asked that he might be present whilst he said it clavijo readily agreed to the request though he glanced at the speaker's taciturn companion with some curiosity without further delay beaumarchais began a certain french merchant with a large family and in modest circumstances had nevertheless considerable business relations with spain the head of a rich spanish commercial house happening to be in paris nine or ten years ago proposed to the frenchman who had been his friend and correspondent for many years that he should take two of his daughters with him to madrid and put them in charge of his business under his personal direction with a view to their inheriting the establishment upon his death he was a bachelor of advanced age and had no living relatives the proposal was accepted and the eldest daughter who was already married and one of her sisters proceeded to madrid and were duly installed in the spanish merchant's house which now worked in closer collaboration with the father's business in paris two years later the spaniard died leaving his affairs in an unexpectedly embarrassed condition but by dint of hard work and much ability the young french women succeeded in putting the business on a sound footing about this time a young man from the canary islands was introduced into the house at these words clavijo started and his face lengthened in spite of his poverty calmly proceeded beaumarchais the ladies seeing in him an ardent student of french and the sciences kindly helped him to such purpose that he made rapid progress in his studies and he confided to them his ambitions now the man who makes a confidant of a woman masters her more often than she masters him 
Clavijo understood women, and this is precisely what happened in his relations with the younger sister. The Spaniard proposed marriage, and interviewed the elder lady on the subject. "'When you are in a position suitably to provide for a wife,' replied the elder sister, "'I shall not refuse my consent, if my sister gives you the preference over other suitors.' Clavijo moved nervously in his chair. The younger, continued Beaumarchais, touched by the merit of the man who sought her, rejected several offers of marriage in his favor, preferring to wait until the man who loved her had justified the high opinion which his friends entertained of his ability. She entered wholeheartedly into his plans for the future, and encouraged him in his first literary enterprises his first publication was a journal called the pensador at these words clavijo trembled and the blood left his cheeks the work had a prodigious success coldly pursued the speaker the king himself delighted with this charming production bestowed marked favours upon its author and promised him the first suitable post which fell vacant the young man now paid open court to his mistress, and everybody understood the lovers awaited only the promised appointment to be married. After six months of assiduous attentions, the man received the appointment and fled. Clavijo breathed with difficulty and vainly sought to hide his confusion. The affair had caused too much commotion to be treated with indifference. The ladies had moved into a larger house, capable of holding two families. The bans had been published. This public insult revolted the friends of both parties. The French ambassador interfered. On seeing that the French women commanded stronger protection than his own, and fearing to ruin his rising fortunes, the man returned to throw himself at the feet of his incensed mistress. He employed the good offices of his friends to secure her pardon, and as the anger of a betrayed woman is usually only hidden love, everything was forgiven." the preparations for the marriage were resumed the bans again published and the ceremony was widely advertised to take place in three days time the reconciliation had made no less stir than the rupture after commending his affianced bride in tender words to the care of their common friends the young man set out for st hildefonce to ask his chief's consent to get married Fixing his eyes sternly on the wretched man before him, Beaumarchais continued in a rising voice. He came back, in effect, two days later, but instead of leading his victim to the altar, he sent word to the unhappy girl that he had changed his mind and did not intend to marry her. When her friends went to him to demand an explanation, he defied them to do their worst and said that if these helpless frenchwomen in a foreign country attempted to worry him he would ruin them both at this news the poor girl fell into convulsions and became so ill that fears were entertained for her life in their despair the elder sister wrote to her brother in france telling him of the public insult which had been put upon them this letter so affected her brother that, instantly demanding leave of absence, he left country, business, family, pleasures, everything, to come and avenge in Spain his innocent and unhappy sister, to unmask a traitor and write his infamy in letters of blood on his face. I am that brother, you are that traitor." Clavijo almost collapsed. He tried to murmur some excuses. "'Do not interrupt me, sir,' commanded Beaumarchais. "'You have nothing to tell me, and much to hear. To begin with, have the goodness to declare before this gentleman, who has come expressly from France with me, whether by any lack of affection or faithfulness, or faults of conduct or temper, my sister has deserved the double outrage which she has suffered at your hands. No, sir, I fully recognize that your sister, Donna Maria, is a young lady full of wit, grace, and virtue. 
she has given you no cause for complaint so long as you have known her never springing to his feet beaumarchais said then why monster have you had the barbarity to drag her down solely because she gave you the preference over half a dozen better and richer men than you ah sir i was urged on by others there were instigations counsels if you only knew that is enough turning to his friend beaumarchais said you have heard my sister's vindication go and publish it what i have now to say to this gentleman needs no witness his friend left the house between fear and astonishment clavijo attempted to break off the interview but beaumarchais compelled him to resume his seat now that we are alone sir this is my proposal and i hope it will meet with your approval you cannot suppose that i have come here to play the part of a brother in a comedy who desires at all costs to get his sister married it happens to suit my arrangements as well as your own that you should not marry her but you have wantonly outraged a woman of honour because you thought her helpless and unprotected in a foreign land that is the action of a blackguard and a coward you have now to declare in writing with all doors open and in the presence of your servants that you are a thoroughly dishonourable fellow and have deceived betrayed and insulted my sister without any justification whatever the declaration will be in french so that the servants will not understand you will then sign the document hand it to me and i shall show it to our ambassador i shall next have the declaration printed and circulated at court and in every part of the town in short i shall do everything in my power to make you lose your place and shall pursue you constantly and relentlessly until my sister's resentment is appeased and she herself tells me to stop i will never sign such a declaration said clavijo in a voice shaken by emotion i can well believe you for if i were in your place i should perhaps not do so either whether you sign or refuse to sign however is all the same to me but unless you do so from this moment i shall stay with you i shall never leave you where you go i will go until in sheer desperation you come to deliver yourself of my presence behind the royal palace of buen retiro if fortune favours me i shall take my sister in my arms put her in my carriage and take her straight back to paris without seeing the ambassador or speaking of our affair to anybody if on the contrary fortune favours you so much the worse for me i have made my will you will have every advantage over us you will be able to laugh at our expense order breakfast to be served and beaumarchais coolly walked to the bell and rang a servant entered with the chocolate beaumarchais took his cup and sipped it while clavijo paced the room in silence after a long interval the spaniard made up his mind and turning to his visitor said monsieur de beaumarchais listen to me nothing can possibly excuse my conduct towards your sister ambition was my undoing but if i had known that donna maria had such a brother as you far from regarding her as a lonely foreign girl i should have looked for the greatest advantage from our union what you have said has given me the greatest respect for you and i implore you to do all you can to repair as far as possible the injury i have done to your sister give her back to me sir and i shall be the happiest of men to receive from you both my wife and pardon for the wrong i have done it is too late my sister no longer loves you all you have to do now is to sign the declaration after much ado and whining attempts to get its terms softened clavijo either from fear of the alternative or in the hope of gaining time 
and perhaps winning back the woman who had loved him, swallowed his pride, wrote and signed in the presence of Beaumarchais and his own servants the following document. I, the undersigned, Joseph Clavion, keeper of the Crown Archives, acknowledge that, after having been received with all kindness into the house of Madame Guibert, I deceived Mademoiselle Caron, her sister, under promise of marriage many times repeated, and that I broke my troth without any excuse of fault or weakness on her part, that, on the contrary, the propriety of this young lady, for whom I have the greatest respect, has always been above reproach. I acknowledge that by my indiscreet conduct, the levity of my conversation, and the construction which might have been placed upon it, I have openly insulted this virtuous young lady, of whom I hereby freely and willingly ask pardon although i acknowledge myself to be in every way unworthy of obtaining it i promise her every kind of reparation which she may desire if the present method is not agreeable to her drawn up at madrid by my own hand in the presence of her brother nineteenth may seventeen sixty four signed joseph clavijol Taking the document, Beaumarchais warned the Spaniard that he intended to make the fullest possible use of the declaration, and that henceforth he must be looked upon as his declared enemy. Clavijo begged that, before publishing his humiliation, Beaumarchais would allow him to make one more attempt to induce Donna Maria to forgive him. The wily Spaniard already knew his man, and approached him on the weak side of his vanity and good nature. Clavio, clearly a born actor, implored him, with tears in his voice, to act as his mediator with his sister. Beaumarchais refused. He finally consented, however, not to dishonor Clavijo publicly, until after his return from Aranjuez. The French ambassador, the Marquis d'Ossan, after listening to his compatriot's recital, and complimenting him upon the ability with which he had conducted the affair, nevertheless strongly advised him to overcome his sister's repugnance, and take advantage of the Spaniard's contrite mood to get the young couple promptly married, for if he was any judge of men, Clavijo would go far and in any case the less publicity given to such delicate matters the better for all parties rather unsettled by m de saint's advice beaumarchais on returning to madrid found that clavijo had already made some headway with his sisters and concluded that he too knew something about women soft sensitive creatures whose hearts are easily moved in favour of the repentant lover who knows exactly how much boldness to blend with his humility when returning to sigh at their feet directly he heard that beaumarchais had returned clavijo set himself to win his confidence and such was the charm of his conversation and manners that in a few days the pair became on quite friendly terms on may twenty fifth the spaniard without warning suddenly disappeared from the house of m portugues and took refuge with an officer of his acquaintance fearing some fresh change of front beaumarchais immediately sought him out in his new lodging in explanation of his action clavijo said that by moving he had thought to give his friends convincing proof of his sincerity since his late host was strongly opposed to his marriage so far from blaming him beaumarchais told him that the motive of his removal did credit to the delicacy of his feelings his heart warmed towards his late enemy the next day he received from Clavijo a dignified and apparently quite sincere letter, repeating his desire to marry Mademoiselle Caron, if the past unhappy misunderstandings have not irretrievably alienated her from me, and urgently requesting him to do his utmost to bring about a reconciliation. 
as a last favour he begged that beaumarchais himself would go to m grimaldi to secure his consent to the marriage on reading the letter to his sisters marie louise burst into tears well well my child you love him still and you are ashamed are you not i can see it for myself well so be it since you are no longer angry with him you are none the less a good kind girl this clavijo he added laughing is a monster like most men but such as he is i advise you to pardon him for my own sake i should have liked it better if he had fought for your sake i am glad that he did not his bantering words caused her to smile through her tears and taking this for a tacit consent he hurried off to fetch clavijo telling him on the way that he was a hundred times luckier fellow than he had any right to be the spaniard agreed with him so cordially that he ended by charming everybody and the lovers were reconciled on the spot in his excitement clavijo crossed to madame guilbert's desk and taking out pen and paper for a few moments sat writing then in the presence of the whole company including a secretary of the polish embassy the spanish consul at bayonne and other well-known people he gracefully presented what he had written on bended knee to his mistress with the request that she would add her signature to his own the document ran as follows we the undersigned joseph clavijo and marie louise caron have hereby renewed our oft-repeated vow to belong only to each other and we undertake to sanctify this solemn promise by the sacrament of marriage with the least possible delay in testament whereof we have mutually drawn up and signed this document at madrid twenty sixth may seventeen sixty four signed marie louise caron and joseph clavijon the company then gave themselves up to the enjoyments of a delightful evening and had not yet separated when at eleven o'clock beaumarchais set out for aranjuez travelling by night in order to avoid the heat of the day m grimaldi readily assented to the marriage remarking that clavijo might have saved his visitor a journey for all that was necessary in such cases was to write to the minister beaumarchais at once took upon himself the responsibility for this irregularity of procedure on the ground that he wished to pay his respects before begging him to grant a few audiences on other subjects of importance on reaching home he found a letter from clavijo awaiting him protesting bitterly against an abominable libel which he alleged had just been issued and implying that beaumarchais was responsible for its appearance he enclosed a copy of the slander in his own handwriting throughout with the request that he would have printed and circulated the promise he had last signed in order to refute these baseless slurs upon his honour in the meantime until the public were disabused he dared not show himself and suggested the desirability of their not meeting for a few days Beaumarchais at once proceeded to his house and found him in bed. After gently reproaching the invalid for so readily believing ill of him, Beaumarchais, in order to pacify him, promised that, as soon as he was well, he would take him everywhere and treat him publicly as his brother. They next agreed upon the final arrangements for the marriage, and the following day formal visits were paid to the grand vicar and the apostolic notary beaumarchais was so pleased with the happy turn in his sister's affairs that upon his return to the bedside of the sick man he cordially embraced him and knowing his straitened circumstances said that he would take it as a brotherly act if his friend would accept his purse containing about nine thousand livres and a little choice jewellery and lace so that he might be in a position to offer his bride a suitable present the spaniard accepted the jewellery and the lace but refused the money 
The next day, the purse, with a further sum of money just drawn from the banker, a roll of valuable lace, all his silk stockings, and several gold-embroidered vests, were stolen from Beaumarchais by a quadroon valet, whom he had taken into his service at Bayonne. Beaumarchais at once reported the theft to the commandant of Madrid, and was much surprised at the extreme coolness of his reception. Clavijo received the news of the accident with admirable philosophy, and assured his friend that he would never see either the valet or his goods again. Beaumarchais wrote to the ambassador, informing him of his loss, and promptly dismissed the incident from his mind. During the next few days the relations between the two friends became closer than ever. But when Beaumarchais called on June 5th, he was astonished to be informed that the Spaniard had again abruptly changed his lodging. After an active search over every quarter of the town, the new retreat of the elusive lover was at length discovered. Again he met the reproaches of Beaumarchais with the most plausible excuses, but firmly rejected the suggestion that he should come and live with his friend and his sisters until after the wedding. At last, in order to allay the doubts which had again arisen in Marie-Louise's mind, Beaumarchais sent to the apostolic notary on June seventh for the authorization of the ceremony what was his amazement to be informed by this official that the wedding was being opposed by a young woman who nine years before had received a promise of marriage from the bridegroom and that he had just made clavijo sign a declaration admitting the claim beaumarchais found that the woman was a chambermaid mad with rage and humiliation he ran to clavijo's apartments this promise of marriage comes from you he exclaimed it was concocted yesterday you are an utter scoundrel i would not trust my sister to you for all the wealth of the indies this evening i am going to aranuez to tell m grimaldi of your infamy and far from opposing your marriage on my sister's behalf i shall demand as my sole vengeance that you be compelled to marry your chambermaid forthwith i will do everything i can even to supplying her dot to help her pursue you to the altar then you will be caught in your own trap you will be dishonoured and i shall be avenged my dear brother said clavijo imperturbably pray suspend your resentment and your journey until to-morrow i have had nothing to do with this unfortunate business it is true that I was formerly desperately in love with the pretty chambermaid of Madame Portuguese, and promised to marry her, but since our rupture nothing more has been said. I speak to you as one man of the world to another. Your sister's enemies are behind this girl. Believe me, my friend, to buy her off is only a matter of a few golden pistoles, I will take you to a well-known lawyer, who will soon settle this little affair. Come to see me again at eight o'clock this evening. With bitterness in his heart and indecision in his mind, Beaumarchais had, nevertheless, to accept this explanation. Was the man a rascal? Yet what could be his aim in playing with him? He decided to suspend his judgment accompanied by two friends he kept the appointment agreed upon clavijo had fled beaumarchais had scarcely reached home when a courier delivered a letter from the ambassador at aranuez advising him that clavijo fearing your violence has lodged a criminal complaint against you for having a few days ago at the point of a pistol compelled him in his own house to sign an engagement to marry your sister the missive concluded by advising him, as he valued his safety, to abstain from all further aggressive words or acts until he had seen the writer. Beaumarchais read the note with consternation. He had been tricked. At that moment an officer of the Walloon guards entered the room. 
Monsieur de Beaumarchais, you have not a minute to lose. Tomorrow morning you will be arrested in your bed. The order is issued. I have come to warn you. The man is a rascal. He has turned everybody against you. Fly instantly. I would rather die, stoutly declared Beaumarchais, and ordering a carriage with six mules to be at the door at four o'clock in the morning, he bade farewell to his family and retired to his room. For some time he felt absolutely nonplussed, his body without energy and his mind a blank. Gradually recovering his tranquillity, however, he sat down and wrote, like a man in a fever, the detailed account of all he had done since his arrival in Spain, as summarized in the foregoing narrative. He was still writing when interrupted by the arrival of his conveyance. He at once set out for Aronuez. M. Dassin granting him an immediate audience, the ambassador listened to all he had to say, but whilst commiserating with him upon his misfortune, said frankly that it was hopeless to attempt to bring his enemy to justice. The court and the whole town had been stirred up against him, and the best advice he could give him was to take the road to France without a moment's delay. All the pleadings of Beaumarchais would be in vain. Such was his agitation on leaving M. Dossin that Beaumarchais, unable to rest, passed the remainder of the night in wandering through the park. Recovering his spirits with the dawn, he determined not to be beaten. Whilst waiting to interview M. Grimaldi, he happened to encounter M. Wall, who had recently retired, after a long and honorable career, in the most important offices of the crown. Knowing him to be a good friend of France, Beaumarchais asked to be allowed a few minutes' private conversation with him, on some very urgent business. M. Wall courteously led him into his room, and Beaumarchais told him the whole story, showing all the autograph documents in support of his case. At the end of the narrative, the old courtier rose from his chair, took his visitor's hand, and said, "'You may rest assured that the king will do you justice. It was I who recommended Clavijo for the office he holds, for I saw that he was a man of great ability.' but ability without probity is a misfortune and i will never allow it to be said that i protect a person who has proved himself to be a scoundrel since i recommended him to the king i owe it to myself to see that the post is placed in worthier hands m wall thereupon ordered his carriage and drove with beaumarchais to the palace and entering the royal apartments told the king the circumstances which compelled him to ask for the dismissal of his protege the king expressed a wish to see the young frenchman who had carried through this hazardous enterprise with such energy and resolution and when beaumarchais was admitted requested him to read his memoir he was so much impressed by the narrative that he ordered Clavio forthwith to be deprived of his office, and the next day asked to have a copy of the journal and the documents which had been read to him at the audience on the previous day. Clavio was evidently one of those people who spend much of their time in making resolutions which they immediately begin to regret, and their afterthoughts are commonly wiser than their actions. When he heard of his disgrace, he took refuge in a Capuchin monastery, whence he wrote a letter in which he expressed his sorrow for himself with great eloquence, and professed to the last his astonishment at the cruel and unmerited punishment he had received at the hands of a man who he thought was his friend. Before leaving Spain, Beaumarchais, the least resentful of men, made several vain attempts to secure his rehabilitation. For, he says, I no longer hated him. In fact, I have never hated anybody. And that, we believe, is the truth, though, to be sure, magnanimity comes easier to the victor than to the vanquished. End of chapter 5
Chapter Six of Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. In Old Madrid. It was not until February 1774, ten years after the event, that Beaumarchais made public his account of the adventure with Clavijon, in his fourth memoir against Gozman, his enemies having had the maladdress to give him an opening by issuing a lying version of the affair allowing for his natural flamboyancy and his instinctive dramatization of everything that happened to him the authenticity of the narrative in all essential details can no longer be contested and that he actually wrote it at the time of the occurrence is proved by family papers which have come down to us his father for instance addressed him from paris on the fifth june seventeen sixty four how deeply i appreciate my dear beaumarchais the happiness of being the father of a son whose deeds crown so gloriously the end of my career i saw at the first glance how much your generous action must conduce to the honour of my dear lisette oh my dear boy what a fine wedding present the declaration of clavijo is for her if one may judge of the cause by the effect he must have been scared out of his wits assuredly i would never sign such a document for all the empire of mahmoud joined to that of trebizond it covers you with glory and him with shame i have received by the same post two letters from my charming countess one for me and one for julie beautiful touching letters full of tender expressions for me and honourable for you you have enchanted her she hardly ceases to talk of her pleasure in knowing you of her desire to help you and of her joy in seeing how all the spaniards approve and praise your action respecting clavion she could not be more appreciative if you belonged to her own family pray do not neglect her adieu my dear beaumarchais my honour my glory my crown the joy of my heart accept a thousand caresses from the most affectionate of fathers and the best of thy friends the reference in this letter to a wedding present is in connection with a second offer of marriage which marie louise received at this time from a frenchman settled in madrid named durand who was one of the companions of beaumarchais in hunting down clavijon marie louise caron was thirty-three at the time of the clavijon adventure a fact which may perhaps help to explain the coyness of her lover beaumarchais in his narrative certainly implies that she was a younger woman and may have been impelled to this little deception by the fear that if his readers knew the exact truth they might think his sister was old enough to know better but is any one ever old enough to know better on the other hand she is reputed to have been both witty and good-looking she never married on her return to france she is believed to have retired with her eldest sister to the convent of les dames de la croix at roy but her later history is obscure a grandson of beaumarchais vaguely recollected having heard that she died in america but there is no definite information on the point even the year of her death is uncertain, although it probably took place before 1775. As for Clavijon, he lived to become a distinguished man of letters, to see himself represented on the stage as the villain of a melodrama by Goethe, to translate Buffon into Spanish, and to be vice-director of the Royal Institute of Natural History he died in 1806 the clavijo episode lasted less than a month and it was no sooner satisfactorily concluded than we find beaumarchais in the thick of half a dozen great commercial enterprises such as the floating of a company with the object of capturing the contracts 
for the provisionment of all the troops in Spain, Majorca, and the settlements on the north coast of Africa, involving a sum of not less than twenty million francs a year. At the moment of concluding the bargain, the scheme broke down, mainly owing to the timidity and inertia of his Spanish associates in the transaction. Then he had plans for securing, on behalf of a French company, a trading monopoly with Louisiana, modeled on the India Company, for the exploitation of the Sierra Morena, for providing all the Spanish towns with white bread, and all the Spanish colonies with black slaves. He was ready for anything and everything. His energy was inexhaustible. He spent his days in planning vast and complicated financial combinations, and his evenings in a round of gaieties and frivolities, without ever allowing the pleasures of the night to interfere with the business of the morning. He was welcomed everywhere, fed it everywhere. Yet he found time to badger the ministers in the interests of his various schemes, to frequent the fashionable salons, to make love, to study the theatre, the literature, the manners and customs of Spain, to play the harp and sing at amateur concerts, to compose new settings for old songs, or new words for old settings. Truly, he writes to his father, with my head upon my pillow, I laugh when I think how nicely the things of this world fit into each other how odd and diverse are the ways of fortune and how above all in the whirl of affairs the mind superior to events rejoices at the clash of interests pleasures sorrows which dash and break against it beaumarchais had not been in spain more than a month when he became on the best possible terms with a lady whose beauty and accomplishments were the delight of the diplomatic world in madrid his biographers more careful of her reputation than the lady herself refer to her as the marquise de la c but after a discreet interval of over a century the veil of anonymity was withdrawn in madrid she was known as the marquise de la croix the wife of a lieutenant-general of artillery in the service of the spanish king and a near relative of monseigneur de jarent bishop of orleans she may or may not have been a genuine marquise and was possibly the same person in whose company m de sartine had so often caught beaumarchais in paris if the latter surmise is correct her presence in madrid was doubtless a powerful incentive to beaumarchais to fly to the aid of his sister however this may be madame de la croix was received in the best society and her musical and social talents were very much in request beaumarchais was never backward in making himself at home and in august we find him addressing his private correspondence from her apartments on the twelfth of that month while striding to his father the marquise bent over the back of his chair and insisted on his telling the old man something about her he complied in these terms in the room where i am writing there is a great and exceedingly beautiful lady the very dear friend of your comtesse madame de foinclara who makes fun of you and me all day long she tells me for example that she thanks you for the kindness you did her thirty-three years ago when you laid the foundations of the delightful acquaintanceship which i opened with her two months ago i assure her that i will not fail to tell you this and i do so at once for what is only a little joke on her part justly gives me as much pleasure as if she really thought it at this point the fair marquise took his pen to interpolate i think it i feel it and i swear it sir beaumarchais having recovered his pen proceeds 
do not fail then through bashfulness to thank her excellency in your first letter for her thanks and still more for the kindness with which she overwhelms me i admit that without the lure of such a charming association my spanish business would be full of bitterness in his reply dated the first september old caron keeps up the banter though you have a thousand times given me cause to congratulate myself for taking so much trouble on your behalf thirty-three years ago if i had then foreseen the happiness it would procure you of being able to amuse her fair excellency who does me the honour of thanking me for it i should have done my best to render you still more amiable in her beautiful eyes beg her to allow me to express my deepest respect for her and offer her my services in paris i should be overjoyed at the happiness of being useful to her here since she is the friend of my dear countess i beg her to be so kind as to express to her my respectful attachment in the end the marquise caught the fancy of the prince of the astorias the heir to the throne beaumarchais with all his good qualities was never over delicate in love and we find him shortly before leaving spain for ever acting with great spirit the part of figaro in real life by helping his rosine into the arms of this princely almaviva at this time also beaumarchais used his credit to obtain the post of engineer to the king for his brother-in-law guilbert and maintained an uninterrupted and exceedingly lively correspondence with his family in paris moreover he tactfully but firmly collected his father's overdue accounts from various members of the spanish court and throughout the whole period of his absence took an active interest in the affairs of all his sisters several of his letters in this connection are concerned with the establishment of his fifth sister known to her intimates as jeannette or tantan and more formally as mademoiselle jean marguerite de bois garnier a name she had adopted when pierre augustin became monsieur de beaumarchais she was an elegant and piquantly humorous little person who had for long disdainfully kept at her heels an unfortunate admirer named octave jeannot de Miron, a parliamentary advocate and friend of the family of several years standing he was very much in love with her or would scarcely have supported so complacently the tendency of both brother and sisters to make him the butt of their wit at last feeling that he was being trifled with he wrote an exceedingly cutting letter to beaumarchais in madrid the reply was not calculated to allay his irritation for pierre augustin wrote in anger and one angry man is as good as another mademoiselle de bois garnier further wounded the lover's vanity by taking her brother's part but beaumarchais had no sooner dispatched his letter than he was ashamed of it and immediately wrote to his father pleading his friend's cause fourteenth january seventeen sixty five sir and dearest father i have received your last letter dated the thirty first december and that of bois garnier her reply has given me great pleasure i see that she is an odd creature with much wit and an honest mind but if i am in any way responsible for the coldness between her and her admirer and if what passed between the doctor and me is the cause of their disagreement i say in advance that i have quite recovered from my resentment and if she persists in hers she must do so on her own account alone whatever opinion this friend has of me whatever kind of comparison he makes between his own qualities and mine i shall not quarrel with him the only thing capable of upsetting me is that he should speak ill of my heart he is welcome to think as little as he pleases of my wit 
the first will always be at his service the second always ready to flay him when he deserves it when i tell him the truth about himself it is always without bitterness i have no wish to offend him has not everybody his twist so far from learning with pleasure that our friends do not get on together i am sorry for miron lacks none of the solid qualities which make for the happiness of a good woman and if my bois is less touched by these than repelled by the want of a few frivolous accomplishments which moreover he has in some degree i would say that bois is a ninny who has not yet learnt by experience to prefer happiness to pleasure to say exactly what i think he is quite right to compare himself favourably with me in many things in which i feel i have neither his virtue nor his constancy and these things are of great price where a lifelong union is concerned i therefore beg my bois gagne to consider only what is so infinitely praiseworthy in our friend and soon it will be all plain sailing again for twenty-four hours i was furious with him but apart from his profession there is not a man whom i would prefer to be my associate or my brother-in-law i know what bois will say yes but he plays the hurdy-gurdy it is true his heels are half an inch too high he narrowly escapes being in tune when he sings he eats raw apples in the evening and takes equally raw injections in the morning he is frigid and didactic when he chats he has a certain clumsiness in everything he does but a wig waistcoat or galoshes are not reasons for driving a man away if he has an excellent heart and a cultivated mind the good people of the rue de conde ought to be governed by other principles adieu boisgagne there is a long paragraph for you the lovers were reconciled and in seventeen sixty seven having received a suitable dowry from her brother mademoiselle de boisgagne was married to m de meron who was later appointed by the influence of his brother-in-law private secretary to the prince de conti madame de meron became the centre of a society of artists and men of letters it was in her house that the abbe de lille read much of his unpublished verse and it was here in seventeen seventy that her brother met his boswell paul philippe goudin de la Renelerie. She was an accomplished amateur actress, and played the chief role in many of the farces which her brother wrote for the entertainment of his fellow guests at the seat of his friend Monsieur Lenormand d'Etiole, the accommodating husband of Madame de Pompadour. Madame de Meron died in 1773, leaving one daughter, who distinguished herself by her literary and musical ability, and became known as the Muse of Orléans, when she settled in that town upon her marriage. During the whole period of his sojourn in Spain, there was no society in which Beaumarchais received a warmer welcome than that of the diplomatic corps. The British ambassador, Lord Rochford, was his particular friend, and the pair, sometimes accompanied by Madame de la Croix, spent many a pleasant hour at the diplomat's house, singing to each other the folk-songs of Spain and their own compositions. His relations with the Russian ambassador, the Comte de Bertolin, and his very pretty wife, were scarcely less cordial though the friendship was not uninterrupted the trouble arose out of a gambling debt games of chance never had much attraction for beaumarchais but one evening after supper at their house he was persuaded by his hosts against his will to take a hand at cards at the end of the game he had won five hundred leaves from the count and fifteen hundred leaves from his wife from that day this particular game was never again played the ambassador proposing that they should play faro instead beaumarchais steadily refused 
Meanwhile, not a word was said of the two thousand livres owing to him. About a week later, Beaumarchais was present when the Count won one hundred louis, still without attempting to settle his debt. Annoyed at this negligence, Beaumarchais said in the hearing of everybody, "'If the Count will lend me this money, I'll play him at Pharaoh.' M. de Bertolin, unable to decline the request, passed over the hundred louis he had just won. Beaumarchais held the bank, and within an hour lost all the borrowed money. He rose from the table and said, laughing, "'My dear Count, we are quits. Yes, but you can no longer say you do not play faro, and in the future we hope you will not break up the company.' for a few louis with all my heart, but not for banks of one hundred louis. But this one did not cost you much. That is as much as could be said if I had to do with a bad debtor. Thereupon the countess broke off the altercation. Madame de la Croix asked him to give her his arm, and they left the house together. Nevertheless, Beaumarchais still regularly visited the Count, though on a rather more formal basis, and to please his hosts played a game or two on each occasion. One night he won twenty louis, and put the whole sum on two cards. Both won. Fortune continued to smile on him, and at length he broke the bank of two hundred louis. The Chevalier de Guzman at once set up another bank, and, begging that none would leave, dared Beaumarchais to break that also. Having won so much, he felt obliged to take up the challenge. Everybody in the room crowded round the table to watch the play. Putting aside fifty louis for the new game, he returned the rest of his winnings to the bank, hoping by this generous action to be excused from playing again. His luck held, and two hours later he went home with five hundred louis in his pocket. Of this sum he lost one hundred and fifty the next day. Madame de la Croix said that, having made such an unprecedented sacrifice on his winnings, he ought to keep the rest. Acting on this suggestion, he was about to leave when the Count said, "'Will you not try your luck against me, sir?' "'Sir,' replied Beaumarchais, "'I have lost rather heavily this evening.' "'But you won a great deal last night,' retorted the ambassador with some warmth. "'Monsieur le Comte, answered Beaumarchais, you know how little I care for money gained at cards. I played unwillingly, and won against all good sense, and you press me in this way only because you know that I played without skill, and therefore at a great disadvantage. Egad! cried the Count, you can play well enough to win, and a good deal of this money was mine. Very well, Monsieur le Comte, how much did you lose? A hundred and fifty louis. Then I will stand to lose three hundred louis, said Beaumarchais, for apart from the hundred and fifty which I have returned to the bank, I will play you for a second hundred and fifty at twenty-five louis on each deal. Still Beaumarchais won, so when his opponent had lost two hundred louis, Pierre Augustin rose and said, it is madness for me to go on playing i shall ruin you you do not mean to say you are going sir play me for five hundred louis to give me a chance of recouping myself no monsieur le comte some other day it is four o'clock and time for bed you were more polite yesterday with the chevalier de guzman and it cost him five hundred louis i am dreadfully sleepy However, will you play me for the two hundred louis on one deal at trente et quarante? No, he replied, at faro. Gentlemen, said Beaumarchais, with a deep bow, I wish you good evening. Madame de Bertolin, annoyed at her husband's losses, at this point intervened to tell Beaumarchais that his luck was superior to his manners. Now, a week before, at Lord Rochford's, she had taken Beaumarchais aside, and begged him with tears in her eyes to lend her thirty louis to pay a gambling debt. 
although he himself was losing rather heavily at the time, and had not forgotten the affair of the two thousand livres, he immediately complied with her request, and she expressed herself deeply grateful to him for his kindness. But she had not returned the money. On hearing her cutting remark, Beaumarchais looked her steadily in the eyes and said, "'A week ago, madame, you complimented me in a contrary sense.' The countess blushed in her confusion, and with a profound bow Beaumarchais left the house. He swore he would never play again. He continued to frequent the Russian's house. He was coldly received, and not a word was said about paying their debt. At last Madame de la Croix spoke of the matter to the Count's doctor, and told him exactly what she thought of the ambassador's conduct, and added that unless he changed his behavior she would tell him to his face what she was now saying, and all Spain should hear of it. The next day the doctor brought two hundred louis to Beaumarchais, at the house of Madame de la Croix, with whom he was dining. Greatly offended, she sent word that she would see the ambassador in the evening and give him the lesson he deserved, that he ought to have brought the money personally to Beaumarchais at home, and to offer his excuses for his sulkiness and slackness in paying. However, Beaumarchais took the two hundred louis, but when the doctor asked for a receipt, Beaumarchais laughed at him and sent a polite but piquant letter to the count well calculated to make him feel ashamed two hours later the countess came to madame de la croix to offer an explanation and sent the doctor to beaumarchais to reproach him for no longer going to see them to which he replied that in spite of his extreme regret to be deprived of their society he did not think it seemly to visit a house when he had such just cause for complaint against its master. The misunderstanding was speedily cleared up, and after some flattering overtures from the ambassador and his wife, Beaumarchais paid them a formal visit of reconciliation. He was received with great ceremony, and, preceded by two pages, was shown into the reception room, where a concert was in progress. The countess was at the harpsichord. She immediately rose, and leading the visitor to her husband, said that such friends ought not to fall out on account of a misunderstanding, and she hoped they would always remain on good terms. Monsieur de Beaumarchais, she added, I am going to play the part of Annette. I hope you will give us the pleasure of taking the part of Lubin. The Swedish envoy will be the lord of the manor. Prince Mazursky, the bailiff, we are already rehearsing the piece. It was impossible to refuse such a courteous proposal, and the company forthwith proceeded to the harpsichord, and Beaumarchais was invited to sing Lubin's songs, the others following with as much of their parts as they could remember. They all spent a delightful musical evening, and good humor reigned once more. "'Let nobody ever speak to me of play again,' says Beaumarchais, in recounting the episode to his sister Julie. "'I prefer to amuse myself with more lively pleasures.' At dessert the countess sent him a note containing four lines of verse which made up in cordiality for what they lacked in technical skill." Her flattery pleased him immensely, and he was not afraid to show it. Everybody has his pet conceit. Those who are very critical of vanity in others rarely have any difficulty in finding excuses for their own. And, as Beaumarchais says, such honors are not to be met with every day of the week. He thoroughly enjoyed himself. His friends were more charming than ever, and he was richer by 14,500 livres. He had every reason to be well satisfied with himself. Whilst in Madrid, Beaumarchais began a correspondence with Voltaire. "'I have received a letter from Monsieur de Voltaire,' he wrote to his father. "'He laughingly compliments me upon my thirty-two teeth, my gay philosophy, and my age.' 
His letter is very good, but my own demanded just such a letter, and I think I might have written it myself. He wanted to know something about this country, but I shall reply in the words which Monsieur de Carreau used the other day to the Marquise d'Arissa at Monsieur Grimaldi's when she asked him what he thought of Spain. Madame, I beg you to wait until I am out of the country before giving my reply. I am too sincere and too polite to give it in the house of a minister of the king. In spite of his great social success, however, most, though not all, of his commercial enterprises, one after another, fell to pieces like a house of cards. Those that remained he left in the charge of Durand, yet when beaumarchais returned to france at the end of march seventeen sixty five his time and energy had not been wasted he had gained invaluable experience in the conduct of huge business transactions he had extended his knowledge of men and women he had stored his mind with the songs the dances the colors the manners and customs of that land of romance and sunshine and above all he brought away with him the material out of which grew figaro and suzanne almaviva and rossin cherubin and fanchette bartholo basile bridoisson those original and joyous figures who were to add so greatly to the gaiety of nations and to establish their creator's chief claim to immortality End of chapter 6「the story of the beautiful creole beaumarchais was a widower of twenty-eight when he made the acquaintance of pauline le b an orphan of eighteen she was a creole born in saint domingo and had been brought to paris as a child to be educated and to live with a widowed aunt who was a distant relative of the caron family in her native island she was mistress of a mansion and estate of an estimated value of two million francs but the property was heavily mortgaged much neglected and mismanaged by those into whose charge it had been committed who moreover were gravely suspected of dishonest administration pauline's fortune therefore consisted chiefly in great expectations and she was in reality quite poor all agree however that she was an exceedingly beautiful girl with a charming voice endearing ways and an exceptionally gifted musician soon after meeting the caron family for the first time pauline and julie developed for each other one of those passionate and romantic friendships so common among young people of the same sex under these circumstances it was almost inevitable that pauline should before long begin to take a more than ordinary interest in her friend's fascinating brother who cut such a fine figure at court and in society pauline found it very delightful to sing whilst he accompanied her upon the harp and he found it equally agreeable to see the light of welcome in her eyes whenever they met and the shy yet intimate glances she gave him when in company beaumarchais indulged himself in these pleasures more and more frequently and his adoring sisters did the rest but in winning pauline's heart he lost his own though not quite sufficiently to lose his head first of all he undertook to unravel the tangled skein of her affairs he spoke to mesdames on the matter and obtained on her behalf their recommendation to m de cluny lord lieutenant of san domingo but although his affection was now deeply engaged and his thoughts turned complacently towards matrimony 
the small still voice of arithmetic became ever more insistent so before committing himself to a formal proposal he entrusted his uncle pichon de vinueve with ten thousand francs chartered a ship filled her with a cargo of goods likely to be necessary for the restoration of the house and estate and packed him off to san domingo with secret instructions to furnish him with an exact account of pauline's assets and liabilities and the possibilities of developing the property these measures were taken in seventeen sixty three it is only fair to add that before making the acquaintance of pauline beaumarchais had himself acquired interests of some importance in the island which also needed attention and that about this time he even contemplated settling there besides her aunt the young creole had one other relative in paris a rich uncle a widower without children in his first letters to pauline we find the harassed beaumarchais for the second time in his career engaged in the bewildering task of moderating the ardour of a young woman whose naive passion had been excited by his philandering his dear and amiable pauline could not doubt that a sincere and durable attachment was the motive of all he had done for her and if he had not yet formally asked for her hand it was solely because all his available capital was being employed in putting her affairs on a satisfactory basis he had however spoken to her uncle and flattered himself that his views had met with cordial approval he had even ventured to tell the old gentleman he had every reason to think that when the time came to explain his intentions more explicitly his charming niece would not reject his suit one thing alone restrained him the fear that the money he had sunk in her estate might be lost and that he would then be unable to offer her the position in society to which she was entitled he did not know what her expectations might be from her uncle and did not think it delicate to invite a discussion on the subject either with her or her uncle such a procedure was repugnant to his character he would not say another word on so distasteful a matter nevertheless he urged his dearest pauline to consider that in order to be happy it is necessary to be without anxiety for the future how very embarrassing it would be for instance if he had no sooner taken her to himself than he should have cause to worry less the capital of not less than eighty thousand francs which he had sunk in her west indian estates should by some misfortune be lost if therefore she was willing to accept his homage there were only two courses open to them the first was to have patience until the money and exertions he had expended on her behalf had borne fruit the second was to persuade her aunt to sound her uncle as to his intentions respecting his niece yet far from desiring that the old gentleman should deprive himself in order to increase her well-being beaumarchais was always ready to sacrifice himself if occasion should arise to render this worthy relative's old age more agreeable but since after all he was her uncle and could not take his money with him when the time came to deplore the end of his honourable career it would be more satisfactory to everybody to know exactly what they had to expect my tenderness for you he concluded will always have precedence of everything even of my prudence my fate is in your hands yours in those of your uncle pauline's reply shows that she was too much in love to appreciate the full significance of this none too flattering mixture of affection and ready reckoning she flew to her uncle and finding him in a propitious mood opened her heart to him 
pleased and touched by her confidence, the old gentleman was most sympathetic, and said he would like to talk the matter over with her lover, for whom he expressed the highest esteem. In her excitement she immediately wrote to Beaumarchais, informing him of the result of her impulsiveness. "'You tell me,' she wrote, "'that your fate is in my hands, and that mine is in the hands of my uncle.' I, in my turn, make you the advocate of my interests. If you love me, as I believe you do, pass on to him a little of that endearing warmth. He complains of being tied down in advance. My dear, your heart and mind must work together in this conversation. Nothing can resist you when you have set your mind on anything. Give me this proof of your tenderness." i shall look upon your success as the most convincing testimony of your eagerness for what you so prettily call your happiness your foolish pauline could not read the dear words without the maddest beating of her heart adieu my dear i hope your first visit on returning from versailles will be to my uncle remember all the deference you owe him since he may become your own I must finish, for I feel I am talking wildly. Good night, you rascal. In spite of her uncle's reluctance to agree to a formal engagement, it was understood that the marriage should take place as soon as the West Indian affairs were settled. There are numerous gaps in the correspondence, but enough remains to reveal Pierre Augustin in nearly every phase of his character. Here we have him, after maneuvering Pauline into writing to him, treating her to a little personal philosophy. I thank you, my dearest Pauline, for your praise of my first letter. But surely it had more success than you think. It touched your self-love. The wish to expostulate leads necessarily to writing. Hence a letter for me." that is just what i wanted i am immensely gratified you have written to me first for the letter of which you complain was not really a letter the second was beside the question since business demanded it it follows that you have written to me first my self-love that is as much as to say my love also is satisfied for the latter is but an extension of the former to include the beloved we love ourselves in our mistress in the judicious choice which justifies our good taste we love ourselves in the tenderness we lavish on her which turns her heart towards us there is only one way of regarding all the happiness and misfortune of my life that is as they affect you and me without this love of ourselves no passion could enter into our souls it is divinely ordained and the love of a charming fellow-creature is so delightful only because it is an intimate emanation of self-love forgive me my beloved pauline if i give myself rather the airs of a metaphysician i am forgetting myself but what i say cannot be quite unintelligible to such an enlightened perceptive and upright mind do i not tell you i will leave off I renounce the playful manner, since you desire a more serious expression of my feelings, in order to indulge your engaging tenderness. Listen, my beautiful girl, the pen ought to follow the lead of the sentiments implicitly. The man who reflects when he writes to his beloved is an impostor who deceives her. What matters it whether a letter is well turned, its sentences well rounded? love tolerates no such restraints it begins a phrase which it thinks good breaks off to begin another which seems better then a third and warmer one leaving the others incomplete disorder follows through having too much to say we say it badly but this amiable confusion is sweet to the heart that can read between the lines this epidemic malady triumphs over space and time and is caught even by reading we willingly share the charm of a disorder of which we know ourselves to be the first patient 
my sweetheart says when my beloved writes or talks business he has plenty of common sense his ideas are coherent his conclusions follow his premises every word goes straight to the mark but when he abandons his pen to the guidance of his poor heart he begins quietly enough then gets excited wanders from his path disdains to retrace his steps wholly given up to his object it matters not what he says so long as he proves that he loves me well thou art right dear little woman i will take the liberty of following the example thou hast set by using the second person singular i tell thee i love thee i repeat it dost thou believe it if not so much the worse for thee it is the avowal of my love which inspired me with happiness the opinion thou hast of it takes only second place number one the love which one feels number two that which one inspires these are the true gradations of the soul what shall i say to thee my heart is full of my last thought it will want more than half an hour of silence and repose to regain the calm which the pretty fire set up in it by writing to thee has caused me to lose but far from complaining i would not for anything have it otherwise good heavens i want to turn over but i have no more paper it seems to me i have not been writing five minutes marchand in future i must have foolscap paper for my paris mail in a love letter it is possible to prove too much everything's got a moral as the duchess remarked in alice in wonderland if only you can find it pauline would perhaps have had little to fear if she could have kept him at pen's length on paper he was too much preoccupied in disentangling the intricacies of his own thoughts to be very dangerous but at close quarters her letters show that he was less inoffensive the truth is that apart from those of his own family beaumarchais does not shine in his relations with women they had spoiled him by their adulation and such men at heart are apt to hold a very poor opinion of those who exalt them he is much more attractive when he can forget that he is a lady's man and reveals his light-hearted unsophisticated and better self in this mood he is a man of the greatest charm good morning aunt i embrace you my sweet pauline your obedient servant my charming perette children love one another that is the teaching of the apostle word for word if one among you wishes her sister evil may it recoil on her own head that is the prophet's curse this part of my discourse is not intended for gentle sensitive souls like you i know and i do not think without extreme satisfaction that nature in making you all so lovable has given you that nice proportion of sensibility equity and moderation which enables you to find your happiness in living together and me to find mine in the enjoyment of such a delightful society one will love me i sometimes tell myself as her son another as her brother another as her friend and my pauline uniting all these sentiments in her dear little heart will inundate me under a deluge of affection to which i shall respond according to the capacity that the good gods have seen fit to bestow on your zealous servant your sincere friend your future plague on it what a solemn word i was about to pronounce it would have exceeded the bounds of the deep respect with which i have the honour of being mademoiselle etc the prolonged engagement was not without its perils for the inexperienced girl her aunt was a comfortable unobservant indulgent creature whose temperament quite unfitted her for the part she was called upon to fill no obstacles were placed in the way of the lovers interviews on the contrary 
and there were moments when Pauline had to remind her suitor of the respect due to his future wife a duty of which she acquitted herself with great tact and spirit but the repetition of such annoyances becomes enervating for a girl in her situation has her most dangerous enemy within the gates that she was often disquieted by his want of becoming humility is undeniable how far her defences held against his encroachments we shall soon be able to judge I am replying to you, my dear, she wrote, from this abode of peace, but with my heart and soul in an agitation which I cannot control. What a fascinating letter is yours! How sweet, and yet how dangerous! Thou wouldst give me the illusion of happiness without diminishing my calm. Dost thou think it possible? How unreasonable you men are! Have I more virtue, more strength than thou, who knowest not how to keep thyself within bounds? At all events I have no desire to seek opportunities. Why create them? I am happy in thy love. I do not want any other good thing until I am entitled to it. Why excite me uselessly? Wouldst thou wantonly give me pain? I do not ask for any sacrifices. We must wait." I quite understand thy reasons for this necessity, and I comply with them. Give me this proof of thy love, and care for my repose, and I shall cherish thee for it more dearly than ever. Can I leave thy arms without being deeply moved, without suffering bitter grief? Oughtst thou not to spare me, since thou knowest we must have patience? When I have received such proofs of thy affection— I become irritable, my gentleness becomes embittered, everything displeases me, I wait impatiently, I forget the reasons for a delay which gives me pain, I feel no longer the handsomeness of thy behavior, I feel under less obligation to thee for thy integrity in the conduct of my affairs, I become unjust, sullen, ashamed, my character deteriorates. Thou art no longer in my eyes the God whom I adore. I look upon thee only as a despoiler, trying to possess himself of something to which he has no right. A deacon, the manager of my estate, who steals my goods. In short, I will not have a violent love which torments me in this way. I do not know how agreeable an impression this might make upon me but so far I have seen it only overshadowed by a thousand sufferings. If, in the course of time, I come to see only its bright side, I shall surely owe it to my present economy. It is a capital which I invest that I may enjoy the interest. Let us not touch it. Must we not live for more than a day? I am told that my sweetheart is a good paymaster, that he is exact." I ask nothing better. Adieu, love. Adieu, my dearest. Adieu, my all. It will be a day of sunshine to me, a beautiful day when thou returnest. Adieu. Rightly speaking, there can be no virtue without temptation, or at least there is no particular merit in virtue until it has proved itself superior to temptation none need despair of a girl who could when necessary defend herself with so much wit vigour and good sense if lack of reticence in love-making was one of pauline's grievances against beaumarchais another was the ambiguity of his attentions to other women he even laid himself open to suspicion of carrying on an intrigue under her very eyes with perrette the companion who lived with her there was a violent storm which broke as storms of this kind usually do over the head of the woman who was forthwith turned out of the house her rival once out of sight pauline restored her erring lover to favour but however willing a woman may be to forgive such an injury to her self-esteem she can never forget it 
the corrosive memory of it will not fail to revive and lend rancor and suspicion to the next disagreement between the lovers nor was perrette the only woman to give her cause for jealousy the blithe pen of julie caron on more than one occasion throws light on this subject our house she writes to a friend is a perfect bedlam of lovers sweethearts who live on love and hope but i can laugh at it all more easily than the others because i am less in love yet i can conceive that to the philosophical eye it is a useful and interesting picture Beaumarchais is a regular scamp whose levity plays havoc with Pauline and worries her to death. Boisgonnier and Miron hold long-winded sentimental discussions and excite themselves in an orderly way almost to the point of a beautiful disorder. The Chevalier and I are worse still. He is fond as an angel, lively as an archangel, ardent as a seraph whilst i am gay as a lark as beautiful as cupid and as mischievous as a demon love does not make me in the least lackadaisical like the others and yet such is my folly i cannot help tasting that's the devil of it the chevalier de s referred to by julie was born in san domingo and held an appointment under the crown Beaumarchais had recently made his acquaintance and introduced him into his family circle, perhaps with an eye to Julie's future. At any rate, he was pleased to find his new friend before long paying assiduous court to his favorite sister. Such was the situation when Beaumarchais was called to Madrid. During his absence, Pauline wrote him most affectionate letters in which she sometimes upbraided him as a negligent correspondence oh when art thou coming back if thou didst but know how hateful this wretched separation is to me from time to time julie also took her poirot to task for his inattention to pauline for god's sake say something to the child she quaintly admonishes him by the time Beaumarchais returned to Paris, he had received very bad news from the West Indies. His worst fears were realized. His uncle Pichon just had time to take stock of the property, and report that Pauline's house and estate had been allowed to fall into almost irreparable ruin, so that the liabilities exceeded the assets when he died. It looked as though Beaumarchais would lose all his money. On making further inquiries, however, he was assured that by allowing the creditors to offer the estate for sale and secretly buying it in, the property was still capable, under good management, of yielding a respectable income. But at this moment Pauline, at the end of her patience, quarrelled with him, ostensibly over another of his escapades which had got to her ears taken aback by the suddenness of her attack he was for a time at a loss how to meet it in her passionate outburst she may have said something which made him think her jealousy was only an excuse and that for some other reason she had determined to break with him his shrewdness was not at fault he soon had ground to believe that the chevalier had transferred his affection from julie to his beautiful compatriot very much hurt beaumarchais immediately taxed him with unfaithfulness to julie which was bad enough but words failed him to express his indignation that the chevalier should attempt to persuade pauline after all he had done for her to leave him also in the lurch he would never have believed such turpitude possible the chevalier thought it prudent to defend himself he told beaumarchais that he who had suffered so much from calumny ought of all people to know better than listen to such idle tales he wrote not to ask forgiveness but because he owed it to himself and to mademoiselle le b that the truth should be known on a point which compromised her and also because it would be painful very painful to me to lose your esteem 
So far, so good. Beaumarchais went farther and fared worse. He wrote to Pauline for an explanation. This is her reply. Since, before receiving your letter, I was unaware of the proposal of Monsieur le Chevalier, I do not understand anything about the matter. You will perhaps allow me to make inquiries before giving you my answer. Beaumarchais next wrote to his friend, Pauline's cousin, accusing him also of making trouble, and concluded by saying that he no longer desired to marry her, but this he wished to be kept secret. The cousin replied that when his correspondent was in a state to listen to reason, he would be ashamed of having called his good faith into question, and proceeded warmly to defend both Pauline and the Chevalier. His letter is dated the 8th November, 1765, and is followed by a gap in the correspondence until the final rupture in February, 1766. By this time the Chevalier appears to have definitely supplanted Beaumarchais in the affection of the young Creole. The glamour of her highly emotional friendship for Julie had naturally disappeared, to give place outwardly to a relationship of the strictest formality, and secretly to a spiteful and vexatious rivalry. After reading the foregoing letters, no one will deny that Pauline may have had some justification for her conduct towards Beaumarchais, but she really had behaved badly to Julie. Yet, like a true daughter of Eve, she probably felt far more compunction for her treatment of Pierre Augustin, who rather deserved it, than for his sister, who did not. The truth is that most women are capable of perfect loyalty to a man, but find it less easy to be equally loyal to a woman. Among men, on the other hand, such loyalty is less common towards women than towards each other. In his mortification, Beaumarchais made a last effort to win Pauline back to him but that this thing should have happened to him of all men upset his self-confidence to such an extent that whilst trying to be conciliatory his irritation frequently got the better of his civility and even his knowledge of the world so you have renounced me he wrote to her and what time have you chosen to do it that which i had indicated to your friends and mine as the date of our union I have seen treachery taking advantage of weakness to turn even my offers of service against me. I have seen you, who have so often grieved over the injustices I have suffered, join with my enemies to accuse me of wrongs which never even entered my head. If I did not mean to marry you, should I have put so little formality into the services I have rendered you? everything i have done has been turned against me the conduct of a double-faced and perfidious friend whilst giving me a cruel lesson has taught me that no woman is so honest or so tender that she cannot be won over the contempt of all who know what he has done is his just reward but to return to you it is not without regret that i have thought of you after the first heat of my resentment had passed, and when I insisted on your formally rejecting my offer of marriage in writing, there was mingled with my vexation a vague curiosity as to whether you would really take this final step. Now, without further delay, my position must be cleared once for all. I have received a very advantageous offer of marriage, on the point of accepting, I felt myself restrained by some honourable scruple. Some thought of the past made me hesitate. I ought to have felt myself quite free, after what has passed between us. Yet I was not easy. Your letters did not tell me sufficiently clearly what I ought to know. I beg you to answer me exactly." Have you so entirely renounced me that I am free to enter into an engagement with another woman? Ask this of your heart. If you have totally severed the knot which united us, do not hesitate to let me know at once. 
in order to spare you embarrassment in answering my question i would add in writing that i have restored our relationship to what it was before these storms arose my request would be improper if i did not give you entire liberty of choice let your heart alone reply if you do not wish to give me back my liberty, tell me that you are for ever the same sweet and loving Pauline that I once knew, that you believe you will be happy in belonging to me, and I will immediately break with everybody but you. The only request I have to make is that for three days the most absolute secrecy be preserved. Leave the rest to me." in this case keep this letter the reply to which will be brought to me if your heart already belongs to another and you feel an invincible estrangement from me at least give me credit for my honourable overtures give the bearer your decision which liberates me then i shall sincerely believe i have fulfilled all my duties and shall be content adieu before Pauline could respond, Beaumarchais withdrew this letter, and the same day returned it to her with the following enclosure. I asked you for a written answer. You sent after my sister to ask her for the letter to which you promised to reply. She thought fit to withdraw and return it to me. I send it back to you, and beg you to read it attentively and to decide formally. I particularly desire that no one should come between you and me in order that I may be assured of the sincerity of your declarations. I return the parcel of your letters. If you keep them, kindly enclose mine with your answer. Reading your letters has moved me. I do not wish to renew that pain. But before replying, consider well what is to your best advantage, both as regards fortune and happiness. My intention is that, forgetting the past, we should pass our days happily and peacefully together. Do not let the fear of having to live with members of my family, who do not please you, interfere with your love for me, if another passion has not extinguished it my domestic affairs are so arranged that whether it be you or another my wife shall be the happy and undisputed mistress of my home your uncle laughed at me when i reproached him with being opposed to me he told me that in his opinion i had no reason to fear being rejected unless his niece had gone crazy it is true that, at the moment of renouncing you forever, I felt an emotion which told me I loved you more than I could have believed. What I ask you, therefore, is in absolute good faith. Do not ever deceive yourself by giving me the sorrow of seeing you the wife of a certain man. He would never dare to hold up his head in public again if he should contemplate carrying out this double treachery. Pardon me if I become heated. The very thought of it makes my blood boil. But whatever your decision may be, I cannot wait any longer. I have laid aside all my business in order once more to give myself up to you. Your uncle has pointed out to me how little this marriage would be to my advantage, but I am far from allowing such considerations to deter me. I want to be indebted for you to no one but yourself, or all is over forever. I rely on your treating this matter as strictly confidential, except for your aunt. You will understand that you would grievously offend me if it should get to my ears that you have abused my confidence. Not a soul knows that I have written to you. I confess that it would be delightful to me if, whilst all my enemies slept, peace were concluded between us. Read your letters over again, and you will understand whether I have found again in my heart the love to which they gave birth. If in her former letter Pauline had failed to make her meaning clear to her deserted lover, no such objection could be made to her reply. I can only repeat, sir, what I told your sister, that my mind is made up irrevocably. 
so i thank you for your offer and desire with all my heart that you will marry somebody who will make you happy i shall hear of it with great pleasure as i shall of every good fortune which happens to you i assured your sister as much my aunt and i must tell you how vexed we are at your disrespectful treatment on our account of a man whom we regard as our friend i know better than anybody how wrong it is of you to say he is treacherous i told your sister only this morning that a young lady who used to live with my aunt was the cause of all that has happened to-day and that since then it was only the fear of publicity which held me back you have still several letters of mine among them two written at that time another written from fontainebleau and a few others which i shall be glad if you will be good enough to return to me as i have already told you i will ask one of our san domingo friends to call upon you to conclude everything which is outstanding between us i am sir your very humble and most obedient servant le b pauline may not be quite candid but at least she is perfectly clear she no longer loved him and she gave as the reason of her change of heart an alleged infidelity which was supposed to have been forgiven and forgotten months before pauline's cousin now wrote to beaumarchais regretting the rupture and offering the time-honoured consolations appropriate to the kind of misfortune which had befallen him as the worthy man says with more truth than originality man proposes but god disposes he concluded by requesting his friend in the name of the ladies to hand over to him all the papers relative to the affairs of mademoiselle le b the letter is dated february eleventh seventeen sixty six a few months later beaumarchais had the humiliation of seeing the chevalier de s lead pauline to the altar the poetry of the deserted lover at once gave place to the prose of the anxious creditor he drew up and submitted a detailed and business-like statement of the money owing to him by pauline and her aunt and in reply the chevalier being on his honeymoon deputed his brother a pettifogging and peppery abbe to call upon beaumarchais and thresh the matter out with him the abbe de s conducted the negotiations with great vivacity and little consideration wrangling over every item of the memorandum after several stormy interviews and the interchange of many caustic letters beaumarchais wrote as follows monsieur l'abbe i beg you to note that i have never failed in civility towards you personally and that i owe nothing but contempt to him whom you represent as i have had the honour of telling you twenty times over and as i should very much like to tell him to his face if he had been as prompt in showing himself as he was in stepping into my shoes the proof that mademoiselle le b had need of me of my affection my counsels my money is that if it had not been for your brother who disturbed the union of six years standing she would still be making use of my faculties which i have lavished upon her so long as they were agreeable and useful to her it is true that she has bought my services very dearly since she owes to our affection for your brother the happiness of having married him which she would never have done had he remained in the place where he was vegetating when i found and introduced him into my family i do not understand the hidden meaning of the phrase in the apology so it would be useless to attempt to reply to it i shall not discontinue to meet calumny and injustice by doing all the good i can i have always liked to do good though expecting nothing but evil in return so your advice adds nothing to my disposition in this respect as you admit deviating from what is becoming to your character in your dealings with me i have no wish to reproach you for it it is enough that you yourself confess it for me to bear no ill-will 
I do not know why you have underlined the words your sister when reminding me that I said it was thus that I loved Mademoiselle Le B. Does this irony fall on her, on me, or on your brother? However, this is just as you please. Although the fate of Mademoiselle Le B. has no longer anything to do with me, I have no desire to speak of her in other terms than those I have used. It is not of her that I complain. She is, as you say, young and inexperienced, and although she has very little fortune, your brother has made good use of his experience in marrying her, and has done very well for himself. Consider one other point, Monsieur l'Abbé. Whatever I have said of him is meant in no way to reflect on you. It would be too humiliating for a man of your profession to be suspected of having had anything to do with your brother's behavior towards me. Let him bear the blame himself, and do not attempt to excuse things unworthy of an apologist as upright as yourself." In the end, Beaumarchais considerably reduced his claim, and Pauline accepted the revised memorandum. A year after the marriage, her husband died, and no attempt had been made to pay off the debt. Speaking of Beaumarchais in a letter to her cousin, written in 1769, she says, "'He need not worry himself. He shall be paid.' And there the matter ended." Beaumarchais pressed her no further, and a love affair which was to have been eternal ended in an exceedingly businesslike statement of account amounting to 24,441 livres, four sous, four deniers, which was never settled. End of chapter 7《ラフレコーディング》Chapter Eight of Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Figaro, the Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter Eight: Beaumarchais and His Early Plays. In all that he did, Beaumarchais was one of those innovating men whom less enterprising people regard with fear and bewilderment. When at thirty-five he turned his attention to the theatre, it was to support and develop the daring theories recently enunciated by Diderot and illustrated by his turgid and indigestible drama Le Père de Famille, which, however, marked a revolution in writings for the stage. Beaumarchais practised the theory with more precision and clearness than the master himself, adding many features of his own, and in some respects carrying it much farther than Diderot would have been prepared to go. "'Ah, my dear Beaumarchais!' exclaimed the great journalist on reading the play. "'Into what a hornet's nest have you thrust your head?' This result was inevitable, for they were the first masters deliberately to use the theatre as an instrument for propaganda. In introducing his new play, Beaumarchais was one of the first to use the word drama for a dramatic composition. Anticipating Mr. Bernard Shaw, whose genius resembles his in more than one particular, Beaumarchais prefaced his play by a reasoned discourse on his views of dramatic art, which is not less interesting than the piece itself. The drama, he wrote, holds an intermediate position between the heroic tragedy and the amusing comedy. It should be written in prose, and must confine itself to painting situations drawn from everyday life the dialogue must be as simple and natural as it is possible to make it its true eloquence is that of situations and the only colour permitted is the animated vigorous direct undisciplined and authentic language of the passions beaumarchais thought very little of the heroic manner like huckleberry finn he took no stock in dead people he even uses the word classical in an ironical sense, and as a synonym for barbarous. 
he will not admit that heroes and kings have any right to figure in the serious drama. They excite no real interest in us, he said. Their fortunes, being exceptional, do not touch our hearts. It is only our vanity which is tickled by being initiated into the secrets of a magnificent court. What really interests the spectator is a misfortune which might happen to him, that is to say a merchant filing his petition in bankruptcy is more dramatic than a fallen king or a warrior who has just lost a battle what he exclaimed are the revolutions of athens and rome to me the peaceful subject of a monarchical state in the eighteenth century why does the narrative of the earthquake which engulfed lima and its inhabitants three thousand leagues away move me profoundly whilst the judicial murder of charles i in england only makes me angry it is because the volcano which burst into eruption in peru might shake paris and bury me under the ruins and perhaps threatens me at this very moment whilst we need never fear anything quite like the unheard-of misfortune of the king of england the only thing which this proves is that in seventeen sixty seven beaumarchais was no prophet in writing his play he spared no effort to be true to nature if i am blamed for having written this drama too simply i confess that i have no excuse to offer again and again i have substituted an artless phrase for a more laboured one in the first draft but how difficult it is to be simple eugenie like all the plays of beaumarchais is distinguished by a thinly veiled attack on class privileges and various abuses of his time the plot turns on a mock marriage in which the heroine's brother comes to avenge his sister's betrayal or compel her false lover to marry her, and was obviously suggested by the author's adventure with Clavijo. The scene is laid in London, being changed from Paris almost at the last moment, partly on the suggestion of the Duc de Nivernais, and partly in anticipation of difficulties with the censor. As a play, it is not as convincing as it might be, and is as melodramatic a piece as ever faced the footlights nevertheless in spite of its faults it is not without merit the improbability of the plot being admitted it is developed with considerable ingenuity and moves easily and rapidly to its climax the first three acts especially show that beaumarchais already possessed a certain mastery in dialogue and theatrical presentation the characters are well accentuated and the heroine drawn with some emotional power has an engaging charm and quiet dignity worthy of a less equivocal setting a novelty introduced to give realism to his play was to dispense with a drop scene at the end of each act, and to fill in the intervals by the coming and going of servants preparing meals, lighting the candles, or rearranging the furniture, and so on. The author's stage directions are set down with great particularity, the position of each actor being clearly indicated in every scene, and his costume described to the smallest detail. His next care was to do all in his power to ensure a favorable reception for the play. He was an early master of the art of self-advertisement, and he believed in leaving nothing to chance. To the general public he was known only as a prosperous financier, and a man of pleasure who had made some way at court. His less fortunate fellow-dramatists bitterly resented his intrusion, and were not above plotting the downfall of the drama. It is unprecedented, wrote Collet in his journal, that the public should so generally vent its fury on an author i speak only of his person not of his piece the new writer discovered in fact that a work of art like a human being is conceived in joy moulded silently amid fears and anxieties pains and discomforts brought forth with difficulty and often with grave danger 
and frequently lives just long enough to involve its fond parent in endless perplexities and annoyances. Beaumarchais countered the intrigues of his envious rivals by endeavouring to secure the benevolent interest of his aristocratic friends. To this end he wrote to Mesdames the Duc d'Orléans, the Duc de Noailles, and his daughter the Comtesse de Tessé, each letter adroitly turned to suit the person to whom it was addressed. Lastly, he submitted his first draft to the Duc de Nivernay, a member of the Academy, and a man of considerable importance in the literary world, begging him to give it the benefit of his criticism. After retaining the manuscript for two days, the Duke returned it with several pages of urbane and extremely judicious comments, most of which Beaumarchais promptly turned to account. The duke vigorously protested against the improbability of the plot, and suggested many emendations. But as these would have meant recasting the whole play, Beaumarchais tried to meet his objections by transferring the scenes from France to England. The noble critic also confessed to finding the false lover entirely unconvincing. He could not conceive how such an utter scoundrel, without conscience and without remorse, after deceiving his victim to the last, should yet find grace in her eyes even when she had discovered his crime. He was no believer in eleventh-hour conversions. Although Beaumarchais, in accordance with the Duke's strictures, greatly modified this character— the baseness of the lover remains the weak point of the play. Apart from structural criticisms, the Duke offered many suggestions on the writer's style. In the original manuscript, for instance, when the irascible baron learns the truth as to Eugenie's betrayal, his sister, in rebuking him for his anger, is made to say, "'Courage, wild men, homme de bois, do not spare thy daughter,' Be quick, take a knife and plunge it into her heart. What if we take away this knife? suavely asked the duke. If I were you, I would also cut out the wild man, who is a kind of monkey, hardly suitable for use as a form of address. Beaumarchais wisely accepted both emendations and recast the whole scene greatly to its advantage. The first performance of Eugenie took place on the 29th January, 1767, not on the 25th June, as stated in most editions of the author's works. The piece had a very cold reception. But all is for the best to those who know how to profit by everything that befalls them. Neither as a man nor as a writer was Beaumarchais to be beaten at the first skirmish. He carefully noted the remarks of the audience, and profited by the hints they let fall, sought the advice of the players and of his friend Poissinet, and abridged and rewrote large portions of the play, especially in the two last acts which had changed the success of the first three into a rout. His alterations were to such good purpose that, two days later, on its second representation, the audience ceased to hiss. They wept or snivelled, as Collet unkindly observed. "'It is all the fault of the women,' cried the rival dramatist indignantly. "'They can talk of nothing but Eugenie. They have infected our gilded youth with their own silly fancies.' As some people have a natural gift for appreciation, so others have an aptitude for disparagement. Collet belonged to the latter, and, on the whole, far less intelligent school, for like the blackbird in Chanticleer, son oeil n'est jamais ébloui. Il a devant la fleur dont il voit trop la tige, le regard qui restreint et le mot qui mitige. Possibly he may have been smarting under his failure of the previous year to place his admirable comedy La Partie de Chasse de Henri IV, which was destined eight years later to achieve a great and lasting success at the Théâtre Français. Other critics, however, were far less severe. 
Voltaire, in a letter to D'Argental, says, I have read Eugénie with great interest to see how it is possible for such a hasty man to make everybody weep. Eugénie, played for the first time on the twenty-ninth January of this year, wrote Fréron in his Année littéraire, was rather badly received by the public, and indeed looked like an utter failure. But after numerous curtailments and corrections, it has since achieved a brilliant revival, and has for a long time held the public. This success does our players great credit. Speaking of the author, the June number of the Mercure de France observed, He is one of those happy beings, born under a lucky star, whom we sometimes meet in this world, on whom criticism has occasionally to exercise itself with severity, but who possess the secret of always charming us back to them. The distinguished acting of Mademoiselle Doligny in the title role largely contributed to the ultimate success of the piece which had made such an inauspicious beginning beaumarchais had presented his drama entirely free of author's rights to the players of the comedie francaise it had been performed seven times when its run was interrupted by the sudden illness of prévy the leading actor and another seven times upon his return this was considered not a bad record at that period on the tenth april seventeen sixty nine garrick wrote advising beaumarchais that he had adapted eugenie under the title of the school for rakes and played it with great applause at drury lane the drama was revived at the comedie francaise for the last time in august eighteen sixty three but failed to hold the audience and after four representations was withdrawn if his spanish adventure suggested to beaumarchais the plot of his first play his relations with the beautiful creole were largely responsible for all the best scenes in his second indeed he went so far as to give his heroine the name of pauline his taste was always uncertain the new piece was called the two friends and was described as by a man who has none just as the fantastic ideas of diderot on pictorial art had exerted a baneful influence over the work of Greuze, so now his equally far-fetched notions on dramatic art for a time led astray the comic genius of beaumarchais following the master's dictum that social conditions rather than the interplay of character should form the chief interest in writing for the theatre beaumarchais did his best to thrill a comedie francaise audience with a highly improbable story of the vicissitudes of the lyon silk trade the two friends of the title lived together in a country house in the centre of the silk farming industry and one of them hearing that the other unknown to himself is threatened with bankruptcy diverts the funds of the business of which he is the manager and until the end of the play allows himself to be looked upon as a thief in a hopeless attempt to postpone the inevitable revelation of the truth all comes right in the end but there is no good reason why the situation should not have been cleared up at the close of the first act except of course the author's determination to spread his drama over five acts it was in vain that beaumarchais expended all his skill in portraying the charming love story of pauline and young melac nothing could redeem from the dramatic point of view the essential dullness of the subject around which the author had unwisely chosen to write his play the two friends was staged for the first time on the thirteenth january seventeen seventy and after being played ten times to steadily dwindling audiences was withdrawn never to make its appearance in paris again the public was clearly of voltaire's opinion that every kind of play is good except the dull kind its failures were greeted with much satisfaction by its author's enemies and rivals 
but the critic who described him as a sombre peevish dismal character incapable of producing anything with any gaiety or liveliness in it had mistaken his vocation at its first performance a wag in the pit cried this is a real bankruptcy bang go my twenty sous a few days later whilst the play was still running beaumarchais met sophie arnaud who was then singing in the unsuccessful opera zoroaster in a week's time he said you will have no audience or next to none your friends will send us some she laughingly replied the final blow was given in an anonymous quatrain quoted by Grimm. J'ai vu de bon marché le drame ridicule, et je vais en un mot vous dire ce que c'est. C'est un change où l'argent circule sans produire aucun intérêt. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine》of Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Zunzel. Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter Nine: Madame Levesque and the Second Marriage of Beaumarchais. Among the most intimate friends of Julie Caron was Madame Buffo, a famous Parisian beauty and the wife of a retired silk merchant, now receiver general of customs and tolls of the city. One day towards the end of the Pauline episode, this lady called on Julie and inquired after her brother, whom she said she had not seen for a long time. I do not know whether he is in his study. I believe he is at work on a play. I want particularly to speak to him, said the visitor. Beaumarchais was sent for and soon made his appearance in neglected attire, unshaven, with ruffled hair and preoccupied look. Ah, my dear fellow, what are you so busy about when an amiable woman, recently widowed and already much sought after, might give you the preference? I am going to take her tomorrow to the lonely part of the Champs Elysees, known as the Widow's Drive. Take your horse for a run and meet us as if by chance. You can accost me, and you will be able to see how you suit each other. The next day, Beaumarchais ordered his finest horse to be saddled, and followed by his mounted servant, rode to the appointed meeting place. He noticed the carriage in which the two ladies were driving some time before joining them. At last, Madame Buffo pointed out the superb rider to her companion said that she knew him, and asked if she might introduce him. Beaumarchais soon found himself seated in the carriage with the ladies, whilst his servant was ordered to return home with the mounts. His new acquaintance was Genevieve Madeleine Watteblet, widow of Antoine Angelique Levesque, garde générale des menus plaisirs, who had died on the 21st December 1767, leaving her a handsome fortune. The daughter of Philippe Watteblet, cabinet maker to the king she was born on the eleventh november seventeen thirty one and was therefore three months older not three years younger than beaumarchais as the gallantry of his biographers has led them to assert madame l'eveque is reputed to have been a most attractive woman the widow and the widower were so delighted with each other's society that it was decided to spend the rest of the day together Beaumarchais proposing that the ladies should dine with him at his house. Madame Buffo had little difficulty in persuading her friend to accept the invitation, for she was already fascinated by his brilliant talk and distinguished bearing, and was naturally curious to know something about his home. It was there, as we have seen, that Pierre Augustin was at his best. The sight of him in this elegant and well-appointed house, with his genial and courtly father and his brilliant sister, and the old family servants completed her captivation. Beaumarchais pressed his advantage with ardor and expedition, but Madame Levesque was a woman of the world, nor was she ignorant of her lover's reputation as a gay Lothario. Before consenting to marry him, she is said to have addressed him in these words. Monsieur de Beaumarchais, 
I am a widow. I am aware of how little importance most men attach to the vows they utter at the altar. I feel how difficult it is not to love you. I know how devoted you are to women, but you are a man of honor. Promise me, and I will believe you, that you will never abandon me, that you will never leave me alone to become the prey of suspicion and jealousy. Beaumarchais promised, and what is more, appears to have kept his word. They were married at the church of saint Eustache on the 11th April, 1768, and on the 11th December following, their son was baptized at Saint-Sulpice under the name of Augustin. His wife's fortune enabled Beaumarchais once more to take up the thread of affairs, and with a few months of his marriage, in cooperation with Paris du Vernet, he purchased from the state a great part of the forest of Chinon, and was soon busy with a large staff cutting and selling wood. In a letter to his wife dated the 15th July, 1769, from Rivarenne in Touraine, he writes, Thou askest me to write to thee often, my dearest, and I do so with all my heart. It is a pleasant relaxation from my heavy work in the village, to conciliate the rivalries of the managers, to listen to the grievances and claims of the clerks, to check accounts for more than 100,000 crowns, in small amounts from twenty to thirty souls, owing to the irregularities of the head cashier whom it is necessary to relieve of his post, the various wharves to visit, to supervise and examine the work of two hundred laborers felling trees in the forest, to arrange for the sawing and transport of two hundred eighty-four acres of cut timber, to construct new roads from the forest to the river and to repair the old ones, to stack 150 or 250 tons of hay, to provide oats for 30 cart horses, to buy 30 more horses for six more wagons, to transport our hull timber before winter sets in, to build wharves and locks on the river and where the timber can be loaded in 50 boats waiting to carry it to Tours, Saumur, Angers, and Nantes to sign agreements with six or seven farms to supply provisions for a household of thirty persons, to draw up and adjust estimates of income and expenditure for two years. There, my dear wife, you have in brief the sum of my labors, of which a part is already accomplished, and the rest in a fair way towards completion. As thou sayest, dearest, we do not sleep here so long as at Pantin, but this strenuous labor does not displease me. Since, reaching this retreat, inaccessible to vanity, I have met only simple unmannered folk, such as I myself often desired to be. I live in my offices, a little farm, wedged between a poultry yard and a kitchen garden, encircled by a thick hedge. The walls of my room are whitewashed, and the furniture consists of a wretched bed in which I sleep like a top, four rush-bottomed chairs, an oak table, a great chimney-piece without facing or shelf. But I see from my window, whilst writing to thee, all the meadows and warrens of the valley in which I am living, full of robust and tanned men who cut and cart forage in wagons drawn by oxen, a multitude of women and girls with rakes on their shoulders or in their hands, singing the songs of the countryside with clear voices as they work. Through the trees in the distance, I see the winding course of the Andre, and an ancient turreted castle belonging to my neighbor, Madame de Rancay. All is crowned by the heads of tufted trees, which reach out in perspective to the very summit of the hills, which surround us and form a huge frame, marking the horizon on every side. This picture is not without charm. Good coarse bread, a more than modest diet, and execrable wine for my repasts. Truly, if I dared wish thee the ill to lack everything in a forlorn land, I should much regret not having thee at my side. Adieu, my love. If you think my description may interest our good relatives and friends, thou art at liberty to read it to them one evening. Embrace them all for me into the bargain, and good night. I am going to bed, but without thee. That seems often very hard to me. And my son, how is he? 
I laugh to myself when I think that I am working for him. After three years of happy married life, Madame de Beaumarchais fell into a decline. Her husband at once called in two of the most famous doctors of the time, Tronchin and Laurie. But in spite of all of their skill and his own unremitting care, she died on the 21st November 1770, leaving him at 38, a widower for the second time. His enemies soon revived the terrible rumors which had arisen on the sudden death of his first wife, but as in that case, he was able to prove that his second wife's fortune consisted almost entirely of an annuity, so he had everything to lose by her death. When, two years later, her son, Augustin, followed his mother to the grave, the father's adversaries did not accuse him of poisoning his child also. Even they drew the line somewhere. End of chapter 9「The intimate business and friendly relationship which for the past ten years had existed between Beaumarchais and Paris du Verny had recently resulted, as we've seen, in the purchase by the associates of the forest of Chinon, and had necessitated the advancement of large sums of money on both sides, yet the extent of their mutual engagements had never been formally delimited, in view of Duverny's great age and failing health, and the probability of unpleasantness on the part of his heir. Beaumarchais pressed upon him the desirability of drawing up a formal and detailed statement of their commitments to each other, the old man, who trusted his partner implicitly for long, failed to see the necessity of such a document, but at length, yielding to the constant representations of his friend, signed a deed in duplicate by which Beaumarchais restored to him 160,000 francs worth of promissory notes and consented to the cancelling of the agreement respecting the forest of Chinon. On his side, Duverny declared Beaumarchais free of financial obligation towards him, and further acknowledged a debt of 15,000 francs payable at any time agreeable to his partner, and lastly, undertook to lend him the sum of 75,000 francs for eight years without interest. What particular services Beaumarchais had rendered for this last generous accommodation we do not know. This document, dated the 1st April 1770, is on a folio sheet in the handwriting of Beaumarchais throughout, bearing his signature on the right at the bottom of the third page, and that of Duverny with the date on the left. The transaction was kept secret from the prospective heir, as he did not approve of the relations with Beaumarchais, and kept the old man virtually a prisoner in his own house. On the 17th of July, 1770, before the last two clauses of the agreement could be carried out, Paris Duverny died, at 87 years of age, leaving his entire fortune of about a million and a half francs to his grand-nephew, the Comte de la Blache who through his influence had recently been made brigadier-general. Unfortunately for Beaumarchais, the Comte could not bear him, and was known to have said in society, I hate that man just as a lover loves his mistress. There were, doubtless, several reasons for this dislike, quite apart from a natural antipathy. When Beaumarchais had power, he liked to use it, and success tended to make him arrogant with his rivals. Then, rightly or wrongly, he had acquired a rather doubtful financial reputation among a large circle of people, without anybody being able to point to any definitely dishonest transaction in his career, though we take it they might easily have found a good deal of indelicacy. The Count, therefore, viewed with jealousy and suspicion this man, who had so much to say in his uncle's affairs. Moreover, Beaumarchais was the intimate friend of Paris de Maisieux, a nephew of Duvernis who, for some obscure reason, had been entirely overlooked by his uncle, though a nearer relative than La Blache, and in spite of the fact that the success of the foundation of the military college was largely owing to his loyal help. La Blache knew that Beaumarchais had more than once protested against his uncle's injustice to this nephew. When Beaumarchais heard of Duverny's death, he presented his statement of the transactions between them, and in an extremely conciliatory letter addressed to La Blache, 
requested that the agreement might be carried out. In his curt and almost illiterate reply, the Count said that he failed to recognize his uncle's signature and implied that the document was false. Beaumarchais at once challenged him to bring an action against him for forgery. Without daring to take this course, Lablache appealed to the courts for the annulment of the deed and claimed that so far from his owing Beaumarchais 15,000 francs, the latter was actually a debtor to his uncle's estate to the amount of 139,000 francs. Taking advantage of the defects of the law and his own high social position, he pleaded in such a way that unless his opponent won the case, he would, in the opinion of the world, stand convicted of forgery. As the Prince de Conti said, Beaumarchais must either be paid, payé, or hanged, pendu, to which Pierre Augustin characteristically replied, With all my heart, but if I win my case, ought not my adversary as cordially to pay a little in his person? That precisely is the weak point in the Count's armour, and any sympathy we may have had with his not unnatural resentment against Beaumarchais is discounted by the disloyal and cowardly way in which he fought his action. In October 1771, after more than fifteen months of legal quibbling and, of course, ruinous expenses, the courts pronounced in favour of Beaumarchais. On the 22nd February following, the case was dismissed, and on the 14th March an order was made to execute the deed. The Count now appealed to the Grand Chamber against this sentence. His decision left Beaumarchais perfectly calm and confident, as indeed he had every reason to be, for even to the most prejudiced mind it must have appeared very improbable that, rich as he then was, both in his own right and in the fortune of his wealthy wife who was still alive, he should be so foolish as to risk utter ruin and even his life itself by forging a document in the hope of extracting fifteen thousand francs from Duvernay's heir. Moreover, he was occupied with other things, and especially with the preparation of the Barber of Seville, which he had for some months past been writing by way of relaxation. I love the theatre, he declared at this time to Goudin, to the verge of folly. I again ardently took up the idea, which had become almost extinguished since I had several times abandoned it, of devoting myself entirely to the drama. The play, in its earlier form of vaudeville, had already been performed privately at the house of his friend, Le Normand d'Etoile. The official permission to produce the comedy at the Théâtre Français was signed by Monsieur de Sartine on the 13th February, 1773, and Beaumarchais at once threw himself enthusiastically into the rehearsals, with a view to its presentation during the approaching carnival. All was going well, when with dramatic suddenness he became involved in a strange and tragicomical adventure, which still further complicated his affairs, indefinitely delayed the production of his play, and helped not a little in the loss of his case which was still pending. End of section 10. Read by Sandra. Montreal, 2022. Chapter 11 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 11 Beaumarchais, the Mad Duke, and the Demi Mondaine. In June 1770, Mademoiselle Menard, a young and pretty singer, made her first appearance at the Comédie Italienne as an understudy to Madame La Ruette. She greatly pleased the general public, especially in the part of Louise in Sedaine's Désertard, and won the enthusiastic praise of many well known authors, poets, and musicians. Her singing and acting, however, were very unequal, and the opinion of connoisseurs was a good deal divided as to her merits. Moreover, she failed to find the key to the good graces of the Lord Chamberlain, the Duc de Richelieu, who evidently thought, quote, he knew better than the public themselves what would give them pleasure for their money, end quote, and he obstinately refused to allow her to be received into the state theatre on trial. Mademoiselle Ménard was a fresh and piquant little actress with a moderately good voice, which had been badly trained, and was scarcely worthy of her natural acting and fine elocution. In appearance she was a fine girl, rather than an elegant woman, and the beauty of her arms was greatly extolled by experts. 
even Grimm and La Harpe, who have both some rather unkind things to say of her person and ability, agree that she ought to have been received. It was said that she was once a flower girl, but being ambitious she bought a copy of Restaud's grammar and set herself to study the French language and pronunciation, and after a hard struggle secured an engagement for a minor part in a Parisian theatre. During her first performances she called on every artist and writer of repute to ask his advice, and flattered him by following it with zeal and docility. At the period we have now reached in this narrative, the Duc de Chaune was the protector of her charms, and had just commissioned Greuze to paint her portrait, so that, as Grimm says, quote, if we do not succeed in keeping her on the stage, we shall at least have an opportunity of seeing her at the next salon, end quote. The protection of the Duc de Chaune, having placed an insurmountable obstacle in the way of her being protected by the Duc de Richelieu, who was an egoist in love, Mademoiselle Menard found herself compelled to renounce her career as an actress, so she set up a salon which was attended by Marmontel, Sedaine, Gretry, Rulliard, Chamfort, Suard, and many noblemen introduced by the Duc, who was proud of his conquest. The Duc de Chaune was the last representative of the younger branch of the House of Lune. He was thirty years old and was already famous for the eccentricity and violence of his character. He had a powerful but undisciplined mind, much wit but no judgment, pride without dignity. Eager in the pursuit of knowledge, he was yet more ardent in the pursuit of pleasure. Of prodigious bodily strength, his reason was frequently overclouded by fits of uncontrollable passion, during which he conducted himself, quote, like a drunken savage, not to say a ferocious beast, end quote. These outbursts had often got him into trouble with the authorities, and he had recently been banished from the kingdom for five years. He spent his exile in the study of chemistry, in which he had made several discoveries, and in a scientific expedition to Egypt, where he had lived among the Bedouin. He had brought back from his travels many natural history specimens and an ape, whose existence he delighted to make a burden to him. Such was the man into whose hands Mademoiselle Menard had committed her life and happiness. His jealousy, unfaithfulness, and brutality had already extinguished whatever affection she may have had for him, and fear alone prevented her from leaving him, when the Duke suddenly developed an intimate friendship with Beaumarchais, and straightway had the temerity to introduce him to his mistress. Under the assiduous attentions of the newcomer, Mademoiselle Menard soon began to draw comparisons, and the Duke to make deductions. His friendship gave place to furious jealousy. In her terror, Mademoiselle begged Beaumarchais to discontinue his visits, but the Duke's conduct went from bad to worse, and at last in her despair she sought refuge in a convent. After some weeks of absence, she returned to her house and invited Beaumarchais to come and see her again. Before accepting her invitation, Beaumarchais thought it proper to write to her protector as follows. Quote, Monsieur le Duc, Madame Menard advises me that she has returned to her house and invites me, among her other friends, to visit her whenever I care to do so. I considered that the reason which caused her to fly had ceased. She gives me to understand that she is free, and I offer you both my sincere congratulations. So, the force of circumstances has accomplished what my representations failed to do. You have ceased to torment her. I am delighted for both your sakes. I had almost said for the sake of all three of us, if I had not resolved to set myself aside entirely in everything concerning the interests of this unhappy woman. I know what pecuniary efforts you have made to get her again into your power, and with what nobility she has crowned the disinterestedness of six years by returning to Monsieur de jean -Lis the money you had borrowed from him to offer to her. What upright heart would not warm towards her for such conduct? As for me, whose offers of service she has constantly refused, I consider myself honoured, if not in the eyes of the world, at least in my own, that she should number me among the most devoted of her friends. Ah, Monsieur le Duc, such generous hearts are not kept by threats, blows, or money. Pardon me if I venture on such reflections— they are not unnecessary to the end I have in view in writing to you. In speaking to you of Madame Menard, I forget my personal grievances. I forget that after having warned you in every way, after seeing myself embraced and made much of by you, both at your house and mine, on account of the sacrifices which my attachment to you alone led me to make, footnote, Beaumarchais had lent him a considerable amount of money. 
and footnote, that after you had complained to me of her in the most injurious terms, you suddenly and without any occasion changed your tone and conduct and told her things a hundred times worse about me. I also pass over in silence the horrible scene you made before her, disgusting between two men, in which you so far forgot yourself as to reproach me with being the son of a watchmaker, I, who honour my parents even before those who believe they have the right to outrage their own. You must feel, Monsieur le Duc, the advantage which our respective positions gave me at that moment over you, and if it were not for the unmerited anger which has led you astray ever since, you would certainly give me credit for the moderation with which I rebutted the insults of him, whom I have always honoured and loved with all my heart, but if even my respect for you cannot make me go so far as to fear any man, it is that I happen to be built that way. Is that a reason for bearing a grudge against me? On the contrary, ought not my consideration for you in every respect to have in your eyes the full price which my firmness gives it? I said to myself, some day he will be ashamed of the wrongs he's heaped upon me. Do what you will, you have no more succeeded in having a really bad opinion of me than inspiring your friend with it. In her own interest she asked me not to see her, as no man is dishonoured by obeying a woman. I have neither seen nor had any direct communication with her for two months. Now once more she permits me to take my place among her friends. If during this time you have not recovered the advantages which your neglect and violence caused you to lose, you must see that the means you employed were not the right ones. Ah, believe me, Monsieur le Duc, abandon a mistaken course which has already caused you so many vexations. I have never sought to diminish the tenderness which this generous woman has bestowed upon you. She would have despised me if I had attempted it. The only enemy you've had with her is yourself. The wrong which your late violence did you points out the way to replace yourself at the head of her true friends. Instead of the hellish life that we led her, let us all join together to procure her a quiet and happy existence. Remember, all I have had the honour of saying to you on this subject, and because of it, Restore your friendship to him whom you cannot deprive of your esteem. If this letter does not open your eyes, I shall at least feel that I have accomplished all my duties towards the friend whom I have not offended, whose outrages I have forgotten, and to whom I come for the last time, vowing that should this step prove useless, I shall bear myself toward you with the coldness, hardness, and firmness becoming to a nobleman in whose character one has been very badly mistaken. End quote. The Duke left this letter unanswered and Beaumarchais renewed his visits to Madame Moiselle Menard. For some weeks, nothing unusual happened, but on Thursday, 11th February, 1773, at eleven o'clock in the morning, Paul-Philippe Goudin, the inseparable friend of Beaumarchais, called to pay his respects to Mademoiselle. There were present in her room a woman companion, the chambermaid, and Mademoiselle Menard's little daughter by the Duc de Chaune. After gently reproaching the visitor for not having been to see her for so long, she invited him to take a chair at her bedside, and suddenly burst into tears, bitterly complaining of her sufferings to the Duke's brutality. At this moment he entered the room. Goudin rose, bowed, and gave up his chair. "'I'm crying,' she sobbed, "'because I'm unhappy, and I beg Monsieur Goudin to ask Monsieur de Montmarchais to refute the ridiculous charges made against him.' "'What is the use,' retorted the Duke, "'of a rascal like Beaumarchais attempting to justify himself?' "'He's not a rascal,' she flashed. He is a man of honour. The duke trembled with rage. Ah, he cried, you're in love with him and are determined to humiliate me. I declare to you that I am going to fight him. He looked like a madman and terrified all present. Mademoiselle Menard sprang out of bed and with Goudin's assistance tried to detain him, but easily shaken them off, the duke dashed downstairs and out of the house. Leaving by another door, Goudin ran to warn Beaumarchais. As he reached the Rue Dauphine, he met him in his carriage. Goudin seized the reins and stopped the horses. Beaumarchais looked out of the window to see what had happened. "'The Duke is looking for you to kill you,' cried Goudin. "'Is that so?' coolly answered Beaumarchais. "'Well, the only thing he's likely to kill is the flea he has in his ear.' Thereupon, to the dismay of his friend, he drove off to carry out his duties as lieutenant général des chasses au bailliage et capitainerie de la Varenne du Louvre. Goudin turned towards home. As he reached the steps of the Pont Neuf, he felt himself pulled violently backwards by his coat-tail and fell heavily into the arms of the Duc de Chaune, 
who, in spite of his resistance, carried him off like a bird of prey and flung him into a hackney carriage which was waiting for him, shouting to the coachman to drive with all speed to the Rue de Condé. "'What right have you,' cried the indignant Goudin, "'who are always talking about liberty, to violate mine?' "'The right of the stronger. "'Either you will find Beaumarchais for me, or, Monsieur le Duc, I am unarmed. "'You surely do not intend to murder me?' "'No, I am going to kill only this fellow Beaumarchais, "'and when I have plunged my sword into his body and torn his heart out with my teeth, "'the Menard woman can go to the devil in her own way.' I do not know where Monsieur de Beaumarchais is, replied Goudin, and even if I did know, I certainly would not tell you in your present state of mind. If you dare to resist me, I will box your ears, shouted his pleasant companion. I warn you, Monsieur le Duc, that I shall return the blow. What? You will box my ears? yelled the nobleman, and flinging himself on the unfortunate Goudin, he tore his hair and snatched off his wig, which he brandished aloft to the delight of the passers-by. He then seized him by the throat and badly scratched his neck, ear, and chin. Goudin shouted for the guard. The duke became calmer, and Goudin declared that if Beaumarchais was not at home, he would go immediately to the commissary of police and lodge a complaint against his persecutor. Knowing that Beaumarchais was absent, and thinking that his servants would be secure not to reveal his whereabouts when they saw the duke's excited condition, Goudin slipped out of the carriage directly the duke had left it to knock at his rival's door. Taking a roundabout way in case of pursuit, he hurried home. But Goudin had reckoned without the prestige of a peer of France, and the house servants had not dared to conceal from the duke where their master was to be found. The nobleman rushed off to the court where Beaumarchais, in gorgeous raiment, was sitting in judgment on minor offenders against the game laws. Ignoring the ushers and attendants, he pushed his way straight to his man and demanded that he should instantly come outside to him. I cannot do that, answered Beaumarchais. The public service compels me to carry through my duties in becoming manner, and he politely begged the duke to take a seat until after the audience. But the nobleman insisted, and Beaumarchais, fearing lest those present should guess what was the matter, suspended the sitting for a few minutes, whilst he invited his adversary to join him in another room. There the duke told him in the foulest language that he was determined to kill him on the spot, to tear out his heart and drink his blood, for he was thirsty. "'Oh, if that's all, Monsieur le Duc,' replied the imperturbable Beaumarchais, "'you must allow business to come before pleasure,' and he moved towards the door to return to the court. The Duke stopped him and threatened to tear his eyes out before the whole assembly if he left the room without him. "'You would only ruin yourself, Monsieur le Duc, if you should be so mad as to attempt it.' Beaumarchais calmly resumed his presidential chair, and the audience continued for fully two hours, whilst the duke strode noisily to and fro, muttering imprecations, and from time to time interrupting the proceedings to demand, How much longer are you going to be? At last he drew his rival's deputy, the Comte de Marcouville, aside, and told him that he was waiting to fight Beaumarchais. When the court rose, Beaumarchais went upstairs to change his clothes, and rejoining the duke, asked him what grievances he could have against a man whom he had not seen for six months. "'I want none of your explanations. Either we fight instantly, or I will make a row before these people. I suppose you can wait till I get my sword,' answered Beaumarchais. "'I have only a morning sword in my carriage. You surely will not insist on my defending myself against you with that. We are going to call on the Comte de la Tour du Pain. He will lend you one, and I want him to serve as a witness.' With that, he sprang into his opponent's carriage, leaving him to scramble in after. On the way, the duke threatened his companion with all the resources of a voluminous vocabulary, and infuriated by the coolness of his replies, at last shook his fist in his face. Beaumarchais said that if he wanted him to fight, he would have to curb his impatience until he had got his sword, for he had no intention of fighting in the meantime like a street rough. When they reached the Comte's house, they met him just stepping into his carriage. He regretted that a pressing engagement made it impossible for him to undertake the service required of him, at least until four o'clock that afternoon, and he drove away. The duke then suggested that Beaumarchais should accompany him to his house and stay there until the appointed hour. Beaumarchais refused to trust himself in a house where his safety would depend on the loyalty of a man who had so little control over himself, and he ordered the coachman to drive them to his own home. "'If you get down,' roared Monsieur de Chaune, 
I will stab you on your doorstep. Then you must have that pleasure, for I intend to go home and wait until I know exactly what you mean to do. These words met with another flow of bad language from the nobleman. Come, come, Monsieur le Duc, when a man really means to fight, he does not talk so much. Do me the honor of dining with me, and if by four o'clock I do not succeed in restoring you to your senses, and you still persist in forcing upon me the alternatives of fighting you or having my face scratched, the sword must decide between us. When the carriage arrived at his house, Beaumarchais got out, followed by the duke, and having let himself in, summoned his servants and calmly ordered the dinner. His valet handed him a letter, but before he could open it, his guest snatched it out of his hand. Beaumarchais tried to pass the incident over as a joke, but this only set the duke swearing again. Seeing that his father was alarmed, Beaumarchais ordered dinner for two to be served upstairs in his study, and led the way, followed by his footman. Before dismissing the servant, he told him to fetch his sword. "'It is being repaired at the maker's, sir,' answered the man. "'Then go and see if it is ready. If not, bring me a new one.' "'I forbid you to go out,' cried the duke. "'If you attempt it, I'll kill you.' "'So you have changed your project? Thank God!' exclaimed Beaumarchais. "'For I cannot fight without a sword.' And he signed for the valet to leave them. He then sat down to write. His guest snatched away his pen. He tried to talk him into a better frame of mind, but without warning the duke seized the morning sword, which on entering the room Beaumarchais had laid on his desk, and grinding his teeth like a madman, advanced to attack him with it, still carrying his own sword at his side. "'Ah, you coward!' cried Beaumarchais, and he caught his enemy in his arms to prevent his using the weapon, and gradually pushed him towards the bell. Seeing his intention, his assailant thrust the fingers of his free hand into his eyes, and inflicted deep scratches in his face, covering it with blood. But Beaumarchais kept his hold, and at last succeeded in ringing. "'Disarm this madman!' he cried to the servants, who came running in answer to his summons. His cook, a huge fellow, made for the duke with a heavy piece of wood. "'Stop!' shouted his master. "'Do not harm him, or he will accuse me of trying to murder him in my house.' They wrenched the sword from his hand, but he instantly seized Beaumarchais by the hair, tearing a handful from the front of his head. The pain caused him to lose his hold on his enemy, but he drove his fist with great force to his face. "'Wretch!' roared the nobleman. "'How dare you strike a duke and a peer of the realm!' In spite of the seriousness of the situation, the incongruity of the exclamation tickled Pierre-Augustin's sense of humour, and he had difficulty in restraining his laughter. The duke now caught him by the throat, and the combatants at length found themselves struggling at the head of the stairs, giving and returning blows with all their strength. The servants threw themselves in a body between their master and his assailant, but their interference caused them to overbalance, and all were precipitated in a tangled heap to the bottom of the staircase. At this moment there was a knock at the door. Extricating himself, the duke ran to open. He found Goudin on the threshold, and seizing his arm pulled him in, and setting his back to the door, declared that he would cut in pieces anybody who attempted to come in or go out. The noise he made so terrified the women that one of them rushed upstairs, and throwing open a window, shrieked that her master was being murdered. Goudin, alarmed at the sight of his friend with his coat and shirt torn to rags and his face streaming blood, tried to lead him upstairs, but the duke would not allow it, and drawing his sword, which he still carried at his side, for none of the servants had dared take it from him because of his rank, made a savage lunge at Beaumarchais. The latter avoided the stroke, and the servants threw themselves upon the infuriated nobleman, and at length succeeded in disarming him, but not before he had wounded the valet in the head, gashed the coachman's nose, and pierced the cook's hand. "'You miserable coward!' cried Beaumarchais. "'That is the second time you have attacked an unarmed man with your sword.' The duke now ran into the kitchen to look for a knife, but the servants had already locked up all the cutlery. Beaumarchais went into his study and armed himself with a pair of heavy fire-irons. On coming downstairs he found his assailant seated alone in the dining-room, devouring the food left on the table. He had swallowed a large plate of soup, several cutlets and two decanters of water. Again there was a knock at the front door, and running to open it, the duke met the commissary of police Chenu. Beaumarchais explained the situation to the magistrate, 
but his opponent interrupted him to say that he had arranged to fight him in the presence of the Comte de la Tour du Pain at four o'clock, and that he found himself unable to wait for the appointed hour. "'What do you think of this man, sir?' said Beaumarchais to Chanou, who, after making a terrible scene in my house, has the effrontery to divulge to a police officer his intention to violate the law, and compromises a general officer by naming him as a witness, thus at a stroke destroying all possibility of carrying out his project, which this cowardly admission proves that he had never seriously entertained. At these words the madman again rushed at Beaumarchais, who, upon the arrival of Chenu, had laid down his fire-irons. He defended himself as well as possible with his fists. The officer succeeded in separating the combatants, and asking Beaumarchais to stay in the reception-room led the duke, who had set his mind on breaking the glass, into another apartment. At this moment the valet returned with the new sword, which he handed to Beaumarchais, who hastened to explain to the officer that he had no intention of fighting a duel, but he would never go out unarmed in case his aggressor should take it into his head to insult him in public, as he had just done in his house, when he swore to deliver the world of him. The duke now tamely followed M. Chenu into the adjoining room, but at once began to tear his own hair and strike himself in the face with his clenched fists. At length the officer succeeded in calming him, and after coolly ordering the valet whom he had wounded to dress his hair, he left the house and went home, whilst his victims went upstairs to dress their wounds. Beaumarchais terminates his version of this encounter, supplied to the police, with these words, quote, in the course of this record, I have scrupulously refrained from comment. I have narrated the facts, simply and as far as possible, reproduced the exact words used, having no desire to deviate from the truth in any particular, whilst relating the strangest and most revolting adventure that could well happen to a reasonable man. End quote. The commissary, in his report to Monsieur de Sartine, obviously knows not what to make of the affair, but is extremely circumspect in his references to the Duke having a lively sense of the power and influence of his family. The deposition of Beaumarchais compares very favorably both from the point of view of frankness and probability with that of Monsieur de Chong. After being for over three years, asserts the Duke, the dupe of the Sieur de Beaumarchais, who he thought to be his friend, he had strong reasons to keep him at a distance. He conceals the real cause of the quarrel, stating that the trouble arose through certain calumnies which Beaumarchais had spread concerning him. On the matter being reported to him, he went to his libeller's house, accompanied by the Sieur Goudin, but learned that he was attending a sitting of the tribunal of the Capitainerie. He immediately proceeded to that court to demand an explanation. On the conclusion of the audience, he drove home to dinner with the Sieur de Beaumarchais, but had no sooner entered the house than his companion grossly insulted him, and he was compelled as a man of honour to ask him to come outside and give him satisfaction. Whereupon the Sieur de Beaumarchais struck him, and four of his servants fell upon him and took away his sword, whilst at the same time his assailant sent his sister to fetch the commissary of police. Even the arrival of the magistrate failed to prevent this misguided man from making the most impudent accusations against him. On leaving his house he went at once to give an account of the affair to Monsieur de Sartine, and on the morrow, by his advice, to Monsieur le Duc de la Vrillière. Returning from Versailles, he heard that M. de Beaumarchais was telling everybody that he had refused his challenge. As it was impossible for a man of birth like himself to cross swords with a person like the Sieur de Beaumarchais, who was the son of a watchmaker, he let it be known that he intended to punish him for his insolence, in a manner appropriate to his humble rank. In conclusion, he boldly asserted that he had never come under the notice of the police, either in Paris or elsewhere, as a gambler or a quarrelsome or disorderly person. Quote, whilst the reputation of M. de Beaumarchais is not by a long way so intact, since apart from his notorious insolence and the most extraordinary rumours about him, he is at this moment undergoing a criminal prosecution for forgery. M. de Chon knew perfectly well that this concluding paragraph, and indeed the greater part of his deposition, was little better than a tissue of lies, for even La Blache did not dare accuse Beaumarchais of forgery nor was it a criminal court which was trying the case, but such was the damning effect of this lawsuit, and his enemies' calumnies upon his reputation, that the Duke could make these false charges with impunity even before sentence was pronounced. After the harrowing experiences of the day, we might well suppose that Beaumarchais would take to his bed for a few days by way of restoring his nerves. Not at all. 
His marvellous vitality, one of the secrets of his charm, enabled him to shed his troubles with childlike facility. The same evening he had promised to visit one of his friends and read the Barber of Seville to a large company assembled at his house. At the appointed time Beaumarchais arrived, fresh, well-groomed, cheerful, and apparently without a care in the world, his bruises and scratches alone betraying the ordeal from which he had just emerged. He read his comedy with great spirit, entertained the company with the most amusing narrative of his encounter with the Duke, and spent much of the night in singing Spanish songs to his own accompaniment on the harp. The next morning his father brought him a sword he himself had carried in his youth. "'You people of today have wretched weapons,' he said, "'but this is a sound one, belonging to a time when there was more fighting than nowadays. Take it, and if that scoundrel of a duke comes near thee, kill him, like a mad dog.' The adventure had made such a stir that the matter was taken up by the tribunal of the marshals of France, the judges in affairs of honour among gentlemen. In the meantime, the Duc de la Vrillière had taken upon himself to order Beaumarchais to retire into the country for a time, but on his vigorous protests against this irregular sentence which would gravely compromise his honour in relation to Monsieur de Chaune, he was allowed to consider himself under arrest in his own house until the affair had been reported to the king. Both combatants were now summoned to appear before the tribunal of the marshals. Beaumarchais was able to prove that the only grievance the Duc de Chaune could possibly have against him was the favour bestowed upon him by a lady whose affection that nobleman had not been clever enough to retain. This was, doubtless, very annoying to the Duke, but such things will happen. The court decided against Monsieur de Chaune, and on the 19th February he was arrested and imprisoned in the Chateau de Vincennes. The tribunal, having sent for Beaumarchais a second time, informed him that he was free. Beaumarchais, however, knew the world in which he lived too well to feel quite easy. He therefore called upon the Duc de la Vrillière to obtain his assurance that he really could consider himself at liberty. This courtier, being out, he went straight to Monsieur de Sartine and asked him the same question. The chief of police soon set his mind at rest by stating that he had entirely cleared himself. Beaumarchais thereupon ventured out into the streets again. But the Duc de la Vrillière, annoyed that the tribunal had revoked in the king's name orders which he had given by the same authority, thought of an ingenious way of rebuking the officiousness of these magistrates. He caused Beaumarchais to be arrested and conveyed to Fort l'Evêque. End of chapter 11 Read by Sandra, Montreal, 2022Chapter 12 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 12, Beaumarchais in Prison. Although it was generally admitted that Beaumarchais was entirely blameless in this quarrel, which had cost him his liberty, Few people among the general public bothered themselves about the injustice which had been meted out to him. Such accidents were common enough in those days and might have happened to anybody. This very insolent individual, says Bachelmont in describing the affair, who fears nothing, is not liked, and although nobody appears to have anything with which to reproach him in this brawl, less pity is felt for him than for another in the vexations he has met with. But he was not wholly without sympathizers. During the first weeks of his imprisonment, he was greatly touched by receiving a thoughtful letter enclosing a purse from the six-years-old son of his friend, Monsieur Lenormand d'Etoile, by his second wife. The little boy was very fond of Beaumarchais, and was very much distressed at hearing of his friend's misfortune. Sir, he says, writing from Newly on the 2nd March, I am sending you my purse, because one is always unhappy in prison. I am very sorry that you are in prison. Every morning and every evening I say an Ave Maria for you. I have the honor of being, sir, your very humble and very obedient servant, Constant. Beaumarchais wrote thanking the mother for allowing his little friend to give him this mark of generosity and attachment, and congratulated her on having inculcated such thoughtfulness for others in a child so young. He begged her to reward little Constant in such a way that he should not conclude that every beneficent act receives its recompense, and ended by saying, This letter and purse have made me feel as joyful as a child. Happy parents to have a son capable, at six years of age, of such an action. I also had a son, but I have him no longer, and yours already gives you such pleasure. I share it with all my heart, and beg you to continue to love a little him whose misfortune gave rise to this charming thought on the part of our little Constant. To the little boy himself, he wrote, My dear little Constant, 
I received with much gratitude your letter and the purse you enclosed with it. I have carefully shared out their contents among my fellow prisoners, according to their several needs and my own, keeping for your friend Beaumarchais the better part. I mean the prayers, the Ave Maria, of which most assuredly I have great need, whilst distributing among poor people who are suffering all the money contained in your purse. Thus, in your desire to oblige a single man, you have won the gratitude of several. That is the usual result of all good actions such as yours. Goodbye, little friend Constant. Beaumarchais. Writing to Goudin on his first day of his imprisonment, Beaumarchais describes his situation with some humor, but cannot tell his friend whether he owes the little attention that has been paid him to the Duchalm family, the minister, or the dukes and peers as a body. What can he do? For to be in the right, a man invariably puts himself in the wrong in the eyes of the powerful, who are always quick to punish, but never to judge. Meanwhile, Mademoiselle Menard, alarmed at the duke's fresh outburst, sought the protection of Monsieur de Sartine, who did his best to calm her fears. In thanking him, the distressed lady said she had determined once more to seek refuge in a convent, although she was careful to make him understand that this was a temporary arrangement. She had no desire for him to exaggerate the extent of her vocation. She begged him to make her retreat inaccessible to the violent man from whose fury she had fled. She trusted him so implicitly that she had already used his authority to place her daughter in the convent of the presentation. Deign, sir, she continued, to extend to the mother the protection which you have already exerted in favor of her daughter. After God, we put all our trust in you, a trust which is only equaled by the respectful sentiments with which I have the honor of being, sir, your very humble and very obedient servant. On the following day, Monsieur de Sartine directed the Abbe Dugu, who had already befriended the hapless lady, to find a convent for her. The worthy priest was much perturbed at the delicate and distasteful mission which had been confided to him. Nevertheless, he acted with energy and expedition, and the same evening was able to report progress. First of all, he had tried to persuade the prioress of the convent of the presentation to take the mother as well as the daughter, but in spite of this lady's goodwill, the house was already full, and it was impossible for her to receive any more guests. He next went to the Cordeliers in the Rue de Lourcine, and after many questions, which he was compelled to evade, his request was granted. At eleven o'clock that morning, he had the satisfaction of seeing Mademoiselle Menard duly installed. He was extremely ill at ease in being innocently involved in this catastrophe. He would be greatly reassured if Monsieur de Sartine could, at least for the time being, make it impossible for the Duke and Monsieur de Beaumarchais and their agents to come near this retreat. For, in view of the difficulties he had experienced in finding a place of refuge for the lady, he had been obliged to pass her off as his relative, and he really did not know what these nuns would say if, by the violence or imprudence of either of the interested parties, it should leak out that it was a kept woman whom he had been at such pains to introduce into their house. Whilst if only these rash rivals would leave her in peace, her sweet face and character would plead strongly in favor of this afflicted recluse, and spare me the disgrace of appearing to be not only a liar, but guilty of most irregular conduct. I left the ladies very well disposed towards their new boarder, but I repeat, what a disgrace it would be for her and for me, who have put myself so much forward in this affair, if jealousy or love, equally out of place, should go so far as to exhale their scandalous transports or their unedifying sighs in her parlor. But Mademoiselle Menard's vocation for the religious life was of the slightest, and after a fortnight's retirement, finding that her persecutor was safely under lock and key, she returned to her home as precipitately as she had left it. In spite of the remonstrances of Beaumarchais, she could not be persuaded to go back to the convent, but immediately set herself energetically to procuring his release. Profiting by the imprisonment of his opponent, Lablache worked unremittingly to blacken his character in the eyes of the judges. Beaumarchais wrote letter after letter to the Duc de la Vrière, complaining bitterly of his unjust treatment. Monsieur de Sartine, who was a man of feeling, undertook to solicit for him permission to go out for a few hours each day to prepare his case, visit the judges, and to attend to other urgent business. But the minister replied, The man is far too insolent. Let him instruct his attorney to conduct his case. But, as Beaumarchais pointed out to Monsieur de Sartine, Monsieur de Lavriere knew as well as he did that the course he recommended was forbidden by law. Good heavens, he cried. Cannot they ruin an innocent man without making a laughing stock of him? Sir, I have been grievously insulted, and they deny me justice because my adversary is a nobleman. I have been put in prison and kept there because I have been insulted by a man of quality. Monsieur de Sartine agreed that all this was true, but nevertheless advised him to alter his tone, and bow to the inevitable by asking not for justice, but for pardon. At last, Beaumarchais, very much against the grain, wrote a humble letter, almost as humble as that which Monsieur de Chon had already written on his own behalf, to the minister, flattering his petty vanity, and at once secured his permission to go out during the day, attended by a police officer, on condition that he returned to the prison for his meals and to sleep. Beaumarchais spent his hours of liberty in attempting to counteract the machinations of his opponent. 
he sought interviews with his judges, as was then the custom among litigants, and of which the Comte de Lablache had already taken full advantage. But do what he might, the Comte was too strong for him, and during his imprisonment had succeeded only too well in inspiring judges and public alike with his own malignity. On the report of Councillor Gozman, the Parliament overruled the decision of the First Tribunal, setting aside the agreement between Beaumarchais and Paris du Vernay as invalid. Thus, Beaumarchais was indirectly declared guilty of forgery, without any formal charge being made against him. This iniquitous judgment gravely compromised not only his honor, but his fortune, for it condemned him to pay 56,300 francs, with five years' interest, and all the costs of the proceedings. Nor was this all, for the success of Lablache encouraged other claimants, including the sister and other relatives of his first wife, as we have already related in a former chapter. For a moment, even his courageous heart faltered under these blows. On the 9th April, we find him pouring out his troubles to the sympathetic Monsieur de Sartine. I am at the end of my courage. My credit is destroyed. My affairs are in ruin. My family, of whom I am the sole support, are in despair. Sir, I have all my life tried unostentatiously to do good, yet I have always been defamed by enemies. If you knew me in my family circle, you would recognize me as a good son, a good brother, a good husband, and a good citizen, earning only benedictions from those around me, whilst I am shamelessly calumniated by those who do not know me. Is there no limit to the vengeance exacted of me for this wretched Deschamps affair? My imprisonment has cost me a good hundred thousand francs. In form and substance, this wicked sentence makes me shudder, and whilst I am kept in this horrible prison, I have no chance of retrieving my losses. I have strength to bear my own troubles, but none to bear the sight of my worthy father's tears, he who at seventy-five years of age is dying of grief at the objection to which I have fallen. I have none against the pain of my sisters and nieces, whose future is already overshadowed by the fear of want arising out of the deplorable state into which my detention has thrown me and my affairs. Today all the activity of my mind turns against me. My situation is killing me. I am struggling against an acute illness brought about by sleeplessness and loss of appetite. The infected air of the prison is destroying my health. On the 8th May, after two and a half months of unjustifiable imprisonment, La Vriere at last restored him to liberty. Suddenly there arose out of this lost action another and more terrible lawsuit, which, like an 18th-century Dreyfus case, convulsed the whole country and almost cost Beaumarchais his life. By dint of an amazing combination of skill, daring, and eloquence, Beaumarchais turned the threatened disaster into a triumph almost without precedent. This he accomplished by boldly appealing to public opinion over the head of the judges, the court, and the sovereign himself, in a series of magnificent open letters, in which he cunningly associated his cause with that of the oppressed people, and incidentally attacking the corrupt and usurping Malpio Parliament, with the deadly weapons of irony and ridicule, succeeded in overthrowing it. He revealed himself as a great publicist, a master of comedy, and a forerunner of the revolution. At one stroke, he became the hero of the nation and the most talked-of man in Europe. A year ago, says Grimm, he was the most hated man in Paris. Everybody on the word of his neighbor thought him capable of the greatest crimes. Today, everybody dotes upon him. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 13, How Louis XV Overthrew the Old Parlement and 15 Louis the New. In 1771, the Chancellor Maupou, who had risen to power by the influence of Madame du Barry, still further ingratiated himself with the king by abolishing the Parlement du Paris and exiling its members on account of their constant opposition to the royal wishes, setting in its place a council composed of men whom he could depend upon to further his views. In spite of many notorious abuses which were allowed to subsist under the old Parlement, and were adroitly abolished in the new, this violent measure excited great indignation throughout the country, and the new council was derisively named the Parlement Maupou. Among its members was Louis Valentin Guzman, a dissipated, though learned Alsatian jurist, who in 1765 had established himself in Paris with his young and pretty second wife. The pair were in continual financial embarrassment, caused not less by the husband's pursuit of women than by the wife's pursuit of pleasure, and they were equally unscrupulous as to the means they employed to gratify their tastes. As Madame Guzman naively remarked in a moment of expansion, it is impossible to live honestly on what we are paid, but we have the art of plucking the fowl without making it cry out. 
These words were spoken in the presence of several people at the house of Luget, the bookseller, who sold her husband's books and was probably one of her favoured admirers. At any rate, she frequently obtained money from him, quite apart from her husband's royalties. In fact, her rapacity was only exceeded by that of Madame Leger, the bookseller's wife, who, in her turn, was the most expensive of the long line of Mirabeau's mistresses. Guzman, having been appointed judge advocate to report on his case, Beaumarchais had no sooner obtained permission to leave his prison than he made several vain attempts to secure an interview in order to instruct the judge. Hearing of the ill success attending these efforts, Leger, who was a stranger to Beaumarchais, sent word to him by Bertrand d'Herolle, a common friend, that the only way of gaining access to Guzman and of making sure of his equity was to give a present to his wife, and suggested two hundred louis as an appropriate sum. Despairing of his case, unless he succeeded in interviewing the judge beforehand, and thinking, like Crispin, that justice is such a precious thing that you cannot pay too much for it, Beaumarchais borrowed one hundred louis from his friends and handed that sum, with a watch ornamented with diamonds of equal value, to the bookseller, requesting him to pass them on to the judge's wife. Madame Guzman accepted the present, but demanded a further sum of fifteen louis, which she said was intended for her husband's secretary. On receiving this amount, she told Leger that if Beaumarchais lost his case, everything would be returned to him. The following day, Beaumarchais, accompanied by his prison guard, was granted an interview with the judge. This was on Friday, the 3rd April. During the brief conversation, Gersman showed, by his incongruous observations, that he had very little knowledge of the case. Beaumarchais told him this, and he replied that the case was a simple one, and he was quite competent to render an exact account to the court on the following Monday, when it was down for hearing. As he spoke, Beaumarchais thought he detected an equivocal smile on his face. He requested a further interview, but this was refused as unnecessary. On his return to his sister's house, his own home having been sold up by his creditors at the instance of La Blache, he was living with Madame Lépine, he told his friends there assembled of the judge's strange bearing and begged Bertrand d'Herolle to seek a second audience through Madame Guzman. She replied that since her husband had made only empty criticisms, it was obvious that these were the only ones which could be offered to the justice of his cause, that he need have no inquietude as to the strange smile he had detected on the judge's face, as it was habitual with him, and finally, if he would submit any observations he had to make on the judge's remarks, she would undertake to place them before him. Three days later, Guzman decided against him, and he lost his case. The same evening, Madame Guzman sent Bertrand d'Herolle to Beaumarchais with the 100 louis and the watch, but as to the 15 louis which had been asked for as a gift for her husband's secretary, she considered that he was not justified in expecting them to be returned. Now, Guzman's secretary was an honest fellow who had fallen among thieves, for Beaumarchais, on the occasion of his interview with the judge, had already had the greatest difficulty in persuading him to accept a present of ten louis for his services in arranging for the audience, so he could not understand why he should suddenly demand fifteen louis. He therefore called upon him and soon found that he knew nothing about the matter and, indeed, wanted to refund the amount he had already received. It was clear that Madame Guzman had herself appropriated the money. Beaumarchais was so indignant at this meanness that, in spite of the danger of such a course, he determined to write to her claiming the fifteen louis. His situation was already so desperate that he thought it could not well be much worse. Moreover, he was convinced that he had lost his case only because La Blache had given the judge more money than he himself had offered to secure an audience, and in these circumstances he saw a chance of convicting Guzman of corruption and, above all, of getting the unjust decision of a court reversed. In this he was singularly ill-advised, for has not one of the wisest of men said, Go not to law with a judge, for they will judge for him according to his honour. As he had anticipated, Madame Guzman, being obliged either to acknowledge the misappropriation of the fifteen louis and giving them back, or to deny having received them, chose the latter course. She evidently hoped to be able to keep this little transaction secret from her husband. She boldly declared that Beaumarchais, through a third person, had offered her one hundred louis and a watch to secure her husband's favourable decision in the La Blache case, but that she had rejected his criminal proposal with indignation. 
To the letter of Beaumarchais claiming the fifteen louis, she made no reply. But the following day his sister, Madame Lépine, came to tell him that Leger was at her house in a state of extreme agitation because Madame Guzman had sent for him and bitterly complained that Beaumarchais demanded of her the sum of one hundred louis and a watch ornamented with diamonds, which she had already instructed Leger to return to him. He said it was cruel of Beaumarchais to deny having received them, and that Madame Guzman was furiously angry and threatened to use the influence of a certain duke to ruin them both. Madame Lépine said they had tried in vain to make the unhappy bookseller understand that Madame Guzman was merely equivocating, and that the only question now under discussion was the fifteen louis. Beaumarchais at once gave his sister a copy of the letter. He was always an admirably methodical businessman to show to Leger, who, convinced at last, promised to go straightway to Madame Guzman and tax her with bad faith. But though the spirit was willing, the flesh in his case was weak, and in his terror at finding himself in conflict with a judge, he failed to keep his promise. Beaumarchais wrote two further letters on the subject, which remained unanswered. From the outset of his inquiries, and in spite of the categorical denials of his wife, Guzman must have seen that she had received and kept the hundred louis and the watch until after the judgment in the Lablache case, and that she had diverted to her own use and still retained the compromising fifteen louis. But in view of a misfortune and discredit into which his antagonist had fallen, he thought he would never dare persevere in his claim and risk all the dread consequences for such a paltry sum, and even if he did, nobody would believe him. Before going further, however, he attempted to make doubly sure of his victim's ruin by writing a little confidential note to Monsieur de Sartine, which afterwards came into the hands of Beaumarchais, asking him, as a special favour, to rid him of this tiresome litigant by means of a lettre de cachet. But by this time Beaumarchais had seen to it that all Paris was talking of a fatal fifteen louis, and the already unpopular government dared not risk the suggested outrage. Failing on this side, Guzman summoned Leger to his study, and frightened him into copying out and signing a statement which he himself had drawn up, retracting what he had previously said and supporting the false testimony of Madame Guzman. Having made sure of Leger, he at once denounced Beaumarchais to the Parlement, confidently counting on an easy triumph over his stricken adversary, who now found himself on trial on a criminal charge before judges whose interest it was to find him guilty. At that period it was the practice to try and to judge such cases behind closed doors, and the penalty was, short of capital punishment, the severest known to the law. Any other man would have trembled at the odds against him, but Beaumarchais was never so dangerous, never so completely master of his mind, his nerves himself, as when thoroughly cornered. In the present cruel dilemma he boldly appealed to public opinion. Since he could find no advocate sufficiently courageous to defend him, he would plead his case himself, and he would publish it on the housetops. He would trample underfoot, says Louis de Lomény, the time-honoured regulations prescribing secrecy in criminal cases, which prevented the nation from judging the judges, and whilst they prepared to strangle him in the dark, he would introduce light everywhere, and call public opinion to his aid. But in order that the public should respond to the appeal of a man unknown, or very unfavourably known, it was essential that he should have the art of attracting his readers, of holding them, of arousing their indignation, their passion, their pity, and at the same time amusing them. The situation is such that Beaumarchais is obliged, we might almost say under pain of death, to display a marvellous talent in extracting from a dull lawsuit all the interest of a drama, a comedy, a romance. He throws conventional arguments to the winds. He presses into the service of his cause lively details of the manners and customs of his time, equally lively narratives of his exceptionally adventurous life, and audacious discussions on the burning political questions of the day. He is coldly analytical, ironical, magnanimous, gaily defiant of the injustice of those in authority, merciless towards any kind of pretension, witty, pathetic, eloquent, with uncontrollable outbursts of boisterous fun, consistently daring, cheerful, and debonair amid the most alarming difficulties. 
A few days before the trial, the presiding judge sent for Beaumarchais to ask him what truth there was in the current rumours, but he refused to make any statement until forced to do so in court. Let my enemies attack me if they dare, he said. Then I will speak. I will never believe that an honourable body, such as the Parlement, will be unjust and partial merely to serve the hatred of certain individuals. As to the declaration of Le Jay, that will soon turn against those who fabricated it. I have never seen Sieur Le Jay, but he is said to be an honest man whose only fault, that of all weak people, is to have allowed himself to be easily frightened and led into falsehood by others. But when he comes before the recorder, he will never hold to the false declaration which was extorted from him by Guzman in his study, and at the first cross-examination the truth will ooze out by all the pores of his skin. So without uneasiness in that respect, and full of confidence in the equity of my judges, I shall not readily lose my peace of mind. Leger now began to fear the consequences of his falsehood, and his uneasy conscience led him to consult Monsieur Gerbier, an upright and justly celebrated barrister, who advised him to tell the truth and to stick to it. Leger took the advice and told everybody whom he found willing to listen to his story. Guzman, hearing of this change of front, sent for the bookseller and his wife, and having adroitly extracted from them the draft of the false statement in his own handwriting, reproached the couple bitterly for their inconstancy. Madame Leger, the better man of the two, in spite of a judge's threats, declared that nothing should prevent them from telling the truth. Guzman next tried to persuade the bookseller to fly to Holland, offering to pay his expenses and to settle the affair during his absence. Madame Leger resolutely refused to let her husband go. This new manoeuvre, of course, got to the ears of Beaumarchais, and he lost no time in reporting the matter to the presiding judge. On being examined by the recorder, Leger, his wife, and his clerk all swore that the original draft of the first declaration had been written by Guzman, that the clerk had made several copies of it, and that Leger had been induced to sign the document, which had two or three days later been appropriated by the judge. Madame Guzman, on being examined in her turn, said very little, and pretended that she had had nothing to do with the affair. On the completion of this preliminary inquiry, Leger was arrested and imprisoned, whilst Bertrand Desrolles and Beaumarchais were placed under surveillance and ordered to hold themselves in readiness to appear before the court. Marin, the author of the Gazette de France, now came forward as a mediator and was charged by Beaumarchais to tell Guzman that he did not fear his threats, as he had already done him as much harm as it was in his power to do. You can, however, assure him, said Beaumarchais, that I shall not take a disloyal advantage of certain circumstances which have come to my knowledge to cause him public vexation, so long as he has the goodness to leave me alone. Marin promised to submit these observations to Guzman, but strongly advised Beaumarchais to drop his ridiculous references to the fifteen louis, as they had no bearing on the case and made him appear to be extremely mean. Beaumarchais told him that, on the contrary, the fifteen louis alone could save him. He saw that Marin knew this as well as he did, and that he had made the suggestion treacherously in the interests of Guzman, and even, perhaps, at the instigation of a parlement. Throughout the case, in fact, Marin proved himself to be at once the ablest and the most perfidious of his adversaries. Guzman next tried to throw over his wife and have her imprisoned in a convent, but this did not prevent her from being called upon to give evidence. At the examination before the recorder, the only witness whom Madame Guzman appeared to fear was Madame Leger, and it must be owned that her evidence was very damaging. She stated that Madame Guzman had said to her and her husband that she never intended to return the fifteen louis and all she regretted was not having kept the hundred louis and the watch as well, for the trouble today would have been no more and no less if she had done so, but she was unable to overcome the scruples of Leger. Utterly discountenanced by this evidence, Madame Guzman nearly fainted and asked for a glass of water. On recovering herself, all she could find to say was, Madame, we are here to tell the truth. Have I ever conducted myself improperly whilst joking with the people who have happened to be in your shop when I have called upon you? No, madame, nor have I said any such thing in my deposition. 
I beg you to say, madame, if I have ever gone upstairs alone with Monsieur Leger into his room, and if I have ever remained there locked in with him, so as to give rise to tattle and mockery. Good heavens, madame, you surprise me with your strange questions. What has all this to do with a business which brings us here? We are concerned with a hundred louis which you received, and fifteen louis which you still hold, and not with your private interviews with my husband, of which nobody complains. Madame, I declare before all that I have returned the hundred louis and the watch. As for the fifteen louis, that is nobody's business. It is a matter entirely between Monsieur Leger and myself. These words, uttered in a trembling voice and interspersed with a few tears, were all that she could be induced to say in the presence of Madame Leger. After many excuses and failures to keep her appointments, Madame Guzman was at length brought face to face with Beaumarchais. When the oath had been administered and the clerk had registered their names and station, they were asked if they knew each other. "'As for that, no,' replied Madame Guzman. "'I neither know nor wish to know him.' "'Nor have I the honour of knowing Madame,' Beaumarchais answered the same question. "'But on seeing her I cannot help forming a wish entirely different from hers.' On being asked what grievances she had against him, she said, "'Put down that I accuse and challenge him because he is my chief enemy "'and because he is well known throughout Paris to be an odious person.' Her reply was duly committed to writing, and Beaumarchais, in his turn interrogated, said, I have no reproach to make against Madame, not even for the little irritation which she shows at this moment, but I much regret that my first opportunity of offering her my respectful compliments should be due to a criminal suit. As to the wickedness of my character, I hope to be able to prove to her, by the moderation of my replies and my respectful bearing, that her counsel has misinformed her. The examination lasted over eight hours and two sittings. The recorder then read over the evidence aloud and asked Madame Guzman if she had any observations to make. Indeed, no, she said, smiling at the magistrate. What should I say to all this stuff and nonsense? Monsieur must surely have a lot of time on his hands to write down such a rigmarole. Make your deposition, madame, said the official, for I must warn you that afterwards it will be too late. But, sir, what about... I do not understand... Oh, write down that, generally speaking, monsieur's replies are false, and have been suggested to him. Beaumarchais smiled. She asked why. Because, madame, I gather from your exclamation that you had suddenly remembered this part of your lesson, though you certainly might have applied it more happily. On many of the subjects dealt with in my evidence, you could not possibly know whether my replies were true or false. With regard to suggestion, you have certainly confused matters, for being regarded by your counsel as the head of a clique, your own term, you must have been told that I suggested the replies of others, not that mine were suggested to me. But have you nothing in particular to say of the letter I had the honour of writing to you, which procured me the interview of Monsieur Guzman? Certainly, sir. Wait a moment. Uh, right, as regards the alleged interview the alleged interview. But Madame Guzman was unable to proceed. She became involved in a maze of half-remembered legal terms and circumlocutions which she did not understand, and had clearly not been taught at her convent. The magistrate came to her rescue. Well, madame, what do you mean by alleged interview? Do not bother about the words. Make sure of your ideas. Explain yourself clearly, and I will faithfully record your evidence." I want to say, sir, that I have nothing to do with the affairs or the interviews of my husband. I am occupied solely with my household, so if monsieur gave a letter to my footman, it is an additional proof of his perfidy, which I will maintain against all and everybody. Will you kindly explain, madame, asked Beaumarchais, what perfidy you can possibly find in such a simple action as handing a letter to a servant? After a long and embarrassed silence, she said, if it is true that monsieur delivered a letter at my house, to which of my servants did he give it? He was a fair-haired young man who said he belonged to you, madame. Ah, that is a pretty contradiction, she cried. Put down that monsieur gave a letter to a young fair-haired footman, but my footman is not fair-haired. His hair is light auburn, and if you saw my footman, what is my livery like? I did not know that madame had a particular livery, answered the astonished Beaumarchais. 
please write down that monsieur who spoke to my footman does not know that I have a particular livery, whereas I have two, one for the winter and one for the summer. Madame, replied Beaumarchais, I have so little intention to dispute your two liveries that I seem to remember the footman was in a spring morning jacket, for it was on the 3rd of April. Forgive me if I fail to explain myself clearly. As it was natural to suppose that, when you married, your servants doffed your livery to don that of Guzman's, I was unable to distinguish from his dress whether the lackey in question belonged to monsieur or madame. On this delicate point I was, therefore, compelled to trust to the insecurity of his word. However, whether his hair was fair or light auburn, whether he was in the Guzman or the Jamar livery, it is nevertheless true that before irreproachable witnesses, Monsieur Falconet and the Sieur Santerre, a footman professing to be yours, received from me on the landing of your staircase a letter which he refused at first to take, as he said that Monsieur was with Madame, but which he at length delivered upon my reassuring him and returned with the verbal answer. You can go up to Monsieur's study, he will be there in a moment, as in fact he was. All this talk leads nowhere said Madame Guzman. You did not follow my footman up the stairs, so you cannot swear that he gave me the letter, and I declare that I have never received a letter from you or on your behalf, and that I had nothing whatever to do with procuring you this interview. Good God, Madame, exclaimed Beaumarchais, would you deliver us over to a still worse suspicion? If you did not receive this letter from your footman, since it is proved that he had it from me, and the appearance of Monsieur Guzman tallies with the verbal reply of the light auburn-haired young man, we must conclude that this deceitful footman delivered a letter to your husband, this letter, madame, by which you were summoned, in accordance with your understanding with Leger, to procure me an interview. We must conclude that this husband, no less fond than inquisitive, felt himself obliged, as a gallant man, to keep his wife's engagement and... Complete the sentence, madame. On my honour I have not the courage to carry it any further. Decide which of you opened the letter that led to the interview, but if you persist in maintaining that it was not you, do not at any rate tell us that I am compromising Monsieur Guzman in this affair." for it is proved up to the hilt that it is you yourself who are compromising him. Hold your tongue, sir, cried Madame Guzman angrily. It would take us till tomorrow morning to reply to so many impertinencies. I hold to what I said and will not add another word. What, madame? exclaimed the astonished Beaumarchais. Is there a living man so much his own enemy as to confide to you his honour and the conduct of such a grave intrigue? Pardon me, but I am less amazed at you than at the council who has put you forward to maintain such a cause. Well, sir, what is there so surprising in what has just been read, if you please? You are a very charming woman, madame, but you are absolutely lacking in memory, and that is what I shall have the honour of proving to you tomorrow morning. Just before the sitting closed, madame Guzman turned on Beaumarchais and said, Cruel wretch! My statements have just been read, and you put off your replies until tomorrow, merely to give you time to invent fresh villainies against me. But I declare, you odious fellow, that unless you give me a full answer without preparation here and now, you will not be admitted in the morning. She apparently thought her husband had power to forbid the court to her antagonist. Amused at this idle threat, even more than he was offended by the insulting words which accompanied it, Beaumarchais laughingly replied, Very well, madame, I will give you satisfaction. It is nearly ten o'clock, but before we adjourn, I call upon you here and now, without preparation, to tell us how it is that, in all your statements, you declare yourself to be thirty years old, whereas your looks belie you and clearly show you to be only eighteen and he bowed deeply to her as he turned to go out. But Madame Guzman was so little offended by the compliment that she asked him to give her his arm and conduct her to her carriage. The pair, arm in arm, now prepared to leave the court, but Monsieur Fremont, best of men if gravest of recorders, considered it necessary to point out to them how unbecoming it was, under the circumstances, to be seen leaving the court together. Beaumarchais thereupon saluted her with another compliment which drew from her a pleased smile and turned homewards. 
Although she had promised to attend the court at ten o'clock the following morning, it was not until four in the afternoon that she put in an appearance. Today, madame, said Beaumarchais, I take the offensive, and this is my plan. We are going to review your evidence and verification. I shall make my observations on them, but every time you insult me, I shall instantly avenge myself by making you fall into fresh contradictions. Fresh ones, sir? Are there any in what I have said? Good God, madame, your evidence swarms with them, but I admit that it is still more surprising not to have seen them in writing your deposition than to have made them in dictation. He thereupon took up the papers to run through them. Do you mean to say, cried Madame Guzman, that Monsieur is allowed to read all that they have made me write? That is right, madame, which I intend to use only with every consideration for you. In your first examination, for instance, to sixteen questions on the same subject, namely whether you received one hundred louis from Le Jay to procure an interview for the Sieur de Beaumarchais, I see to the honour of your discretion that the sixteen replies bear no superfluous ornaments. And he proceeded to read the statement as sworn to by her. Asked if she had received one hundred louis, replied, That is false. If she put them away in a cardboard scent box, that is not true. If she kept them until after the verdict, an abominable lie, etc., etc. Yet at the second examination, when pressed on the same subject, Madame Guzman had answered freely, It is true that Leger offered her one hundred louis, that she kept them in her desk for a night and a day, but solely to oblige poor Leger, because he is a good fellow who did not see any harm in it, and who, besides, made himself useful in selling her husband's books and because it would have been tiring for him to carry this money about with him during his hours of business. As these replies are absolutely contrary to the first, I beg you, madame, to be good enough to tell us which of the two you wish us to accept on this important subject. Neither the one nor the other, snapped this elusive controversialist. All I said then signifies nothing. I hold to what I stated on the verification of my evidence, which alone contains the truth. It must be conceded, madame, that this method of denying one's own evidence after denying that of everybody else would be the most convenient of all if it could possibly succeed. But until it is adopted by the Parlement, let us examine what you said on these hundred louis in your verification. Beaumarchais then pressed her to show why she had sworn to three different versions of the affair. She replied that, owing to a temporary indisposition, the details of which she confided to the court in spite of a sharp rebuke of Beaumarchais, she did not know what she was saying. If I that day denied having received or held the money, it was apparently because that was my pleasure, but, as I have already said and repeat for the last time, I intend to abide by what I stated in the verification of my evidence. I am sorry if that displeases you. Me, madame? On the contrary, you could not have given me an answer more to my liking. I can assure you it pleases me so much that I would not for the world have a single word altered. Since this is your last word, permit me to make one observation. Egad, sir, you are as talkative as a woman. Without admitting that quality either for the ladies or myself, coolly pursued Beaumarchais, do not be offended, madame, if I insist on begging you to tell us whom you sent three times to poor Leger to ask him to take back the hundred louis, these treacherous hundred louis which he had furtively slipped into your Italian scent box when you were not looking. I have no account to render to you. Write that down, she said, turning to the clerk, and that he is only pressing me thus with questions to make me contradict myself. The President here intervened to demand a more categorical answer to the question. Very well, sir, since it is absolutely necessary to name him. It was my footman whom I sent. You can call him if you like. I beg you to consider well your reply, madame, gravely remarked the President. For if the footman denies having been sent to Leger's, you will find yourself in a very serious position. I know nothing about it, sir. However... Write if you like that it was not my footman, but a Savoyard, for there are any number of these porters on the Quai de Saint-Paul where I live. Monsieur has only to make inquiries if a game amuses him. I shall do nothing of a sort, madame, answered Beaumarchais, and I beg to offer you my thanks for the manner in which you have thrown light on the hundred louis. I trust that the court will be in no more doubt than I am to decide whether you rejected them openly and with indignation 
or whether you put them by discreetly and with satisfaction. And now, he pursued, let us pass on to another matter not less interesting, that of the fifteen, Louis. Are you going to repeat, sir, that I admit having received them? I am not so presumptuous, madame, as to expect a formal avowal, but I confess that I count sufficiently on small contradictions to hope, with the help of God and the recorder, to be able to disperse the mist which still obscures the truth. He begged her to answer without reservation or qualification whether she had not demanded fifteen louis through Leger for the secretary, and whether, when she received them, she had not locked them in her desk. I answered clearly and without qualification that Leger has never spoken to me of fifteen louis and has never offered them to me. May I point out, madame, observed Beaumarchais, that it would be more meritorious to say, I refused the money, than to maintain that you know nothing about it. I maintain, sir, that nothing has ever been said to me about this money. Is it likely that anybody would dare offer fifteen louis to a woman in my position, to me who had refused a hundred the day before? To which day do you refer, madame? instantly inquired Beaumarchais. To be sure, sir, the day before— She broke off suddenly and bit her lip. You mean the day before that on which nobody had spoken to you for fifteen louis, do you not? suggested Beaumarchais. "'Hold your tongue!' she cried, springing to her feet in a passion. "'Or I will box your ears. "'I have heard quite enough of these fifteen, Louis. "'You are trying to confuse and catch me with your wicked little twisted phrases, "'but I swear I will not answer another word.' "'And she fanned herself vigorously to cool her hot face. "'The recorder here interposed to ask whether it was really necessary to go further into this matter, "'which appeared to offend the lady so much.' I cannot understand why madame should feel hurt, said Beaumarchais, since I was careful to show that the sum in question was asked not for herself, but for the secretary. However, let us say no more about the hundred Louis rejected the day before, before that on which nobody had spoken to her of the fifteen Louis, since this matter troubles the peace of our conference. But I ask pardon and privilege for my question. The true import of principles is often revealed only by the inferences that are drawn from them. I beg you, therefore, to write exactly. Madame Guzman asserts that nobody has ever spoken to her for fifteen louis, nor proposed that she should accept them. Beaumarchais now asked the recorder to place before her a copy of the letter, submitted to the court by Leger, acknowledging the receipt of a hundred louis and the watch, and pointing out that the fifteen louis had not been returned. At first, Madame Guzman angrily denied all knowledge of such a communication, and asserted that the letter she had received from Beaumarchais was an insignificant scrap of paper, having nothing whatever to do with this matter, and that, after reading it, she had thrown it away. Beaumarchais now read aloud the record of Madame Guzman's second examination. All that Madame Guzman recollects is that she received a letter from Monsieur de Beaumarchais, which made her very angry, for she understood him to say that he had not received the hundred louis, and the watch, and the fifteen louis, that she had immediately sent for Leger to ascertain whether he had returned the former sum and the watch, that Leger had pointed out that she had mistaken the contents of the letter, which complained only of the withholding of the fifteen louis, and not of the other items, which he had given back before several witnesses, and that on comparing this copy with the original, she acknowledged it to be an exact transcription, and tore up the original. Are we quits, madame? Let us count. I see here two, three, four round contradictions. First, you never received any letter from me. Next, you did receive one, but it was of no importance. Then suddenly this insignificant scrap of paper is transformed into a very irritating letter, which on your own showing tallied in every way with a copy now before you. Yet today you declare that you have no knowledge of this letter, this scrap of paper, and that it has nothing to do with the letter you received from me. Does this appear to you sufficiently clear, positive, and contradictory? What have you to say to this? Nothing is easier to explain, sir. Did I not tell you that on the day of my second examination, when I admitted having received and locked up the hundred louis, and thoughtlessly told this story of the letter and the fifteen louis, I did not know what I was saying, I was in such a state. Deign to come out of it occasionally, madame, if not out of consideration for us, then at least out of respect for yourself. 
Can you not find a more modest and less fantastic means of disguising your defeat? Meanwhile, until a new article is added to the criminal code in the sense of your evidence, you will plead in vain for the same indulgence for bad faith which is accorded to bad health. Beaumarchais proceeded to show that she was truthful only when she declared that she did not know what she was saying. Since, madame, you claim somewhat frequently the honour of losing your head and your memory, would it not be better to make use of this innocent resource, to return to the path of truth rather than to wander further and further from it? A foolish question deserves no reply, retorted madame Guzman, then, after a pause, even if all were true that had been admitted at the second examination, this would not prove that I have received the fifteen louis. Far more than you think, madame, for it is easy to see that you seek to evade all inquiry into the fifteen louis, only to avoid suspicion of having exacted, received, and kept them. But as it is easier to deny all knowledge of this money than to get away from the overwhelming proof that you did receive it, I will abandon the light tone which your insults made me momentarily adopt to assure you that your defence, even more deplorable than ridiculous, places you in a most invidious light. To keep fifteen louis, madame, is a small matter, but to put the blame on the unfortunate Leger, and it needed only a little more adroitness on your part to ruin him utterly, is a crime, an enormity, which might not be so astonishing in certain men, but will always be appalling when coming from the mouth of a woman, since we justly believe that calculated wickedness of this kind is foreign to her nature. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 14, How Louis XV Overthrew the Old Parlement and 15 Louis the New. Continued. In spite of a great provocation he had received, the first memoir of Beaumarchais is marked by moderation and freedom from personalities. He is far more concerned with defending himself than with inculpating Guzman, but the pamphlet was no sooner published than there appeared in rapid succession five separate and extremely violent replies. The first was signed by Madame Guzman, consisting of seventy-four quarto pages of clumsy abuse, stiff with learned phrases and Latin quotations, which drew from Beaumarchais the remark, They announced to me an artless woman, and I find myself opposed by a German publicist. Guzman had yet to learn that it is easy to write works which nobody can read. When Madame Guzman sneered at his humble birth and his father's calling, he parried the thrust in a passage which has become justly famous in French literature. You begin this masterpiece, he said, by twitting me on the social position of my ancestors. Alas, madame, it is only too true that the last of them combined several branches of business with some celebrity in the art of watchmaking. Being obliged to plead guilty on this count, I admit with sorrow that nothing can purge me of your just reproach of being the son of my father, but I stay my hand, for I feel him leaning over my shoulder, laughing and embracing me as I write. O oh, you who taunt me with my father, you have no idea of his generous heart. Truly, watchmaking apart, I know of nobody for whom I would exchange him but I know too well the value of time which he taught me to measure to waste it in replying to such imbecilities. And not everybody like Monsieur Guzman can say, Je suis fils de Bailly, oui, je ne suis pas caron, non. However, before declaring myself on this subject, I intend to seek advice whether I ought to take exception to your ransacking my family archives in order to remind me of my ancient origin, which was almost forgotten. Do you know that I can show proof of nearly twenty years of nobility, that this nobility is my very own, on genuine parchment, stamped with the great seal in yellow wax, that it does not, like that of many people, rest on tradition and uncertainty? Nobody can dispute my title, for I have the receipt. Such a combination of gay insolence and good humour must have been hard to forgive, and the fact that in laughing at his enemies he also laughed at himself did not help to mend matters, for disagreeable people always resent good nature in others. Madame Guzman complained of his bearing at the confrontation. 
You dared, she wrote, in the presence of the commissary and the recorder to say that if I trusted myself to you, you would see that I was not imprisoned by my husband. You carried your impudence even further. You dared to add, why am I compelled to report suggestions so insulting and humiliating to me? You dared to add, I say, that you would end by making yourself heard, that one day your attentions would not displease me, that dot, 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 I dare not proceed. I dare not characterise you. Fie upon your dots, retorted Beaumarchais. You must dare, madame, you must proceed. You must characterise me. What do you mean by your dots? You put strange reticencies into your memoirs, dot, dot, dot. I replied to all your insults only by compliments, which your alert amour propre took in good or bad part, just as it pleased you to understand them. You give me a pretty reputation with your dots. What woman of repute will admit me to her house unless I destroy the impression which you give here of my gallant respect for the ladies? What woman would dare trust herself alone with me if she thought that the wife of my enemy, boiling with rage against me, and even in the presence of the judge and the recorder, ran such risks with me as to demand dots in attempting to describe them, and that she thinks herself entitled to arraign me as an audacious, shameless fellow? I, who in her presence was nothing but a very, very modest person, anxious only to defend himself against his accusers, having refuted, courted, teased, cajoled, bewildered and confounded Madame Guzman, Beaumarchais next turns to her husband. Here his manner changes. His banter and flippancy give place to gravity and close reasoning. He harasses his enemy step by step, taking extreme care, however, to avoid wounding the susceptibilities of his judges. With the greatest ingenuity, he at length succeeds in proving conclusively from internal evidence that the false deposition of Leger was dictated by Madame Gersman from a draft drawn up by her husband, and that the bookseller's illiterate copy was afterwards altered by the judge from memory in order to make sense. In the course of his argument, Beaumarchais quotes with telling effect the naive exclamation of Madame Leger when this copy was shown to her. It is undoubtedly my husband's writing, but I am quite certain it is not his style. He is not clever enough to think of all those fine phrases. It was at this point that his enemies began to circulate their cowardly insinuations respecting the sudden death of his three wives. Though he had been married only twice, and he was driven to defend himself publicly against these charges, then and then only he determined to pursue his enemies to the death. It was an ill day for Guzman when he pushed matters to these extremes, for Beaumarchais immediately set about inquiring into his enemy's past life. His researches were soon rewarded by finding irrefutable evidence that his accuser, in order to escape the consequences of an intrigue of a working-class girl named Marie-Sophie Dubillon, had given a false name and address at the Church of Saint-Jacques de la Boucherie when registering the birth of her child, and had then disappeared. On making this timely discovery, Beaumarchais at once turned the tables on his pursuer and brought his criminal offence to the notice of his fellow magistrates, who were compelled to take steps against their colleague. Beaumarchais was nevertheless cruelly wounded by Guzman's calumnies, which drew from him this appeal. Oh, you, my friends, who have known me all my life, say if you have ever seen in me anything worse than a constantly gay and genial man, loving study and pleasure with an equal passion. Inclined to raillery, but without bitterness, and enjoying any well-seasoned pleasantry against himself, maintaining perhaps rather too warmly his opinion when he thinks himself in the right, but free from envy, and always ready to honour and esteem superiority wherever found, trustful to the point of negligence, active under the spur, but indolent and easy-going after the storm, Careless in good fortune, but supporting misfortune with a constancy and equanimity which astonishes his most familiar friends. How then is it that a well-intentioned citizen of honourable life finds himself so pitilessly defamed? How is it that a man good and sociable abroad and sober and benevolent at home finds himself the target of a thousand envenomed shafts? This is the riddle of my life. I would I could solve it. I know that in the past the august protection which I enjoyed drew upon me dangerous enemies who still pursue me. That I can understand, but I know that a few dramas and several notorious quarrels have given but too much occasion for public curiosity on my account. 
that my profound contempt for base aspersions upon my character may have exasperated the spiteful who do not like to feel their impotence, that a vain reputation for some small cleverness may have offended some very small rivals who have proceeded thence to deny me more solid qualities, perhaps a just resentment, aggravating my natural pride, has made me hard and cutting when I thought myself only nervous and concise, in society, when I thought myself only free and easy, perhaps I appeared to others presumptuous. Anything you like, gentlemen, but even if I was a coxcomb, does it follow that I was an ogre? Oh, my dear enemies, you do not know your business. Forgive my offering you a little piece of advice. If you are absolutely bent on injuring me, at least make it possible for others to believe you. Beaumarchais now turned his attention to Bertrand Derol, a kind of stock jobber who had at first taken his part and told the truth, but had afterwards recanted and gone over to the interests of Madame Guzman. The enmity of the weak is less dangerous than their friendship, so at first Beaumarchais dealt with him quite considerately. Bertrand, an indecisive person who had unaccountably blundered into the fray, sought to strike terror into his antagonist by calling him names. A cynical orator, he cried, a buffoon, a shameless sophist, a lying painter who draws from his soul the mud with which he sullies the robe of innocence, wicked from necessity and from inclination, his hard, vindictive and implacable heart is giddy with this momentary triumph, and he remorselessly tramples underfoot all right human feeling. To this diatribe, Beaumarchais replied by painting the ridiculous Bertrand just as he was garrulous, keen on money, and not over particular how he got it. Every question has two sides, just as every stock jobber has two hands. Shifty, timid, and rash, more of a fool than a knave. Guzman's second champion was Arnaud Bacoulard, a sentimental story writer and playwright of some reputation, who, wishing to curry favour with the judge, wrote him a letter containing a false statement. When Beaumarchais politely pointed this out to him in his first memoir, he replied, Yes, I was walking when I met the Sieur Caron in his carriage, in his carriage. Beaumarchais, remembering the incident quite well, said he thought Arnaud looked gloomy. This made the little man very angry. I did not look gloomy, but concerned, he wrote. Gloomy looks are suited only to those who meditate crime, who are trying to stifle remorse and to do evil. There are some hearts in which I tremble to read what I see, in which I measure all the gloomy depths of hell. It is then that I cry, Thou sleepest, Jupiter, what is the use of thy thunderbolt? If Arnaud is not vicious, it is at any rate not for want of trying. Now comes the serene and dignified answer of Beaumarchais. In his carriage, you repeat, with a great note of admiration, who would not think from this sad, Yes, I was on foot, and this great note of admiration running after my carriage that you are envy personified. But I, who know you for a good fellow, I know very well that this phrase, in his carriage, does not mean that you were angry to see me in my carriage, but only because I did not see you in yours. But console yourself, sir. The carriage in which I was driving was no longer mine when you saw me in it. The Comte de la Blache had caused it to be seized, with all my other goods. Blue-coated men with threatening muskets slung over their shoulders kept it, and all my other belongings constantly under their eyes at my house, and, before I could cause you the annoyance of showing myself to you in my carriage, I had that very day humbly to ask permission, with my hat in one hand and a good crown in the other, of these tipstaves to use it, which, no offence to you, I do every morning, and even whilst I speak to you so calmly, the same misery still pervades my house. How unjust we are! We hate and are jealous of the man we think happy, who would give anything to be in the position of a pedestrian who detests him because of his carriage. Take me for an example. Is there anything more calculated to distress me than my actual situation? But there, I am rather like Eloise's cousin. Cry as I will, a laugh is sure to slip out from some corner or other. That is what makes me so gentle with you. My philosophy is to be, as far as I can, content with myself, and to leave the rest on the knees of the gods. Pardon me, sir, he concludes, if I have not given you an answer, all to yourself, for every insult contained in your memoir, pardon me if, seeing you, measure of gloomy depths of hell in my heart, and exclaiming, Thou sleepest, Jupiter, what is the use of thy thunderbolt? I have replied flippantly to so much bombast. 
I beg you to excuse me, but you were no doubt once at school, and must know that the most inflated balloon needs only a primprick. The apologists of Beaumarchais have been strangely unanimous in belittling the talents, though they have done full justice to the perfidy of the third member of Gersman's company of pamphleteers, for Marin was by far the ablest and most dangerous of them all. They may have been misled by the apparent ease with which Beaumarchais overwhelmed this treacherous adversary and turned his poisoned weapons against himself. Fortunately, Beaumarchais knew his marin and had had too much experience in combats of this kind to give his enemy any chances, and however much he affected to despise him, it is evident that he feared this man more than all his other opponents put together. A former schoolmaster, Marin had acquired the lucrative post of director of the Gazette de France, and in this capacity had carried the art of concocting and spreading false news to a state of great perfection. He was also an official censor of literature and the drama, and agent for the Chancellor Maupou in the dissemination of pamphlets and other publications in support of a new Parlement. He was not above selling his pen to the highest bidder and had fallen under suspicion of secretly trading in the rare and scandalous libels in verse and prose which served as an agreeable condiment to the literary fare of the fashionable circles of his day. It was, moreover, always difficult for him to tell the truth. He was a sort of congenital liar. Lastly, he carried on an extensive business in accommodating with loans ladies and gentlemen in temporary monetary difficulties and showed great ingenuity in worrying those who took advantage of his good offices. Marin had no quarrel with Beaumarchais, but entered the lists on the side of his enemies from his habit of fishing in troubled waters, and to please Chancellor Maupou, who was becoming uneasy at the unexpected turn that the Gersman lawsuit was taking. Having failed in his attempt to persuade Beaumarchais to abandon his accusation against Madame Gersman respecting the fifteen Louis, and incidentally to sacrifice Le Jay, Marin, by a combination of flattery and threats, won over the mercurial Bertrand and caused him to deny all knowledge of this sum which he at first admitted having himself transmitted to the judge's wife. In his first pamphlet, Beaumarchais, intent upon setting out his case and vividly describing the events which led up to it, contented himself with simply parrying the thrusts of his opponents. Mistaking his moderation for weakness, Marin replied with a pamphlet of extreme violence, hoping, like Bertrand, to crush the discredited and ruined Beaumarchais at one blow. Having some years before published a work on Saladin, Marin apparently rather fancied himself as an Orientalist, and quoted as the motto of his memoir a translation from the Persian of Saadi, Give not thy rice to the serpent, for the serpent will sting thee. But Beaumarchais had his own idea as to Marin's application of a proverb. So far from giving his rice to the serpent, he said, Marin had spoiled him of his skin, enveloped himself in it, and crawled with as much ease as if he had done nothing else all his life. As all the more reputable advocates refused to serve in a case where there was likely to be little to gain and much to lose, the first memoir of Beaumarchais was signed by himself and an obscure lawyer named Malbet. The opportunity was too good to be lost on the alert Marin, and he opened his attack by stating that a defamatory pamphlet was being distributed in Paris signed Beaumarchais Malbet. Quite a good joke, but Beaumarchais was a past master of the pun and neatly parried the thrust. The author of the Gazette de France, he wrote, complains of a calumnious falsehood and impropriety of the insults spread abroad in a pamphlet signed, he says, Beaumarchais Malbet and he attempts to justify himself in a little manifesto signed Marin, qui n'est pas mal bête. In this battle of wits, however, Marin did not always come off second best, for we cannot doubt that it was he who inserted in Madame Gersman's memoir the justly celebrated jibe. The Sieur Caron borrowed the name of Beaumarchais from one of his wives and lent it to one of his sisters. Although in the original manuscript which we have seen, the words are not in his handwriting. Beaumarchais was too great a humorist to begrudge his tribute to the excellence of this famous joke against himself. If only Marin had conducted the controversy on such lines, Beaumarchais would never have resorted to the savagery of much of his writing against this most dangerous foe. 
but Marin's pamphlets are full of deadly insinuations, hints, and delusions, combined with a sagacious economy of the truth, which destroy all the sympathy we might otherwise have had for him in his ultimate humiliation and ruin. As an example of his methods, we will quote his reference to the Lablache case. He, Beaumarchais, lost this lawsuit which so singularly comprised his honour and his fortune. He informed me of his misfortune. I was touched, and hastened to his prison to offer him the only help it was in my power to give, my sympathy and consolation. At last he was restored to liberty and came to thank me for my attention, and although there were many persons whom he did not know in the room, he gave way to his usual indiscretion and spoke most imprudently against his reporter, Guzman, against his superiors, and against... Dot, dot, dot. The stealthy Meran had great faith in the insinuating dotted line and constantly uses it most effectively. It would be impossible to hint more clearly or more discreetly that Beaumarchais was in the habit of talking wildly against the Parlement and against the government. In another place he gives it as his considered opinion that a man who defamed a good citizen as Beaumarchais had defamed him was deserving of capital punishment. Again and again he repeats that Beaumarchais says the most insulting things against the ministers and highly placed personages, that he attacks religion and the magistrature, and if it were not that he, Marin, was too kind-hearted, he could easily prove that his adversary had committed the most odious crimes. He was, in fact, an out-and-out -out scoundrel. In this controversy, Beaumarchais received considerable assistance from several of his relatives and friends, such as the faithful Goudin, his brother-in-law Miron, and Gardin, a Provençal doctor, while some of the best passages owe not a little to the piquant wit of his sister Julie. Hearing of the collaboration, Marin went so far as to state that Beaumarchais was not the author of the memoirs published under his name. To this ridiculous charge, Pierre-Augustin replied, Since it is another who writes my memoirs, the clumsy Marin ought certainly to get him to write his own. Beaumarchais gave the coup de grace to his enemies in a sort of allegory of which we will quote the concluding passage. If the beneficent being who watches over all had one day honoured me with his presence and had said, I am the beginning of all things, without me thou wouldst not exist, I endowed thee with a healthy and robust body, a most active mind, thou knowest with what profusion I poured sensibility into thy heart and shed gaiety over thy character, without some sorrows to counterbalance thy fortunate lot, thou wouldst have been too happy." Therefore thou shalt be overwhelmed with calamities without number, defamed by a thousand enemies, deprived of thy goods and thy liberty, accused of rapine, falsehood, imposture, corruption, calumny, grown under the disgrace of a criminal lawsuit, be bound with the fetters of a decree, attacked on every event of thy life by the most absurd rumours, and for long be made the sport of public opinion as to whether thou art the vilest of men or only an honest citizen. Having humbly submitted himself to the decrees of providence, he asks for one mercy, that he might be accorded such enemies as would try but not break down his courage. He then proceeds to pass them in review, painting each one maliciously to the life, and ending thus, I would desire that this man should be of a dull and awkward mind, that his clumsy malice should for long have given him over to the hatred and contempt of a public, Above all, I would ask that he should be faithless to his friends, ungrateful to his benefactors, odious to authors by his censures, nauseous to readers by his writings, terrible to borrowers by his usury, dealing in forbidden books, spying on his hosts, fleecing strangers who trust him with their business, ruining the unhappy booksellers to enrich himself. In fact, all men should have such an opinion of him that it would be sufficient to be accused by him to be presumed an honest man, or to frequent his society to be with good reason suspect. Give me Marin. Envy and hatred are in the long run less injurious to those who inspire than to those who entertain them, and the ex-schoolmaster emerged from a combat a broken man. All Paris was laughing and jeering at him. He was soon compelled to relinquish his offices and retired to his native town of Ciotat in Provence, where he lived on the comfortable fortune he had amassed before his disgrace. After the revolution, he returned to Paris and recovered to a certain extent his position as a man of letters. 
All society followed this case with breathless interest and ever-increasing excitement, whilst from every quarter applause and encouragement greeted Sauvain Beaumarchais qui trois fois avec gloire mit le mémoire en drame et le drame en mémoire. The king read the pamphlets with amusement. Marie Antoinette brought into fashion a headdress named after a jibe aimed at Marin. Madame du Barry caused scenes from the encounter of Madame Guzman and Beaumarchais before the recorder to be played at Versailles. What a man, wrote Voltaire to d'Alembert. He blends everything, pleasantry and gravity, reason and gaiety, strength and pathos. Every kind of eloquence all comes natural to him. He confounds his adversaries and gives lessons to his judges. His unaffectedness enchants me, and I willingly forgive his indiscretion and his hastiness. And again, I fear that this brilliant madcap will prove to be in the right against the whole world. Heavens, what rascalities, what horrors, what a disgrace to the nation, what a vexation for the Parlement. The memoirs kept the Viennese court, merry throughout the winter, and were read with hilarity by Catherine the Great, whilst their political aspect won the high appreciation of the sober thinkers on the other side of the Atlantic. In Germany, the addresses were just as eagerly discussed, and Goethe tells how, at Frankfurt, he read them aloud with great success at a social function when a girlfriend suggested to him the idea of writing a drama on the Clavijo episode, which he undertook to complete ready to read to the same company the following week. From England, Horace Walpole wrote to Madame du Defont, I have received the memoirs of Beaumarchais. I am in the midst of the third, and it amuses me very much. The man is exceedingly adroit, reasons well, and has a great deal of wit. His jests are often excellent, but he is too pleased with himself. Now I understand how, given the present state of affairs in your country, this case creates such a great sensation. I forgot to tell you my horror at the administration of justice among your people. Is there a country in the world where Madame Guzman would not have been severely punished? The deposition is a frightful piece of impudence. Are people allowed to lie and contradict themselves in this frantic manner? What has become of this creature and her black godly husband? Tell me, I beg you. The blind Marquise, who saw more than most people with normal sight, did not live long enough to give a complete answer to this question. If she had survived the revolution, she would have been able to tell him that on the 7th Thermidor, Annas II, two days before the fall of Robespierre, Guzman was brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal, condemned and executed with André Chénier, the Marquis de Montalembert, and others for having become an enemy of the people, or more definitely, for complicity in the alleged conspiracy in Saint-Lazare prison. Madame Guzman survived the terror and lived on into the 19th century, she fell on evil days, and had it not been for the timely and generous help of Beaumarchais, she would have become utterly destitute. At his death, she figures among the hopeless debtors for a sum of several thousands of francs, with Restif de la Breton, Dora, Devenot de Morand, and many others. On the 22nd December, towards seven o'clock in the evening, Beaumarchais was summoned to be questioned at the bar of the court. He confesses to a momentary misgiving on being admitted to that august assembly of sixty judges, whose eyes were all turned upon him. But the organ of veneration was not highly developed in him, and he soon recovered, if he ever lost, his composure. By clever manoeuvring, he seized the direction of the debate from the outset and transformed the defendant's bench into a tribune from which he addressed the whole country. Carried away by his own eloquence, he gave a President Nicolai occasion to rebuke and remind him of the gulf between him and his judges, but he boldly questioned the propriety of his ruling, resisted the police officers who attempted to remove him, and, calling the nation to witness the violence done him, tried to create a riot against the Parlement in the palace itself. Then, suddenly making his submission to his judges, he fell on his knees and humbly boxed their ears. Yet he continually sang the praises of the French magistrature, leaving it to the public to discover the deadly thorns among the roses he showered upon the guardians of the law. Whilst that section of society, which thought only of pleasure, excitement, and highly seasoned scandal, was delighted by his malice no less than by his gaiety, the serious people who looked with foreboding to the future were struck by his courage and ability, and soon began to number him among those daring and energetic spirits who were to build the new state. 
They, like Napoleon later, recognised in him a forerunner of the revolution. Long before the end of the case, it became fairly clear that Beaumarchais, in spite of his denials, had certainly expected something more than audiences as a result of his gift to Madame Gersman. On the other hand, it was equally clear that Gersman knew of his wife's venality and had supported her false testimony by forgery and subornation. It was impossible to strike the one party without condemning the other. The court pronounced judgment on the 26th February 1774, condemning Beaumarchais and Madame Gersman to blame, a conviction which carried infamy and civil degradation. It afterwards transpired that Beaumarchais had escaped the pillory, branding and the galleys by a majority of only six votes. Gersman was deprived of his office. The day following the decree, the memoirs of Beaumarchais were condemned to be publicly burnt, but all Europe had read and made merry over them, and he found himself the most popular man in France. The judgment was no sooner pronounced than all Paris, following the lead of the Prince de Conti and the Duc de Chartres, called upon him to enter their names in his visitor's book, and the public enthusiasm for the condemned man led Monsieur de Sartine to say to him, it is not enough to be blamed, it is also necessary to be modest. But Beaumarchais was too good a judge of affairs to minimise for long the gravity of the sentence passed upon him. His ruin was complete. The Parlement Maupou, however, did not long survive its triumph. In condemning Beaumarchais, it dealt a mortal blow at its own existence. After the sentence, the opposition became more violent than ever, and on the death of Louis XV, one of the first acts of his successor was to re-establish the former Parlement. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Zanzil. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 15 Chapter 15 Concerning Mademoiselle Willermaula and the Third Marriage of Beaumarchais in spite of his fame and popularity, Beaumarchais was too clear-sighted a judge of affairs to blind himself to his almost desperate situation. But he was, as Carlyle justly called him, a tough, indomitable man, and life had taught him that the hopeful outlook is just as likely to be true as the hopeless, so why despair? Not least among the circumstances which enabled him to meet this ill fortune with habitual cheerfulness were the frankly offered sympathy and affection of a young and brilliant woman. His celebrity, writes Goudin of this episode in his friend's career, attracted to him a woman endowed with a tender heart and a firm character, well fitted to sustain him in the cruel trials which were yet to fall to his lot. She did not know him, but the moving appeal of his memoirs found an echo in her soul. She ardently desired to meet him. I was with him when, on the pretext of a keen interest in music, she sent a mutual acquaintance to beg Beaumarchais to lend her his harp for a few minutes. Such a request, under such circumstances, sufficiently revealed her motive. Beaumarchais understood her. Responding to her wishes, he said, I never lend my harp, but if she would care to join us, I could have the pleasure of hearing her, and she could hear me play. She came. I was a witness to their first interview. As I have already observed, it was difficult to meet Beaumarchais without loving him. What an impression he was bound to make, with all Paris resounding with his praise, and regarding him as at once the defender of the liberty of the people, and the revenger for the wrongs under which they had suffered. It was still more difficult to resist the charm of the eyes, the voice, the bearing, the conversation of this young lady, and this attraction which the one and the other exerted on all who met them was confirmed and strengthened, the better one knew them. From that moment their hearts were united by a tie nothing could break, and which love, esteem, confidence, time, and the law rendered indissoluble. This accomplished and enterprising young lady was Marie-Thérèse Amélie Willermaula, known in society as Mademoiselle de Villiers. 
Her father was a Swiss of good family, who had settled in Lille, where, at twenty-six years of age, he had married Marie-Thérèse Werquin. Wheeler Maula occupied a confidential position in the service of the Marquis de Troubrezé, Grand Master of the Ceremonies to Louis Gains, and it was in the mansion of that nobleman that the future Madame de Beaumarchais was born on the 14th November, 1751. Her mother died at 24 years of age in 1756, and her father a year later at 31. At the time of her first acquaintance with Beaumarchais, Mademoiselle Wheeler Mala was 23 years old. Rather above the middle height, with a lithe and well-poised figure, all who met her were at once struck by the dignity and even self-assurance of her bearing, an impression soon tempered, however, by the good-natured mockery, seldom absent from the lively blue eyes beneath her finely arched brows. She had a wealth of auburn hair, a radiant complexion, and an adorable mouth, if we are to believe the testimony of those who knew her, such as Goudin, Gentil Bernard, Dr. Melchior Meig of Neuchâtel, familiarly known in her letters as Frédéric, whose affection she reciprocated after the death of her bon Pierre, and many other more or less demonstrative admirers. Her correspondence further reveals the fact that she was always frankly proud of the beauty of her throat and the shapeliness of her form. In spite of the promptitude of her capitulation to Beaumarchais, she was actually of a rather reserved nature and slow to make friends. Upright and amenable at heart, loyal, affectionate, and indulgent towards the weaknesses of others, she was a man's woman, and with the notable exception of Madame Dujard, a translator of Sappho, the devoted friend of her widowhood, she did not, as a rule, get on well with other women. Nature she says in a self-portrait, has endowed me with a courage, a strength, a gaiety of character, and a sort of instinctive everyday philosophy, which suffices for all my needs and finds me prepared for all those events which come to spoil the present and the future. In society she was gay, witty, and skeptical, but though she was clever enough to conceal the fact, she confesses to having had little sympathy with the excessive freedom of thought and speech characteristic of many of her husband's guests. She realized, as Beaumarchais never did, the bad form of this sort of talk. Besides, if there is one kind of bore more insufferable than the religious bore, it is surely the aggressively irreligious variety. For the rest, the opinions of those around her had very little influence upon her. She never had the least hesitation in saying exactly what she thought, and sharply rebuked her, good Pierre, on at least one occasion when his natural petulance betrayed him into contributing a foolish and blasphemous letter to the Journal de Paris. Even the cleverest people have their moments of stupidity. With all her good qualities, no woman was ever more conscious of her own shortcomings, though she was spared the crowning misfortune of diffidence, so commonly the lot of those with the faculty of seeing themselves as others see them. She gaily confessed to employing cosmetics artful aid to heighten her charms, and she never succeeded in curing herself of weakness for snuff. Extremely unmethodical, she hated every interference with her liberty, from whatever cause. Her temper was easily aroused, and to lose control of it, as she admits she sometimes did, was one of the bitterest humiliations of her life. Like all people of a lively temperament, she was subject to fits of deep depression, and was inclined to hypochondria, yet she never failed to meet every danger and difficulty in a life full of vicissitudes with the most amazing courage and resourcefulness. Her judgment in literature and the arts was sound. She was an accomplished musician and a brilliant conversationalist, while her letters provide a shrewd and idiomatic commentary on the events of her time and show critical acumen much worldly wisdom, and literary ability of no mean order. Mademoiselle wheeler Mala soon convinced Beaumarchais that he could not hope to find a more agreeable companion to share his life. They were not married, however, until the 8th March, 1786, Beaumarchais being 54, and his wife 35, although she was always genuinely under the impression that she was two years younger than was actually the case. In a letter to her, dated the 24th August of the same year, her husband says, This marriage was the most serious and deliberate act of my life. 
Seeing that they had been lovers for 12 years and their daughter Eugenie had supervened, it must be conceded that in his second adjective he had found the exact word. It is only fair to add, however, that Beaumarchais could be relieved of the consequences of the sentence depriving him of civil rights, including that of marriage, only by the prompt reversal of the judgment against him, or by the personal intervention of the king. This may very well have been the actual reason for the procrastination in regularizing his union with Mademoiselle wheeler maula If this fact had occurred to his apologist, they would not, perhaps, have made such a mystery of the circumstances attending the third marriage of Beaumarchais and the birth of his daughter, Eugenie. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaii in November 2021. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter 16 On Secret Service. Although Louis XV had been not a little amused by the Beaumarchais pamphlets, he was much irritated by the public clamour which had arisen out of the case, and strictly charged the lieutenant of police, M. de Sartine, to see that for the future no more was heard of this irrepressible litigant. But, luckily for Beaumarchais, the king had been greatly impressed by the ability he had displayed in the conduct of the lawsuit. It so happened that at this moment, the first of many odd coincidences in this bewildering drama, Thévenot de Morand, the head of a notorious gang of professional blackmailers, from his safe retreat in London, threatened the quasi-domesticity of Madame du Barry with the publication of a work bearing the fetching title of Mémoire d'une femme publique, which purported to be a veracious account of the errors of her youth. The author had contrived to bring a copy of his book under the personal notice of his intended victim, as a delicate hint that she might possibly think it expedient to persuade his most Christian majesty to pay for the suppression of the whole edition. When the favourite consulted him on the matter, Louis thought that the simple course would be to obtain an extradition warrant from the English government against the libeller, and, when they had him in their power, commit him to a castle of oblivion, to use Montesquieu's phrase, for the rest of his days. His Britannic Majesty's government, however, proved too squeamish to accede to his request, but promised not to oppose the arrest of the blackmailer if it could be carried out secretly and neatly by the French police. But Morand was on the alert, and immediately stirred up the English press in his favour, by coolly representing himself as a harmless political refugee who was being persecuted by the minions of an oppressor of liberty. That was more than enough, and the officers sent to kidnap him narrowly escaped being pitched into the Thames by a furious mob which had flown to the aid of the outlaw. Having won this preliminary encounter, Morand caused it to be known in the French court that three thousand copies of his book were in print, and ready for distribution among the French, English, German, and Dutch booksellers. Now thoroughly alarmed, the king commissioned the Comte de Lauraguet and other persons of some note to proceed to London and enter into negotiations with Morand, with a view of frustrating the threatened blow. But all their efforts proved unsuccessful. At this juncture, Louis suddenly remembered some words said to him by Laborde, the court banker, in commendation of Beaumarchais, with whom he was on terms of intimacy. Your friend, said the king when Laborde was summoned to his presence, is reputed to have great talent as a negotiator. If he could carry out secretly and successfully a matter in which I am interested, his own affair might be settled according to his wishes. Laborde at once explained the situation to Beaumarchais, and indicated the nature of the service required of him as the price of his rehabilitation. Beaumarchais promptly undertook the mission. Indeed, he asked for nothing better. But the difficulty was how to get away without arousing suspicion, 
for it was obviously of the utmost importance it should not become known that the king was employing in a confidential capacity a man whom the law had just branded as a felon. Beaumarchais had no sooner determined on his plan than persistent rumours began to circulate in Paris that the popular hero was being subjected to fresh persecutions, and was threatened, at almost any moment, with arrest. Immediately after came the news of his flight. This was contrived by the Prince de Conti and the Prince de Ligne, to whom he had recourse in his well-simulated terror. Both these noblemen were at the time completely duped, though the latter recovered his perspicacity soon after the event. As for the faithful Goudin, to the end of his life he never suspected the hoax. The Prince de Ligne, later, gave his version of his share in this transaction as follows. I was requested by Monsieur le Prince de Conti to meet Beaumarchais under an extinguished street lamp at the corner of the Rue Colbert, and conduct him in a hackney coach as far as Bourget, whence I sent him in one of my own carriages to my agent in Ghent, who facilitated his crossing to England. This extraordinary man pretended that without our help he would be arrested, and yet eight days later he was back in the private apartments of Louis XV, who had sent him on a secret mission, and by this ruse he put us off the scent. End quote. When Figaro, a few years later, was to declare in his free and easy way that intrigue and politics are near relations, it is clear that his creator knew what he was talking about. For the purposes of his mission, Beaumarchais concealed his identity under an anagram of his original surname and passed as the Chevalier de Ronac. On reaching London, he sought out the Comte de Lauraguet, and the pair at once called upon Morand. After much haggling, Beaumarchais finally agreed to recommend the king to accept the blackmailer's terms, namely 20,000 livres, say 800 pounds, down, and a pension of 4,000 livres, say 160 pounds, a year, so long as he kept his tongue and, above all, his pen in order. Thus, within eight days of leaving Paris, Beaumarchais, as we have seen, was back at Versailles to report substantial progress. Upon hearing the suggested terms, Louis jibbed, but eventually compromised for a single payment of 32,000 livres, say 1,200 pounds, for the complete destruction of all copies of the accursed thing. Beaumarchais rushed off to England again with the revised terms, which he had undertaken to get the blackmailer to accept. On rejoining Morand, Beaumarchais says he gave him a little fatherly advice, and then, by an adroit combination of threats if he persisted in his criminal courses, and promises of generous treatment if he turned over a new leaf, persuaded him not only to accept the proffered terms and to burn the whole edition of the work in his presence, but enlisted him, there and then, into the secret service of his country, thereby, as he quaintly expresses in his Memoire au Roi, converting a skilful poacher into an excellent gamekeeper. With almost unparalleled impudence, Moron's gazetier Curassé informs us in a note, dated 3rd of May, 1774, that the Holocaust took place on the 27th of April, in a brick kiln in the parish of St. Pancras, and that the writer, Morand himself, had seen, with his own eyes, the sum of 32,000 livres paid in conclusion of the transaction. Well pleased with the unqualified success of his mission, Beaumarchais hurried home to receive the promised reward for his services. But what was his dismay to find that Louis was dangerously ill, and, when this singularly inopportune malady was quickly followed by the monarch's still more untimely death, the unfortunate Beaumarchais saw all his hope dashed at one blow to the ground, and his longed-for rehabilitation farther off than ever, for the austere young king would, he feared, set an extremely modest estimate upon services rendered in the interest of such a reputation as that enjoyed by Madame du Barry. His apprehension proved only too well founded. Louis the Sixteenth intimated that he proposed entirely to ignore his claim. The singularity of my fate, he wrote when still staggering under this blow, fills me with wonder. 
If only the king had preserved his health for eight days longer, I should have been restored to the position which had been wickedly snatched from me. I had his royal word for it. There was nothing to be done but to start all over again. He lost no time in offering his services to the new king. But both Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette had been most disagreeably impressed by his conduct in the Guesman case. On hearing of the judgment, the new monarch had been heard to say, A good thing, too, adding a few still more uncomplimentary remarks. Whilst Weber, in his Memoir Concernant Marie Antoinette, reports that, at the time of the lawsuit, the young queen, in allusion to Beaumarchais, made the significant observation to the Princesse de Tarente, The man whose malice makes people laugh is not necessarily wicked, but the man whose deliberate aim is to make others weep is really wicked. I have read enough of Beaumarchais and never wish to read him again. It is a humiliating trait of human nature to find something not altogether displeasing in the minor misfortunes of our neighbours, and we may be sure that the disparaging words spoken by the king and queen were not long in reaching the ears of Beaumarchais. He promptly composed a witty song, addressed to Marie Antoinette, entitled Repentance, which the Vicomtesse de Castellan undertook to present to her royal mistress, who, however, remained firm and refused to look at it. Under these circumstances he could be under no illusions as to the fear and dislike he had inspired in the new sovereigns. Nevertheless, his case was so desperate that when his overtures were peremptorily declined, he instantly set about devising some means of making himself useful, in the hope of receiving from Louis the Sixteenth what death had prevented him from obtaining at the hands of his grandfather. In the scramble for office, which then marked the beginning of a new reign, Monsieur de Sartine was threatened with the loss of his post. Beaumarchais, ever on the alert, was one of the first to get wind of this intrigue, and at once seized on it to further his designs. He gave the anxious lieutenant of police to understand that if ever he wanted him, he was always at his disposal. Six weeks after the accession of Louis the Sixteenth to the throne, Monsieur de Sartine reported that he had received information respecting the preparation in London of a fresh libelous publication, this time directed against the Queen. It was one of several defamatory pamphlets in a list supplied by Morand and was entitled Dissertation extraite d'un plus grand ouvrage ou avis important à la branche espagnole succédera à la couronne de France à défaut d'héritier, et qui peut être mesme très utile à toute la famille de Bourbon, surtout au roi Louis XVI, géant à Paris. 1774. He stated that the work was of the most infamous character and that it was necessary at all costs to get it destroyed. It was written, he said, by an Italian Jew, oddly named Guillaume Angelucci, who in England was known as William Hatkinson. The blackmailer's plans were completed for the issue of two editions in London and Amsterdam, respectively. Monsieur de Sartine sought the king's sanction for the employment of Beaumarchais as the only man capable of repelling the attack. After some demure and with the utmost reluctance, Louis agreed to the proposal, and Beaumarchais, hurrying his preparations, was able to fix his departure for the 26th of June. But having been once disappointed, he was not satisfied with a mere verbal commission. To ensure the success of his mission, he must have a written acknowledgment, signed and sealed, of his appointment as the accredited agent of the king, and, in order that there might be no mistake, he himself submitted a draft of the phrasing he desired, even down to the words, Signé Louis. Without this precaution, he said, it was very doubtful whether his enterprise could be successful, and his failure, as he was careful to point out to Monsieur de Sartine, might have very disagreeable results for the lieutenant of police. In that case, he wrote, you may expect to see your credit weakened, to be quickly followed by your fall. And I? Well, I shall become just what it pleases the fate which appears to dog my steps. At first, Louis flatly declined to give the written acknowledgment. 
but in the end the importunate emissary carried his point and the king signed the commission as originally suggested by his agent and caused it to be forwarded to him in london beaumarchais immediately had the document encased in a gold frame and suspended it round his neck by a chain of the same metal not forgetting to inform louis that he intended to wear it over his heart and would part with it only with life itself from the moment he reached london all we know of his movements is contained in an amazing recital of the episode in two letters addressed to his friends roudil and goudin respectively and a report addressed to the king dated fifteenth october seventeen seventy four upon his return to france with such sidelights as will appear later adventures are to the imaginative and beaumarchais as we know had an extraordinary faculty for investing every incident of his career with the glamour of romantic drama but although we all like to believe the most entertaining story best there are limits to the credulity of even the most complacent reader which no writer can afford to ignore a traveller in an unknown country may have to accept as his guide a man who presents dubious credentials but he will follow him with a watchful eye to his bearings and a suspicious mind for the incidents of the journey beaumarchais has only himself to blame if his evasions and prevarications compel us rigorously to scrutinize the vainglorious and in some respects incredible narrative which he has seen fit to give out as a voracious account of his adventures on secret service end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. Chapter Seventeen: Beaumarchais and the Brigands of Leichtenholz. More fortunate than any one else had been, Beaumarchais experienced no difficulty in getting into touch with the elusive Hebrew of the incongruous names, and in an autograph letter, brought to light by M. Lantillac, addressed to the king under cover to M. de Sardine, he is able to report, This Sunday, July, 1774, I have seen the manuscript, I have read it, and have even been able to make an abstract of it. This advantage was obtained by offering fifty guineas to have it clandestinely conveyed to me for a few hours. I thought it expedient to begin in this way, for the work might have been merely a spiteful ineptitude not worth troubling about. In that case, I should have come back at once. The manuscript was brought to me secretly at Vauxhall Gardens last night, on condition that I returned it by five o'clock in the morning, an intrigue I set going among valets which served me rather well. Returning to my lodging, I read it, made a summary of it, and about four o'clock in the morning, upon a prearranged signal, I opened the window of my parlour, looking out on to the Marlebone Road, and threw the packet to the man who had delivered it to me. Appended to this report is a detailed analysis of the pamphlet. Having thus assured himself of the gravity of the threat to the young queen, he interviewed Guillaume Angelucci, alias William Hatkinson, and soon won him over as he had done Morand, and within a few days of his reaching London the payment of a sum of fourteen hundred pounds procured him the pleasure of superintending the burning of the English edition of the offensive brochure with his english valet who it will be useful to remember new german he next accompanied the jew to amsterdam in order to destroy the dutch edition this good work being satisfactorily accomplished beaumarchais dismissed angelucci hatkinson with the fruits of his industry and took the opportunity of making a tour of the art galleries and libraries of amsterdam by way of relaxation but this accursed israelite had tricked him by surreptitiously holding back one copy of the pamphlet with which he fled to nuremberg where it was said he intended to print editions in french and italian i am like a raging lion wrote beaumarchais to m de sartine i have no money but i have diamonds and jewellery i shall sell all that i have and with fury in my heart take to post-chasing again I do not know German. I have no idea of my way, but I have got a good map, from which I see I am going to Nimwegen, Cleves, Düsseldorf, Cologne, Frankfurt, Mayence, and lastly to Nuremberg. I shall travel night and day if I do not fall with fatigue by the way. 
Curses on the abominable wretch who makes me journey another three or four hundred leagues after everything was settled, and I hope to have earned a rest. If I overtake him, I shall strip him of his papers and kill him for all the trouble and anxiety he has caused me. Immediately after writing these words, the father of Figaro dashed off in pursuit of the son of Israel. Fortunately, he knew not only the route his quarry had taken, but the town he was making for and his intentions when he got there. How he came by this knowledge he does not explain. To do so might have taken him a long time, and he was in a great hurry. At the entrance of a small wood a few miles from Neustadt, according to one statement of Beaumarchais, he saw a little man mounted on a pony trotting along the highway ahead of him. We thought as much. It was Angelucci, who, turning at that moment and recognising his pursuer, made off into the heart of a wood. Springing from his carriage with a pistol in his hand, Beaumarchais rushed after him. As the pony penetrated further into the forest, the Jew was forced to slacken his pace, and Beaumarchais, overtaking him, seized him by the heel of his boot, pulled him from the saddle, and compelled him to ransack his valise and produce the famous pamphlet. Thinking his last hour had come, Angelucci pleaded so hard for his life that Beaumarchais not only spared him, but restored to him a portion of the money he had previously given him and let him go free. He then retraced his steps towards the carriage, but he had scarcely dismissed Angelucci when he was attacked by two bandits, one of whom, armed with a long knife, demanded his purse or his life. Beaumarchais immediately fired, but his pistol failed to go off. Meanwhile, the other ruffian had stolen up behind him and knocked him down, whilst the man with a knife darted in and stabbed at his chest. Happily, the blade, deflected by the gold case containing the royal commission, slid upwards, only slightly wounding his neck and deeply cutting his chin. Struggling to his feet, he snatched the knife from his first assailant, badly wounding his hand in doing so, and succeeded in throwing him to the earth, and then partly bound him with a view of bringing him to justice. But the other, who had at first fled, now returned with reinforcements, and it might have gone ill with Beaumarchais had it not been for the timely arrival of his lackey and an equally opportune blast of his postillion's horn which put the brigands to flight. That, in brief, is one story, and if we do not like it, Beaumarchais offers us another, two or three more, in fact. To Conrad Gruber, landlord of the Red Cock Inn at Nuremberg, he told the tale embodied in the official report as forwarded to headquarters by Chief Postal Superintendent Feser. This interesting document is as follows. Nuremberg, 18th August, 1774. At nine o'clock in the morning, I was called to the Red Cock Inn and learned that a French gentleman named de Ronac had arrived there last night and in the presence of the Baron von Nietzsche, an officer of the Royal Poland Regiment, lodging there, and the host of the said inn, Konrad Gruber, showed two recent wounds, one in the left hand and the other in the chin, as also bloodstains on his clothes, stating that yesterday in broad daylight, between three and four o'clock in the afternoon, he was attacked by highway robbers about a league before reaching Neustadt, under the following circumstances. Getting down from his carriage near a fir wood, he told his servant to drive on slowly and himself advanced a short distance into the wood, when he saw coming towards him a man on horseback, followed by another on foot. The first threw himself upon him and dealt him a deadly blow in the chest with a long knife, which, deflected by an order or portrait he carried suspended round his neck by a gold chain, merely wounded his chin and bruised his chest, and thus gave him an opportunity of snatching the weapon away with his left hand, cutting his fingers to the bone in doing so. During the struggle, the man on foot coming from behind tried to seize him, but he had the good fortune to master and throw him to the ground, at the same time drawing his pocket pistol, which had already put the horseman to flight. The man on foot threw himself on his knees, begging for mercy. The horseman, in his flight, had lost his hat and wig, which permitted Monsieur Ronac to see that he had black hair. As his carriage was still some distance away and he thought he saw several more people in the wood, he had, whilst thanking God for saving him, set this second assailant free and regained his carriage with all speed. These two ruffians, he thought, had every appearance of being Jews, and he has, he says, described them to the life in the following written statement. In a fir wood about a league before reaching Neustadt, Monsieur de Ronac was attacked by two men, one of whom, armed with a hilted knife, is about five feet, two inches in height, of slight build, with a long, lean face, aquiline nose, and big, black, forbidding eyes, and a very yellow complexion. He has black hair under a round, blonde wig. 
He wears a blue riding coat of English make with brass buttons, a red waistcoat, leather breeches and top boots. He looks like a Jew. His companion called him Angelucci. He rides a brown bay pony with a white mark down the entire front of its head. The second is tall, wearing a grey vest without sleeves and carrying a blue coat over his arm and a big hat without brim. He has rather a white complexion, fair hair and round face. His companion, on seeing him thrown to the ground by Monsieur de Ronac, called him Hackinson. Fizer added that he begged Monsieur de Ronac to accompany him to his head office to make his deposition in person, but he excused himself on account of the urgency of his business in Vienna, asking that all further inquiries or information might be addressed to him at the Poste Restante, Vienna. In spite of his hurry to get away, however, Beaumarchais was obliged to appear before the burgomaster and repeat his deposition before that worthy, who in his turn forwarded his report on the matter to headquarters. As this statement is a repetition in brief of a postal superintendent's evidence, we will only quote the exordium which is too good to miss. With an impudence worthy of Figaro himself, Monsieur de Ronac suggests that the authorities should keep a sharp watch at all the gates of a town in order that these men may, if possible, be arrested, in which case Her Imperial Majesty should be immediately informed, for the Empress would take the keenest interest in this news. The foregoing documents are sufficiently damaging to the credibility of a royal emissary's narrative, but worse is to come. On his arrival at Nuremberg, we might think he would take his postillion's advice to rest for a few days and have his wounds properly dressed. Not at all. He must press forward to Ratisbon with the least possible delay. He had no sooner dismissed the postillion at Emskirchen, however, than he became aware of a fact that the jolting of a post-chaise caused him a great deal of pain. In fact, he could scarcely breathe because of the oppression in his chest, which had suddenly grown intolerable. So as soon as he struck the Danube, he decided to continue his journey by boat. This course had the advantage of withdrawing him from the indiscreet inquiries of officialdom. Besides, he had told the story so often that sooner or later some unconsidered trifle was bound to trip him up. On the voyage, he beguiled the time by writing the letters to Rudal and Goudin, already referred to, exhorting them to read selected passages to all his friends, male and female. He reached Vienna without further mishap. Meanwhile, the honest postillion on his way home to Langenfeld was very much exercised in his mind over the strange behaviour of his late fare, both before and after the alleged attack by brigands. The more he thought about it, the less he liked it. He really did not know what to make of it. On reaching Neustadt, therefore, he sought out the authorities and made the following declaration. Received at Neustadt on the Eich, 14th August, 1774, at about six o'clock in the evening. Appearing before the officer of a bailiwick, the postillion attached to the station of Langenfeld, immediately upon his return from Emskirchen, Johann Georg Dratz, who states that, This afternoon he drove to Emskirchen a traveller, whose name he does not know, but who might have been seen passing here at about four o'clock. He was an Englishman, knowing no German, driving in a private two-wheeled carriage, accompanied by a servant who understands German. He is not sure whether this gentleman is in his right senses, nor what is the matter with him, but he thinks it his duty to relate what happened to him with this traveller. On the other side of Diebach, a hamlet between Langenfeld and Neustadt, deponent, on turning round, noticed the stranger stand up and take from his trunk what looked like a toilet set and draw out a mirror and a razor. He thought it strange that the gentleman should wish to shave whilst the chaise was in motion. After passing Diebach, when entering the wood called Leichtenholz, the traveller, ordering him to stop, got down and walked towards the middle of a wood, carrying a Spanish cane in his hand and telling his servant to order him to drive on slowly. He could not understand why the gentleman should want to go into the heart of the wood unless it was to amuse himself by shooting, but then he took no firearm with him. The deponent wished soon to stop, but was told by the servant to go on, which he did very slowly, as far as the extreme limit of a Leichtenholz, and the traveller not returning, they waited there for about half an hour. 
At this moment, there passed across the highway from the wood three carpenter's mates coming home from work with their axes over their shoulders and their tool bags on their backs, and soon afterwards the gentleman emerged from among the trees with his hand wrapped in a white handkerchief. He told his servant, and the latter repeated it to witness in German, that he had seen some bandits, but the deponent replied to the servant that perhaps his master had seen the carpenter's mates and had mistaken them for bandits. The traveller thereupon resumed his place in the carriage and ordered him to proceed. Whilst traversing the town a little above the hospital, the gentleman lowered the window of the carriage and, through the opening, the deponent noticed that the handkerchief enveloping the traveller's hand was stained with blood, and that there was also a little blood on the left side of his neck and on his cravat, and having asked him what it was, he replied that he had been fired on. The deponent thereupon wished to report here in order that the gentleman might make his deposition, but he would not hear of it, ordering him to push on to Emskirchen. On reaching this town, the traveller repeated to the postmaster that he had been attacked by brigands, but did not wish to show his wounds or make a formal declaration. On the contrary, he set out with all speed for Nuremberg. He thinks that the gentleman must have wounded himself with a razor, which he had taken with him into the wood, and might make trouble at Nuremberg in such a way as to give this route a bad name, especially as the mail was lately held up by robbers near Possenheim, and make it appear that this road is not safe since travellers were attacked in broad daylight. The deponent states that neither in nor near the Leichtenholz did he see anyone except the three carpenters' mates, and that he noticed absolutely nothing which could lead him to believe in the presence of malefactors, and that he had heard nothing whatever of the alleged shot. As for the wounds, the gentleman would not let him or the postmaster at Emskirchen examine them, his hand was enveloped in a handkerchief, and as far as he could see, the wound on his neck was quite an insignificant scratch, which did not bleed much. The reader is now in full possession of the evidence on both sides. The discussion of this subject has revealed among contemporary and modern French and German writers an extraordinary diversity of opinion, from the artless credulity of Goudin and the slightly hesitating confidence of de Lomenie to the open mistrust of Bettelheim and Huot whilst M. Lantillac, the most painstaking and thorough of modern apologists, unable to ignore the researches of the censors, airily dismisses the escapade as a harmless practical joke in rather bad taste, but clings to the authenticity of the comic opera Jew. It is good for a biographer to be in complete sympathy with his subject, but it is also good for him to be on the alert against the cajolery of such a plausible hero as Beaumarchais often proved himself to be. For our part, we think Angelucci Hatkinson was the creature of an exuberant and undisciplined imagination, and that Beaumarchais, in spite of his cleverness, would have found it more difficult to refute the muddle-headed honesty of Postilion Tratz than to confound all the malignant cunning of Marin and his associates put together. Fortunately for him, he was not called upon to try, since he never knew of the existence of this testimony against him. Had he suspected that his antics in Germany and Austria would ever be subjected to so close a scrutiny, he might have taken more trouble to make it possible for us to believe him. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro, The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. A Mysterious Affair Monsieur de Ronac had no sooner reached Vienna than he made his presence in the capital known to the Empress Maria Theresa in a letter couched in the following terms. Madame, I beg your majesty to believe that I offer the highest proof of my respect even in failing to observe the prescribed method of approaching the royal presence only through the intermediary of the great. I have hurried night and day from the confines of Western Europe to communicate to your majesty certain matters affecting your happiness and peace of mind, which, I venture to say, will move you to the depths of your heart. Madame, 
your majesty will understand the importance of the secret by the very irregularity of the step I am taking. But your majesty will understand even better how urgent it is not to lose a moment in hearing me if I say that though I have been cruelly assailed and desperately wounded by brigands near Nuremberg, I have not delayed a moment in spite of my terrible sufferings, and that I reached Vienna by way of the Danube only because the excruciating pain of my wounds made it impossible for me to support the jolting of my carriage. If your majesty should think this letter from an unknown person attributable to the feverish delirium of a wounded man, I beg her, more in her own interest than in mine, graciously to send a person of confidence to me with the least possible delay. I will not divulge my business to him, for this I can do to your majesty alone, but I will tell him enough to enable me to obtain from your majesty a private and secret audience, of which neither your ministers nor our ambassador must have any knowledge whatever. I beg your majesty not to take it ill if I dare ask her to give the person she deigns to send a note signed by herself in such terms as these. Monsieur de Ronac may explain himself fully to the person who delivers this letter. He has the honor of being in my confidence. This precaution is necessary in order that I may be assured that my letter has fallen into no other hands than those of your imperial majesty. Whilst awaiting your orders at the Three Runners, St. Michael's Place, near the Palace, Vienna, I am, with the most respectful devotion, Madam, your imperial majesty's most humble and most obedient servant, de Ronek. Vienna, this 20th August 1774. So, on his own confession, he had hurried night and day from the confines of Western Europe, not to arrest the defaulting Israelite, but to make a communication to the Empress, affecting the honor of her daughter, Queen Marie Antoinette. This fact, in conjunction with the care he had taken when in London to engage a lackey who understood German, and, above all, his persistence in demanding from Louis XVI a personal written commission, which could be of no use to him in the negotiation for the suppression of the libel, but was an essential guarantee of his status in a foreign court serves only to strengthen the suspicion that he had, from the very first, planned to make this journey to Austria, Jew or no Jew, brigands or no brigands, in the hope of obtaining a secret interview with the Empress Maria Theresa solely with a view to securing her testimony as to the transcendent services he had performed on behalf of her daughter. The Empress, at once guessing that the stranger's business concerned Marie Antoinette, requested the Count von Seilern to find out what the writer wanted. Maria Theresa, having provided the Count with the stipulated autograph letter, he immediately sent for Beaumarchais. But the latter, seeing that his bait was taking, excused himself from at once answering the summons on account of illness caused through spitting blood from which he had suffered severely ever since his misfortune in the wood near Nuremberg. It will be noted that he had changed the nature of his malady. This was rendered necessary by the fact that his cuts had healed more rapidly than he had anticipated, and he now looked less like the dashing hero of an encounter with brigands than the pitiful exemplar of astonishingly incompetent shaving. Two hours later, however, Monsieur de Vronac had the honor of offering in person his respectful homage to His Excellency the Governor of Lower Austria.
The Count listened attentively whilst the interesting Frenchman told his tale in the vivid narrative style of which he was such a master. He spared no detail from the moment when his royal master honored him with a confidential mission to England and Holland, which, as luck would have it, also necessitated his journey to Vienna, to the almost fatal dagger thrust and his miraculous delivery from the hands of the cutthroats of the Lichtenholz. But at this point, he stopped abruptly. He was not at liberty to say more. The rest of his story could be related only to the Empress in person and alone, for it concerned Her Majesty the Queen of France. Time pressed, and he requested an immediate interview with the Empress, reinforcing his demand by allowing Silern to glance at the precious royal commission in its gold case, still twisted and damaged by the assassin's knife. By his own avowal, he had hitherto made no use of the royal authority, and this was also the first occasion on which he had revealed his identity." The pair now proceeded to the palace at Schoenbrunn, the Count to present his report, and Monsieur de Ronac to be at hand if wanted. The latter was almost immediately admitted to the royal presence. The Empress received him very graciously, and for three and a half hours listened to the animated narrative of the adventures and sufferings of this intrepid champion of her daughter's fair name. Monsieur de Ronac, at Maria Theresa's request, then read the unique example of the shameful monograph which, as he was careful to tell her, he had procured at the peril of his life and earnestly besought her to secure the arrest of the horrid Jew who was the cause of all the mischief and had now, he had reason to believe, fled to Venice, his native town. On the completion of the reading, the Empress expressed a wish to retain the document in order to consider her best course of action, a desire which, under the circumstances, Beaumarchais was in no doubt right in interpreting as a command. On the termination of the interview, therefore, he left the brochure with her, and appears never to have seen it again. Maria Theresa's opinion of the libel is preserved for us in a letter addressed to Mercy Argento, her ambassador at the Court of France, immediately after the interview with Beaumarchais. This communication, which appears to have escaped other writers on this subject, most of whom expressed their doubt that the Empress ever saw the pamphlet in its entirety, if at all, is in the following terms. Nothing more atrocious has ever been published. It fills my heart with the utmost contempt for this nation, devoid alike of religion, morals, and feelings. Her intemperate language will perhaps be thought pardonable in a mother when we explain the nature of the treatise. The cardinal point of the writer's argument was that Marie Antoinette, being convinced from her intimate knowledge of the king's abnormal temperament that he would never have children, was nevertheless animated by a keen desire to keep the throne in the event of his death. To this end, boldly asserted the pamphleteer, quote, this ambitious and pleasure-loving woman will flinch from nothing, end quote. He therefore urged all claimants to the succession of the French throne, and especially Louis XVI himself, quote, to be aware of the resolute and abominable stratagems of the Austrian woman. Remember whose daughter she is, and that in the absence of other counselors, the latter, Maria Theresa, will be her ablest accomplice in such machinations, end quote. Now, it is our conviction that Maria Theresa had instantly made up her mind that the treatise which the enigmatical Frenchman had read was a unique copy, and, having deliberately bluffed him into giving it up to her, had no intention whatever of relinquishing it. Beaumarchais, we think, had failed to foresee that the Empress would want to keep it, and he thus found himself deprived of the only tangible proof he could bring to Monsieur de Sartine of the successful accomplishment of his mission, nor, under the circumstances, could he formally ask for its return.
When, at last, he realized this, he wrote a long letter to the empress expressing great repugnance to the submitting of the pamphlet in its entirety to so young and inexperienced a man as Louis XVI, and urged her to place facilities in his way to print a single copy, which he himself undertook to expurgate of all malevolent insinuations against the young queen." On the firm refusal of Maria Theresa to entertain such a suggestion, Beaumarchais returned again and again to the charge in letter after letter to Count Van Sylern. This persistence in asking to be allowed to falsify the document we consider to have been merely a ruse to obtain a copy to replace the one he had lost, but it forms the principal evidence of Messrs. Hewitt, Fournier, and others for accusing Beaumarchais himself of the authorship of the libel, and these writers are of the opinion that in reading it to the Empress he was frightened at the import of the charges he had brought against Marie. Antoinette, and hoped by this means to secure an opportunity of destroying the original and substituting the expurgated copy. It is but fair to add that von Arneth, who claims to be the only modern author who had examined the treatise in detail, hesitatingly acquits Beaumarchais of this charge on the ground of insufficient evidence." The imperial chancellor, Prince von Kaunitz, into whose hands the affair now passed, had no such irresolution. This astute diplomat had been in Paris at the time of the Gozman trial, and knew the man with whom he had to deal. Having received Silent's account of the interview with the empress, carefully examined the evidence of the postilion Dratz and Chief Superintendent Fezzer, and, having failed after the most exhaustive inquiries to discover anybody who had seen either the wandering Jew or the elusive brigands, he quickly decided that the Frenchman was an impostor and had shamefully duped his imperial mistress. The result was that Monsieur de Ronac had scarcely reached his lodgings after what what he considered a second most satisfactory interview with the empress, who had elated him by expressing some concern for his health that Silern's secretary presented himself, accompanied by two officers and eight grenadiers with fixed bayonets, intimating that until further orders he must consider himself a prisoner of state. His valise, with all his papers, and the famous gold case containing the king's autograph were all taken from him and sealed in his presence. With some dignity, Beaumarchais protested vigorously against this outrage on the person of a royal messenger, which, he asserted, might have very disagreeable consequences to those responsible for it. But all his heroics were in vain. He was kept a close prisoner for 31 days. Indeed, we can scarcely doubt that his sagacity in obtaining the signature of Louis to his commission alone saved him from spending the remainder of his days in an Austrian prison. Meanwhile, the undoubted authenticity of the king's mandate moved Kaunitz to write immediately to de Sartine to inquire what should be done with his prisoner. After some delay, the lieutenant of police, deeming it imprudent to disavow his agent, put the best face on a difficult situation by acknowledging that Beaumarchais was his man, defended his mysterious actions, and requested that he might be at once released and allowed to return to Paris. Thereupon, Kaunitz gracefully took upon himself all responsibility for the unfortunate misunderstanding, though it is perfectly clear that he firmly adhered to the original opinion he had formed of this amazing adventure. It seems to me in this business, he wrote to Mercy Argento on the 20th September, that apart from his notorious moral laxity, Monsieur de Sartine may have some personal interest in wishing to evade the well-founded reproaches which might be made against him for recommending to the king such a person as Monsieur de Beaumarchais for so delicate a mission, and that this may well be the principal reason which induced him not only to acknowledge this man, but even to undertake his defense." 
For the rest, he had no hesitation whatever in attributing the calumny to Beaumarchais himself, for supposing, he wrote further to Mercy Argento, that Beaumarchais is the author of the libel, as the whole history of his private life and his conduct throughout this affair might well lead us to suspect all that he claims to have done, as also the real motives of his actions and of the red ridiculous romance with which he has regaled us become as clear as daylight. On this supposition, in order to turn suspicion from himself of such a flagrant crime of lay majesty, what was more natural than that he should himself undertake the mission, or even, perhaps by some indirect means, get himself nominated for it? Having succeeded, he would, of course, try to turn it to his own advantage, and to this end, being an extremely clever storyteller, he fabricated, if not all, at least a great deal of his adventures in order to make it appear that he was a man whose energy, astuteness, and courage merited the highest reward." Even the almost impenetrable fog of his style is unable to obscure the lucidity of the Chancellor's reasoning. Assuming, as he says, that Beaumarchais was himself the author or the accomplice of the writer of the pamphlet, the mystery is explained from beginning to end. Before speeding his unwilling guest on his way home, Kaunitz suggested that it would be becoming in his royal mistress to accord Monsieur de Beaumarchais a salatium of a thousand ducats, about a thousand pounds. This the Frenchman indignantly refused. What did they take him for, an adventurer? He did not want money. All he wanted was to be dealt with according to his station, and they had treated him as though he were a foreign criminal. Him, the confidential agent of the king and queen of France, it was intolerable. At last, Kaunitz somewhat soothed his ruffled feelings by suggesting to the empress that he might buy a ring with the money, and that her imperial majesty would allow him to wear it as a reward for his distinguished services. Nor was Kaunitz by any means alone in viewing the character of Beaumarchais and the narrative of his adventures with profound mistrust. The following lampoon, in a hitherto unpublished manuscript, is doubtless one of many witty but scurrilous attacks made upon him at this time. Epitaphe du Baron de Ronac en Franconie Si J qui fut de bonne taille, qui savait danser et chanter, Faisait des vers vaille qui vaille et les savait bien réciter. Sa race, étant sans anticaille, ne pouvait des héros compter. Pourtant, il eût donné bataille si l'on avait voulu tâter. Il parlait fort bien de la guerre, des cieux, du globe, de la terre, du droit civil et droit canon, et connaissait assez les choses par leurs effets et par leurs causes. Était-il honnête homme? Ha! Non. A note at the foot of this pleasantry explains that the Baron de Ronac, being attacked by two robbers in the forest of Nuremberg, killed three of them. In conclusion, let us briefly recall the situation in which Beaumarchais found himself at the beginning of the new reign. It is well to remember in judging this episode that on his accession to the throne, Louis was twenty years old, whilst Marie Antoinette was nineteen, and with youthful downrightness they had both expressed their irreconcilable hostility to an exceptionally gifted man who had never done them any harm, and had just rendered to the their grandfather a notable service in which many others had failed. Moreover, this man was suffering under what he and vast numbers of cultured people at home and abroad considered a flagrant injustice, and, in the face of the sovereign's open ill will, the victim's whole future was irretrievably ruined. This man was one of the most audacious and original spirits of the century, and was no more overburdened with scruples than most of the men among whom he lived. Desperate cases call for desperate remedies, and we believe that constant brooding over his very real grievances at last betrayed him into resorting to the insidious arts of the blackmailer.
in Miranda, a very precious scoundrel whose one good point, so far as we have been able to discover, was his admirably clear and elegant handwriting, with whom he ever afterwards remained on the most intimate terms, he had a tool ready to his hand. What could be more natural, being the man he was, than that he should make use of the rascal's peculiar talents? We believe he did, and that with the probable connivance of de Sartine himself, they concocted the whole imbroglio between them, perhaps sharing the spoils. Remember that Beaumarchais was the creator of Figaro, the most ingenious intriguer in literature. A little more running to and fro on other people's affairs, exclaims Frota, the amusing but rascally valet in Turcaret. A few more worries and troubles, and I shall attain a state of ease and comfort. Then my mind will be at peace, and how happy and contented I shall be. There will be only my conscience to set at rest. It is but fair to add that Louis and Marie Antoinette appear to have been satisfied with the services of Beaumarchais, for they did not hesitate to employ him again, but their mistrust had been so profound that we are constrained to think that they were afraid of him and hoped by this means to conciliate him. As for Monsieur de Sartine, his enemies had no sooner succeeded in procuring his transfer from the Ministry of Police to the less coveted Ministry of the Navy than he was assailed with honest doubts, which he confided to Mercy Argento, who in his turn communicated the conversation to Maria Theresa. He admitted to me, wrote the Austrian ambassador, that he was more and more worried by the suspicion that Beaumarchais had himself hatched the audacious libel and had afterwards come forward to denounce the plot. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Figaro: The Life of Beaumarchais by John Rivers. The Barber of Seville. One of the first results of the king's satisfaction with Beaumarchais was the removal of the veto on the performance of his singularly unlucky play. The Barber of Seville, or The Useless Precaution, was written in 1772 as a comic opera in four acts. The music was adapted by the author from the folk and other songs we have seen him diligently collecting whilst in Spain. The musical attainments of Beaumarchais were hardly more than those of an unusually competent amateur, and it was left to the genius of Rossini and Mozart to set the seal of immortal melody on the two plays by which he is remembered. As for the libretto, although Beaumarchais had an extraordinary facility for rhyming, which, indeed, he shared with his whole family, except his wife, we doubt whether he wrote a line of poetry in his life. He himself was aware of this disability, for he used pleasantly to say, I am the first poet of Paris, entering from the Port Saint Antoine. The work was originally written for and offered to the Comédie Italienne and was promptly declined. This refusal, says Gaudin, was due to the fact that the principal actor, Clerval, had started life as a barber and was therefore disinclined to expose himself on the stage to the pleasantries of those who remembered the days when he actually plied the razor of Figaro for a livelihood. This story is interesting, but is perhaps an example of esprit d'escalier on the part of the disappointed author. In the face of this rebuff, he immediately set about transforming the opera into a comedy with an eye on the Théâtre Français. When completed, the piece was at once accepted by the premier theatre, and, having received the approbation of the censor Marat, was to have been produced in February 1773. But the dramatist's grotesque quarrel with the Duc de Chun immediately followed by the equally bizarre Gozman trial indefinitely postponed its representation. The extraordinary success of the Beaumarchais memoirs caused the company of the Théâtre Français to deem the moment opportune for producing the much-advertised comedy. 
their application being granted, the play was announced for Saturday, the 12th, February 1774. All the boxes were sold, says Grimm, for the first five performances, when on Thursday, the 10th, an order came again forbidding the play. This was the day on which Beaumarchais published the fourth and most brilliant of his pamphlets. The reason for this sudden prohibition was that the piece was currently reported to be full of satirical allusions to his late process and witticisms at the expense of the ruling classes. Beaumarchais hastened to point out that since the text of the piece had been in the hands of the lieutenant of police for over a year, these rumors could not possibly be true. But all was in vain. It looked as if the barber of Seville was doomed to never see the footlights. Such was the position when the author set out on his secret missions. Upon his return from Vienna in December 1774, he at once brought pressure to bear upon the authorities and at last obtained the ardently desired permission. But meanwhile, the situation had changed, and he no longer felt himself bound by the assurance he had given the year before. And since the comedy had been so long prohibited on account of illusions which it did not originally contain, he now made up for the omission by inserting not only those jovial and searching criticisms of the existing social order for which the play is remarkable, but overloaded the text with equivocal jokes, the coarse buffoon and the fessinine humor proper to the ancient Gallic farce. He could not bear to forego a single sally of his exuberant and undisciplined wit. This is always a mistake, for the muse is not always at home, even when her favorites call upon her. Moreover, he unwisely divided the third act into two, lengthening the piece into five acts. It is always difficult, wrote La Harpe, to fulfill great expectations. The piece seemed rather farcical, and its wearisome prolixity, its jokes in exceedingly bad taste, and its questionable morality combined to disgust and revolt the audience. The Barber of Seville was presented for the first time on the 23rd February 1775 and fell flat. But a work of art, like a good deed, is an act of faith, and faith, even in its lowest form, self-confidence, is capable of all things in reason. Beaumarchais had this kind of faith in a superlative degree. Convinced of the essential merit of his work, he shut himself in his study and recast the whole piece, reducing it to its original four acts, chastening it of the most scurrilous passages, and within a day and a night transformed a very faulty play, which had taken him two years of leisure to write, into a masterpiece of light comedy. The Barber of Seville, in its final form, remarked La Harpe, is the best constructed and best written of all the dramatic works of Beaumarchais, and we are inclined to agree with him. A dismal failure on the Friday, it was revived on the Sunday, and has held the stage ever since. We have deemed it expedient to translate the salient passages of this piece and to summarize the rest in order that the reader may be in a position not only to judge its worth for himself, but to follow the many allusions to the life and times of Beaumarchais with which it abounds. He will also be able to see how far the author may be identified with the character, maxims, and opinions of Figaro. The plot of The Barber of Seville is not a new one. It is the time-honored theme of an elderly and amorous guardian, Bartholo, who hopes to marry and possess himself of the fortune of his ward, Rosine, and how his schemes are all brought to naught by the intervention of a young and handsome lover, Count Almaviva, aided by Figaro, the wittiest and most resourceful of all valets. The scene opens with the Count, disguised as a priest, pacing to and fro before Bartholo's house in the hope of catching sight of Rosine, who has attracted his attention whilst in Madrid with her guardian. He reflects aloud that he is tired of facile conquests, and it is so sweet to be loved for oneself. 
At this moment, Figaro enters with a guitar slung over his shoulder and paper and pencil in hand in the throes of composition. He gaily sings the lines of his song as he sets them down. Generous wine and idleness shall e'er dispute my heart. Well, no, they don't dispute. They reign together quite peaceably. Shall ever share my heart. Is it right to say share? Well, thank God we makers of comic operas need not be so particular. Nowadays, what is not worth saying, we sing. Generous wine and idleness shall ever share my heart. I would like to end with something fine, brilliant, sparkling, which would look like an idea. Shall ever share my heart. If one inspires my tenderness, the other is my joy. Confound it, that's bathos. That's not it. I want an antithesis. If one is my mistress, the other, egad, I've got it. The other shall be my maid. Bravo, Figaro. Ha! Wait till we have the accompaniment. Then we shall see, gentlemen of the cabal, if I don't know what I'm talking about. Here, the Count and Figaro recognize each other. Count, I do believe it's that rascal Figaro. Figaro, it is, my lord. Count, you scoundrel, if you speak a word. Figaro, yes, I recognize you, the same familiar kindness with which you have always honored me. Count, I did not recognize you at all. You have become so big and fat. Figaro, what can you expect? It's through misery. Count, poor little man, but what are you doing in Seville? I thought I recommended you to a post in the government. Figaro, I obtained it, my lord, and my gratitude. Count, call me Lindor. Can't you see by my disguise that I don't want to be recognized? Figaro, I will go. Count, on the contrary, I am waiting for something here, and two men chatting together are less suspicious than one walking to and fro. Let us appear to be chatting. Well, what about this position? Figaro, the minister, having considered your excellency's recommendation, at once appointed me apothecary's boy. Count, to the military hospitals? Figaro, no, in the stables of Andalusia. Count, laughing, a oh, fine beginning. Figaro, the post was not so bad, for, having the dressings and drugs in my charge, I often sold the men excellent horse medicines. Count, which killed his majesty's subjects? Figaro, ha ha, well, there is no universal remedy which has sometimes failed to cure Galicians, Catalans, and Auvignon. Count, then why did you leave? Figaro, Leave indeed. Somebody slandered me to the powers. Envy with clutching fingers and pale, livid face. Count. Oh, for pity's sake, my good fellow, do you dabble in verses too? Figaro. That is just the cause of my misfortune, my lord. When it was reported to the minister that I was making, if I may say so, some rather neat little garlands of verse to Chloris, that I was sending riddles to the journals, that madrigals of my composition were becoming all the rage. In short, when it was found that I was getting into print everywhere, he took the matter tragically and dismissed me from the service on the pretext that a love of letters is incompatible with the spirit of business. Count powerfully reasoned, but did you not represent to him? Figaro. To tell the truth, I thought myself only too happy to be forgotten, being convinced that the great do us sufficient good when they do us no harm. Count, you do not tell the whole story. I seem to remember that when you were in my service, you were rather a bad lot. Figaro, good God, my lord, you expect the poor to be without faults? Count, idle, dissolute. Figaro, considering the virtues demanded of a servant, does your excellency know many masters worthy of being valets? Count, not so bad. So, you retired to this city? Figaro, no, not at once. On my return from Madrid, I tried my literary talents again, and the theater seemed to me a field of honor. Count, God a mercy. 
Figaro. Really, I do not know why I did not have the greatest success, for I filled the pit with the most excellent workers, the most mutton-fisted fellows I could find, and before the performance the café seemed very well disposed towards me. But the efforts of the cabal. Count. Ah, the cabal. I seem to have heard that story before. Figaro. It is the fact, anyway. Why not? They hissed me, but if I could only get them together again. Count, you would bore them to death by way of revenge? Figaro, zoons, I'd give it em hot. Count, you swear, do you know that in the courts you have only 24 hours in which to curse your judges? Figaro, yes, but you have 24 years in the theater. In fact, life is too short to exhaust such resentment. Count, your exhilarating anger does me good, but you have not told me what caused you to leave Madrid. Figaro, my good angel, your excellency, since I am happy enough to find my old master again, seeing that in Madrid the Republic of Letters is a republic of wolves, always at each other's throats, and that delivered over to the contempt to which this ridiculous obstinacy leads them, all the insects, gnats, Midges, critics, mosquitoes, maringua, the envious, journalists, booksellers, censors, and, in fact, everything capable of clinging to the hide of unhappy men of letters succeeded in tearing and sucking away the little substance left to them. Worn out with writing, weary of myself, disgusted with others, swallowed up by debts and with empty pockets— Finally convinced that the certain revenue of the razor is preferable to the empty honors of the pen, I left Madrid. And by baggage slung over my shoulder, philosophically journeying through the two Galicias, La Mancha, Estremadura, Sierra Marina, and Andalusia, welcomed in one town, imprisoned in another, and everywhere superior to events, praised by some, blamed by others, helping forward the good time and gaily supporting the bad, twitting the fools and defying the wicked, laughing at my misery and shaving everybody. You see me, at last, established in Seville and ready once more to serve your excellency in everything it may please you to order. Count, who taught you such a gay philosophy? Figaro, close acquaintance with misfortune. I am always in a hurry to laugh at everything for fear of being constrained to weep. Bartholo and Rosine now appear at a window on the first story, the latter holding a paper in her hand. Her suspicious guardian wants to know what it is. Only a few couplets from The Useless Precaution, which her singing master had given her yesterday. What is this useless precaution? It is the new comedy. Oh, exclaims Bartholo, another one of those dramas in the foolish new style. Well, the journals and the authorities between them will avenge us. Rosine protests against his constant decrying of the new age. Pardon me, says Bartholo, but what has it produced that we should praise it? Follies of all sorts, liberty of thought, gravitation, electricity, religious toleration, inoculation, quinine, the encyclopedia, and dramas. At this point, Rosine suddenly drops her paper, which is, of course, a letter to her youthful admirer, and sends Bartholo to look for it. But before he can get downstairs, Rosine has signaled the Count to pick it up and make off. On reaching a place of safety, the Count reads aloud the letter, which is in these terms. Your attentions excite my curiosity. As soon as my guardian goes out, sink casually to the well-known air of these couplets, a few words telling me the name, rank, and intentions of him who appears to interest himself so earnestly in the unhappy Rosine. My song! I've lost my song, cries Figaro, mimicking Rosine's voice. Oh, these women, if you want to teach cunning to the most innocent of them, lock her up. The Count is delighted to find that Figaro knows quite a lot about Bartholo and his ward. The house which I occupy, he says, belongs to the doctor, who lodges me there gratis. 
Indeed, exclaims the Count. Yes, answers Figaro, and by way of showing my obligation, I promise him in return ten gold pistoles a year, also gratis. You are his tenant, cries the Count eagerly. More than that, pursues Figaro, I am his barber, his surgeon, his apothecary. There is not a stroke of the razor, lancet, or syringe in his house which does not come from the hand of your excellency's humble servant. Almaviva there and then agrees to take Figaro into his service again, and they arrange for the lover to seek admission to the doctor's house by disguising himself as a drunken soldier bearing a billeting order from the new commandant of the town. At this moment, Bartholo emerges from his house, and the Confederates overhear him say to someone within that he is going to see Basile. Rosine's music master, urging him to hasten the arrangements for the guardian's secret marriage to his ward on the morrow. Directly, they are alone. Figaro urges his master to take his guitar and sing to Rosine the information about himself, according to her instructions, but to conceal his high rank and tell her he is Lindor, a simple student, without fortune or prospects. On the lovers expressing indifference as to his ability to compose the necessary verses, Figaro encourages him by asserting, In love, the heart is not hard to please with the productions of the mind. As the song Long ends, Rosine is heard within singing a confession of her love for Lindor. That settles it, cried the Count in his excitement. I am Rosine's as long as I breathe. You forget, my lord, that she no longer hears you, Figaro reminds him. The next scene is between Figaro and Rosine. Figaro, how is your health, madam? Rosine, not very good, Master Figaro. Dullness is killing me. Figaro, I can well believe it. Only fools flourish upon it. Rosine, to whom were you speaking with such animation below? I did not hear you, but... Figaro, a young bachelor relative of mine, of the greatest ability, full of wit, talent, and fine feeling, with a most prepossessing face. Rosine, oh, I am sure of it. You say his name is... Figaro, Lindor, he is penniless, but if he had not left Madrid so hurriedly, he might have found a good place there. Rosine, he will find one, Master Figaro, he will find one. A young man such as you describe is not likely to remain unknown. Figaro, but he has one great fault, which will always stand in his way. Rosine, a fault, Master Figaro, a fault? Are you quite sure? Figaro. He is in love. Rosine, he is in love? Do you call that a fault? Figaro, to tell the truth, it is only one in respect of his lack of means. Rosine, ah, how unjust is fate. And has he named the lady he loves? I am so curious to know. Figaro, you are the last person, madam, to whom I would reveal a secret of this nature. Rosine, eagerly. Why, Master Figaro, I assure you I am discreet. The young man is your relative. He interests me immensely. Do tell me. Figaro, looking at her slyly. Picture to yourself the prettiest little darling, sweet, tender, fresh, and gracious, appetizing, with a shy little foot, slim, dainty figure, rounded arms, rosy mouth and hands, cheeks, teeth, eyes. Rosine, who lives in this city? Figaro, in this very quarter. Rosine, in this street, perhaps? Figaro, two feet away from me. Rosine, ah, how charming for your relative. And this young lady is? Figaro, have I not named her? Rosine, that is the one thing you have forgotten, Master Figaro. Tell me, do tell me now. If somebody comes in, I might never know. Figaro, do you really want to know, madam? Very well. This young person is your guardian's ward. Rosine, ward? Figaro, Dr. Bartholo's ward. Yes, madam. Rosine, ah, Master Figaro, I'm sure I don't believe you. Figaro, of that he is burning to come himself and convince you. Rosine, you make me tremble, Master Figaro. 
Figaro. Come, come, madam. Tremble indeed. That will not do at all. When once you give way to the fear of evil, you already experience the evil of fear. Rosine, if he loves me, he must prove it by keeping absolutely quiet. Figaro. What, madam? Can love and tranquility live together in the same heart? Young people are so unfortunately situated nowadays, they have only this terrible alternative, love without peace or peace without love. Rosine, lowering her eyes, peace without love seems... Figaro, oh, very slow. It seems indeed that love without peace cuts a better figure altogether. And as for me, if I were a woman... Rosine, blushing, it is certain that a young lady cannot prevent a worthy man from esteeming her. Figaro, my relative, accordingly, esteems you enormously. Rosine, but if he should commit some imprudence, Master Figaro, he would ruin us. Figaro, aside, he would ruin us. Aloud, if you would expressly forbid him in a little note, a letter has such power. Rosine, giving him the letter she has just written. I have no time to rewrite this, but when you give it to him, tell him, and be sure and tell him that it is purely out of friendship that I do it. You understand? My only fear is that discouraged by difficulties. Her guardian is now heard downstairs, and Rosine takes up her needlework whilst Figaro discreetly withdraws. Bartholo enters the room, cursing Figaro at the top of his voice for playing a series of practical jokes on his servants, by which one is set constantly gaping and the other perpetually sneezing. Having exhausted his vocabulary, he turns on Rosine and quarrels with her on account of the letter she let drop over the balcony, expressing the suspicion that Figaro has just been with her intriguing to get her carried off. Rosine, what? Will you not even allow that one has principles to set against the seductions of Master Figaro? Bartholo, who the devil knows anything about the caprices of women? Besides, how many of these high principled virtues have I seen? Rosine, but sir, if it suffices to be a man in order to please us, why is it you displease me so much? In her rage, she admits that Figaro has been with her. I found him very agreeable, she says, and may you die of vexation. Bartolo now shouts for his servants, La Genes and La Valle, who hasten to obey his summons, the first sneezing and the second still yawning. Their master accuses them of collusion with Figaro. La Genes, but sir, is there, at two, any justice? Bartolo, justice, justice for such wretches as you? I am your master, therefore I am always right. La Genese, yes, but hang it, at you. when a thing is true. Bartholo, when a thing is true, if I don't want a thing to be true, I claim that it isn't true. Let these rascals be right, and you'll soon see what will become of authority. Basile, Rosine's music master, and the doctor's accomplice in his designs on his ward, now calls to warn him that Almaviva has come to live in Seville, and advises him that the most effective means of driving him off is to slander him. Figaro, hidden in a cabinet, overhears this conversation. That is a strange way of getting rid of a man, comments Bartholo. Slander, my dear sir, answers Basile, in an oft-quoted passage, is not to be so despised. I have seen the most honorable men almost ruined by it. Believe me, there is no stupid malignity, no abomination, no silly tale which will not be credited by the indolent people of a great city, if you set about it in the right way. And we have here some of the cleverest fellows at the game. First, a light rumor skimming over the ground like a swallow before the storm. Pianissimo murmur and twist, and it is gone, leaving a poisonous trail behind. So-and-so welcomes it, and piano, piano adroitly slips it into your ear. The evil is done. It sprouts, 
crawls, makes its way everywhere, and rinforzando, from mouth to mouth, it spreads like the very devil. Then suddenly and unaccountably, you see slander raising its head, hissing, swelling, and growing before your eyes. It darts forward, extends its sway, whirls, envelops, tears, bursts, thunders, and carrying all before it becomes, thank heaven, a general cry, a public crescendo, a universal chorus of hatred and destruction. Who the deuce can withstand it? Although not quite convinced by this outburst, Bartolo nevertheless determines to hasten the arrangements for his marriage and reproaches Basile for not having carried out his instructions more expeditiously. Yes, says Basile, but you shouldn't have haggled over the expenses. In the harmony of good order, a secret marriage, an iniquitous judgment, an obvious miscarriage of justice are difficulties which you must always be on the lookout for and prevent by the perfect accord of gold. Bartolo gives more money, and Basile promises to fix up the ceremony for the following day. The prudent doctor follows his visitor downstairs and carefully closes the door after him. The reader will not have failed to observe that the incongruity of Basile's conversation in this scene is due to it being one of the interpolated passages previously referred to in which Beaumarchais, the dramatist, could not resist the temptation, even at the expense of hanging up the action of the play, of avenging Beaumarchais, the disappointed and resentful litigant. Oh, what a famous precaution, exclaims Figaro, issuing from his retreat. Shut the door, and I will open it again to let the count in as I go out. But what a rogue that Basile is. Luckily, he is a bigger fool still. To make a sensation in the world as a slanderer, you want to be a man of position, family, name, rank, substance in short. But a Basile, he can slander as much as he likes, and nobody will believe him. In the following scene between Bartolo and Rosine, the doctor guesses that she has been writing another letter. His shrewdness completely corners her and reduces her to a state bordering on nervous collapse. Almaviva now joins them, disguised as a soldier, mellow with wine, bearing an order on the doctor to billet him for the night. In the following conversation, he contrives to pass a letter to Rosine, but the guardian's sharp eyes detect the movement, whereupon the Count pretends merely to be restoring to her a letter she has dropped, and Rosine slips the missive into the pocket of her apron. Bartolo shows that he is exempted from the obligation of billeting and orders Alma Viva away. Very well, doctor, answers the Count. I will go. Goodbye, doctor. But just to show that you bear no ill will, pray that death may overlook me for a few more campaigns. Life has never been so dear to me. Be off with you now. If I had so much credit with death, are you not a doctor? You do so much for death that it can surely refuse you nothing. Alone with Rosine, Bartolo at once accuses her of having received a letter from the drunken soldier and demands to be allowed to see it. Rosine asserts that it was only a note from her cousin which had dropped from her pocket, but her guardian is certain that she is not telling the truth and goes to lock the door, preparatory to taking the letter from her by force. Meanwhile, Rosine substitutes her cousin's letter for the Count's. After securing the door, Bartolo seizes her by the wrists and throws her upon a chair. She complains that his brutality has made her feel faint, and the doctor, whilst giving her medical aid, takes the letter from her pocket to read, but finds that it is, as she said, her cousin's note. Seeing, as he thinks, that he is clearly in the wrong, he endeavors to make amends, and they soon become friends again. If only you could love me, sighs Bartolo, how happy you would be. If only you could please me, replies Rosine, how I would love you. On reading Lindor's letter, she finds that he asks her to pick a quarrel with her guardian, and she is in despair at having let such an 
excellent opportunity escape her. However, she reflects, an unjust man will make a schemer of innocence itself, and a reasonable excuse for falling out with Bartolo is never far to seek. When, therefore, Almaviva makes his appearance, stating that he is Alonzo and comes to deputize for Basile, who is ill, the relations between the pair are as strained as ever. The doctor, however, suspects some trickery, and at last, to avoid being ignominiously dismissed, the Count is reduced to handing him Rosine's letter, which, he says, Basile has begged him to do on his behalf, and to assure him that arrangements have been made with the lawyer for the wedding to take place the next day. If Rosine resists, they will show her the letter, and Lindor will tell her that he got it through another woman, for whose sake Almaviva had abandoned her. Slander, my dear fellow, laughs Bartolo. I quite see now that you have come straight from Basile. All suspicion allayed, the doctor now goes to seek Rosine for her lesson. Upon entering the room, she is so taken aback by seeing the Count that she utters a cry and instantly recovers herself by pretending she has twisted her ankle in turning. The lovers, still in the presence of the vigilant Bartolo, whom it is impossible to shake off, sing together the song from The Useless Precaution. Figaro now enters for the purpose of shaving the doctor, but the latter angrily turns upon him for his excess of zeal in drugging his servants. What have you to say to the poor wretch who gapes and sleeps ever since you tended him, or to the other who for the last three hours has sneezed enough to blow his brains out. What have I to say to them? Yes, Figaro. Well, I should say, why, yes, I should say to him who sneezes, God bless you, and to him who yawns, go to bed. Bartolo, you would do better, Master Quibbler, to pay me my hundred crowns with interest without any more nonsense, so I warn you. Figaro, do you doubt my honesty, sir? Your hundred crowns? Why, I would rather owe them to you all my life than deny the debt for a single moment. When at last the quarrel is over, Bartolo sends Figaro for the shaving things in order not to leave the Count and Rosine together. During his absence, Bartolo whispers to the Count that he is the rascal who brought the letter. At this moment, there is a crash of crockery, which draws the doctor from the room, and Almaviva takes the opportunity to beg Rosine to grant him a secret interview that night and to fly with him. He is about to explain how he had been compelled to give Bartolo her letter when the latter returns with Figaro. Under cover of the confusion caused by the crash, Figaro has possessed himself of the key of the window shutters. To the consternation of the lovers, Basile now enters the room. Bartolo, ah, Basile, my good fellow, I see you have quickly recovered. Your accident has had no ill consequences? Master Alonso quite frightened me about you. Ask him, I was on the point of coming to see you, and if he had not dissuaded me... Basile, Master Alonso. Figaro here seeks to create a diversion, but the newcomer is too astonished to be put off. Basile, will you give me the pleasure, gentlemen? Figaro, you can speak to him when I'm gone. Basile, yes, but... Count, you should keep quiet, Basile. Do you think you can tell him anything he doesn't know? I have already told him that you sent me to give a music lesson in your place. Basile, still more astonished. A music lesson. Alonzo. Rosine, whispering to Basile. Oh, hold your tongue. Basile, she too? Count, aside to Bartolo. Tell him quickly that we have come to an agreement. Bartolo, aside to Basile. Don't give us away, Basile, by saying that he is not your pupil. You will spoil everything. Basile, ha ha! Bartolo, really, Basile, you have a most talented pupil. Basile, in great astonishment, my pupil? Aside to Bartolo, I came to tell you that the Count has moved. Bartolo whispers, I know, hold your tongue. Basile, who told you? Bartolo, he, of course. 
Count, I certainly, if you would only listen. Rosine, whispering to Basile, is it so difficult to hold your tongue? Figaro, hmm, you great hippogriff, he's deaf. Basile, then who the devil is it that they are deceiving here? Everybody seems to be in the secret. Bartolo, well, Basile, what about your lawyer? Figaro, you will have the whole evening to talk about the lawyer. Bartolo, only one word. Are you satisfied with the lawyer? Basile, frightened. The lawyer? Count, smiling. What, haven't you seen the lawyer? Basile, angrily. No, I tell you I haven't seen the lawyer. Count, to Bartolo. Do you want him to explain everything before her? Send him away. Bartolo, whispering to the Count, You are right, to Basile. But what made you ill so suddenly? Basile, in a rage, I don't understand you. Count, taking him aside and putting a purse in his hand. Yes, the doctor asks what you are doing here, ill as you are. Figaro, his face is as pale as death. Basile, ha, I understand. Count, go home to bed, my dear Basile. You are not well, and you frighten us horribly. Go home to bed. Figaro, he looks terribly bad. Go home to bed. Bartolo, upon my word, he is as feverish as he can be. Rosine, why did you come out? They say it's catching. Go home to bed. Basile, in the utmost astonishment. Go home to bed? All together. Yes, certainly. Basile, staring at them. Indeed, I think it would be as well to go. I do feel rather out of sorts. Bartolo, see you tomorrow, if you are better. Count, Basile, I shall call upon you early in the morning. Figaro, take my advice and wrap yourself up warmly in bed. Rosine, Good night, Master Basile. Basile, aside, damned if I know what to make of it. And if it wasn't for this purse, all. Good night, Basile. Good night. Basile, savagely. Oh, well, good night. They all accompany him to the door, laughing. After this dismissal, Figaro proceeds with his shaving of the doctor and tries to maneuver a little private conversation between the lovers, but the ever-watchful Bartolo surprises them and overhears enough of their talk to discover that he has been outwitted. Rosine, before retiring to her apartment, turns angrily upon the doctor and openly defies him, whilst Almaviva and Figaro pretend that he is mad and hastily leave the house. The last act opens with a conversation between Bartolo and Basile on the eventful night arranged for the marriage. It is raining in torrents. Bartolo, what, Basile, you do not know him? Is what you say possible? Basile, ask me a hundred times and I should always give you the same answer. If he gave you Rosine's letter, he is certainly one of the Count's emissaries. But... Judging by the magnificence of the present he gave me, he may very well be the Count himself. Bartolo, that is not likely. But talking about this present, why did you take it? Basile, you seem to have come to an agreement. I could not understand what was afoot. And whenever I am confronted with a difficult question, a purse of gold always seems to me an unanswerable argument. Then, as the proverb says, what is good to take, Bartolo, I understand, is good. Basile, to keep, Bartolo, ha ha. Basile, Yes, I have arranged several little proverbs like that with variations, but to come to the point, what have you decided? Bartolo, if you were in my place, Basile, would you not do your utmost to possess her? Basile, my goodness, no, doctor. In every kind of property, possession is little. It is enjoyment of it which gives happiness. I think that to marry a woman who does not love you is to expose yourself... Bartolo, you would be afraid of accidents? Basile, he, <laughs> sir, there are many of them this year. I would not do violence to her heart. Bartolo, your servant, Basile, 
It is better that she should weep at having me than I should die for not having her. Basile, oh, is it a matter of life and death? Then marry, doctor, marry. Bartolo, that's what I intend to do this very night. Basile, farewell then. Don't forget, in speaking to your ward, to make them out black as hell. Bartolo, you are quite right. Basile, slander, doctor, slander. You must always come back to that. Bartolo, here's Rosine's letter, which that fellow Alonzo gave me and unwillingly showed me what used to make of it with her. Basile, farewell. We shall all be here at four o'clock. Bartolo, why not sooner? Basile, impossible. The notary is engaged. Bartolo, for a marriage? Basile, yes, at the barber Figaro's. His niece is to be married. Bartolo, his niece? But he hasn't one. Basile, anyhow, that's what they told the notary. Bartolo, that scoundrel is in the plot. What the devil? Basile, do you really think? Bartolo, my goodness, those beggars are so wide awake. Look you here, my friend. I am not at all easy. Return to the notary and ask him to come back with you at once. Basile, it is raining infernally, but nothing shall stop me from serving you. What are you going to do? Bartolo, I'll see you out. That rascal Figaro has put all my servants out of action. I'm alone here. Basile, I have my lantern. Bartolo, now, Basile, here is my master key. I'll wait for you and keep watch. Come who may, except you and the notary, nobody shall come in tonight. Basile, with such precautions, all is sure. Bartolo, without losing a moment, seeks out Rosine, shows her the letter she wrote to Almaviva, and tells her of the plot he has discovered to secure her person, and that he owed the betrayal of the secret to the jealousy of a successful rival. Overwhelmed by the alleged perfidy of the Count, Rosine consents to marry her guardian that very night. Directly the doctor leaves her, she bursts into tears and bewails her fate. At this moment, all being quiet, Figaro and the Count enter by the window. Figaro, we are wet through. Charming weather for love-making, my lord. What do you think of the night? Count, superb for a lover. Figaro, yes, but for a confidant? And if somebody surprise us here? Count, Aren't you with me? It is quite another matter that worries me. That is to persuade her to leave her guardian's house immediately. Figaro, you have on your side three passions, all powerful with the fair sex. Love, hatred, and fear. Count, gazing into the darkness. How can I announce to her abruptly that the notary is waiting at your house to unite us? She will think my plan foolhardy. She will call me presumptuous. Figaro, if she calls you presumptuous, you should call her cruel. Women love to be called cruel. If her love is such as you desire, you can tell her who you are. She will no longer have any doubt of your sentiments. On the entrance of Rosine, there is a scene of bitter tears and reproaches on her part in which she renounces the Count, whom she has learnt to love as Lindor, for his supposed betrayal of her to Almaviva. The Count, however, soon explains the misunderstanding and convinces her of the sincerity of his passion, revealing to her for the first time his true name and position. On the reconciliation of the lovers, the Count promises to punish the odious old fellow who has been the cause of all the mischief. But the tender-hearted Rosine pleads for him. No, no, pardon him, dear Lindor, she says. My heart is so full that vengeance can find no place in it. The notary, armed with two marriage contracts, now enters with Basile. The lawyer, seeing that the lady's name in each document is the same, intelligently supposes that the brides are two sisters who bear the same name. As for Basile, he does not know what to make of it, but his scruples are quickly overcome by the Count, who hands him a purse and engages him as a witness. There is no further difficulty, says Basile, weighing the purse in his hand. 
But that is because when I have once given my word, there must be reasons of great weight, and he signs. Bartolo, with the justice of the peace, police officers and servants at this moment rush into the room. He sees the Count kissing Rosine's hand and Figaro grotesquely embracing Basile. With a savage cry, he seizes the notary by the throat. Bartolo, Rosine with these rascals, arrest them all. I've got one of them by the collar. Notary, I am your notary. Basile, he is your notary. What are you playing at? Bartolo, ha, Don Basile, how is it you are here? Basile, say rather, how is it you were not here? Justice, pointing at Figaro, one moment, I know him. What are you doing in this house at this time of night? Figaro, this time of night, you must see that it is as near morning as night. Besides, I belong to the retinue of His Excellency, my Lord Count Almaviva. Bartolo, Almaviva? Justice, they are not thieves then? Bartolo, never mind that. Everywhere else, my Lord Count, I am Your Excellency's humble servant. But you must understand that here your superiority of rank is without effect. Have the goodness, if you please, to retire. Count, yes, rank is powerless here. But what is very pertinent to the situation is the preference to yourself which the young lady has accorded me by voluntarily giving herself to me. Bartolo, what is that he says, Rosine? Rosine, it is true. Why should you be astonished? Was I not this night to be avenged on a deceiver? I am. Basile, didn't I tell you it was the Count himself, doctor? Bartolo, what does that matter to me? A pretty marriage. Where are the witnesses? Notary, there is nothing wanting. I was assisted by these two gentlemen. Bartolo, what? Basile, you signed? Basile, why not? This devil of a fellow always has his pockets full of irresistible arguments. Bartolo, I snap my fingers at his arguments. I shall make use of my authority. Count, you have lost it by abusing it. Bartolo, the young lady is a minor. Figaro, she has just come of age. Bartolo, who is speaking to you, you rogue? Count, the young lady is noble and beautiful. I am a man of rank, young and rich. She is my wife. By this title, which honors us both, do you claim to dispute her with me? Bartolo, you shall never take her out of my hands. Count, she is no longer in your power. I put her under the protection of the law. And this gentleman, whom you have brought yourself, will protect her from any violence you propose to offer her. True magistrates are the protectors of all the oppressed. Justice, certainly. And this useless resistance to a most honorable marriage shows how frightened he is over his maladministration of his ward's property, of which he will have to render a strict account. Count, ah, let him but agree to everything, and I shall ask nothing more of him. Figaro, accept the receipt for my hundred crowns. Don't let us lose our heads. Bartolo, angrily, they were all against me. I've thrust my head into a booby trap. Basile, booby trapped be hanged. Remember, doctor, that although you cannot have the girl, you keep the money and... Bartolo, oh, leave me alone, Basile. You think only of money. What do I care for money? Of course I'll keep it. But do you think that is the reason which decides me? He signs. Figaro, Ha, 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 my lord, they belong to the same family. Notary, but gentlemen, I don't understand at all. Are there not two young ladies who bear the same name? Figaro, no, sir, there is only one. Bartolo, in despair, and it was I who took away the latter, only to make the marriage more certain. Ah, I have defeated my own purpose through lack of care. Figaro, rather through lack of sense. But to tell the truth, doctor, when love and youth have agreed to deceive an old man, everything he does to prevent it may well be called the useless precaution. 
At the time of the production of The Barber of Seville, it was unkindly said that Beaumarchais had borrowed largely from Sedain's Unes Vies Jamais de Tout. One of those dullards who delight to repeat unpleasant things chose the moment when the new dramatist was surrounded by people in the green room to tell him in a loud voice that his play was very like, You can never think of everything. Very like, sir, he replied. I claim that my piece is You Can Never Think of Everything. How do you make that out? because nobody had ever thought of my piece. The critic was abashed, and everybody laughed all the more because, says Beaumarchais, he who reproached me with you can never think of everything was a person who never thought of anything. Most people are of Cleon's opinion in Les Marchands that fools are here below for our amusement, and for his part Beaumarchais thought they were fair game. But lack of understanding is, after all, a misfortune, and however irritating it may be to have to deal with a naturally dense person, it is just as cruel and irrational to jeer at his dullness as to laugh at the deformity of a cripple. Yet, such is human nature that however fully we realize this fact, we shall probably be as impatient as ever with the very next fool we encounter. End of chapter 19